This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we cover the Axeman Killer of New Orleans, one of the strangest serial killer cases I've ever read. And you've read a lot. Yeah, I read a lot in my time. You're and, a uh, sicko. I'm not a sicko, I'm interested in, in, you know. Okay, maybe I'm a little weird, but this guy had a flair for the dramatic, I think you're gonna enjoy it. Okay, all right. Let's get into it. Starting in 1918, over a period of roughly 18 months, the city of New Orleans and surrounding areas were rocked by a serial killer that would later go by the name, The Axeman. The Axeman was the manifestation of the Boogeyman, lurking in the shadows of New Orleans, almost exclusively attacking at night, and is possibly responsible for 12 attacks and six killings. In chilling fashion, he only seemed to strike people while they slept in their beds. I love this right off the bat. What do you love about it? Well, I love, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I love it when serial killers have a fun little thing. I don't approve of serial killers, but I think if you're gonna kill a bunch of people, you might as well have some fun with it. I feel like you have baseball cards of this guy. You... I absolutely do not. They don't make serial killer baseball cards though, do they? If they did, you'd probably own them. You would own them. No, I think you would own them too. You'd I'd be own like, them. I'll trade you a Gacy for a... <laughs> I trained you a Gacy for a Zodiac. Yeah. The Axeman eerily never used his own tools. He only used what he could find on hand in the victim's households, usually an ax, which he typically left behind at the scene of the crime. Everybody had an ax back in the day, huh? Yeah, you know, my biggest takeaway from this case is why not just throw, throw your, your ax away? away? Yeah, it's literally the first thing I would do. But these people were like, leave the ax in the shed. doesn't take my ax. <laughs> I've You're got my porch axe, my shed axe, my kitchen axe. <laughs> His creepy tendencies now established. Let's get into the timeline. On May 23rd, 1918 at 4901 Magnolia Street, the first suspected axe man attack occurred. Catherine and Joseph Maggio were struck violently by an axe, a straight razor used on their throats. Wait, he hit them with the axe and then cut their throats? I don't know. It also could have been his, since it was his first one, he was figuring out oh, if he, he was, was going to be, he like was like, either things. I'll be the ax man or, or I'll the, be the razor boy. Razor boy would be a good sidekick for him. Razor boy does not sound. Ax man and razor boy? Ax man, I think, strikes a little bit more fear into my heart than razor boy. Lock your doors, razor boy's out tonight. <laughs> Catherine had been almost entirely decapitated, and Joseph had suffered many severe injuries. The bodies were discovered by Joseph's brothers, who lived in the same house. Nothing was heard or seen, and no valuables were taken. The bottom panel of the kitchen door was knocked out. All that was found was an ax. So he probably went back here through the back door, because that's usually how he did it. I assume oh. the only people who saw him were the ones who were killed. Some of them survived, and they would just report like a large looming figure, like a dark figure. Oh. So he really did become kind of like a boogeyman. It kind of gives me the there, creeps. There are beads everywhere in this town. That means New Orleans. Fingerprinting was around at the time, but was allegedly not yet a standard procedure. A little over a month later, on June 28, 1918, near the corner of Dorgenois and La Harp Streets, another attack occurred. A severely injured Louis Bessemer and Anna Lowe were discovered by a baker named John Zanka making morning deliveries. That's sad for a baker. They actually thought he did it. They thought the baker did it? Well, I mean, like anybody naturally. That's why if I ever found a dead body, I don't know if I'd call it in, man. You wouldn't call it in? I'd call it in anon anonymously. I would not want any part of it because that's the first person they look but at. But in today's surveillance state, you would be suspect number one because they'd be like, what? Why'd you call it in anonymously? Well, then maybe I'll just spend my whole life trying to avoid dead bodies. How about that? Also, this you guy didn't try. know. He was just delivering bread. He opened yeah, the he door. He was probably like, good morning. I've got your Ben. Oh my <laughs> God. Lewis would actually survive the attack and Anna would survive for another seven weeks before dying. Anna supposedly recounted to the police that a large white man with a hatchet had attacked them. The bottom panel of their bedroom door was missing, and once again, a bloody axe was left at the scene. Another beautiful street, though. It is a beautiful street. The trees in this area are just so nice. Sometimes even the most beautiful places hold the darkest secrets, though. Profound. Okay. Roughly a month later, on August 5th, 1918, in an undisclosed home location, Mrs. Ed Schneider was found by her husband in the afternoon at their home. Mrs. Schneider was still alive and rushed to Charity Hospital and would reportedly survive the attack. Upon investigation, it was discovered that their ax was missing from their shed. Mrs. Schneider was also pregnant 
and I'm happy to report that in the week following the attack, she successfully gave birth. Good for her. Yeah, that's that's a, something. That's a super mom right there. Is she, that the only axe baby out of this whole story? I think. I think that. Can the, you imagine being an axe baby? I don't. I don't know if that's a thing. I'd go around telling everybody. One of one. My only, mom took a one of a kind baby, axe baby. <laughs> My mom took some hard steel to the noggin, and then I popped out. <sighs> Jesus. Five days later, on August 10th, 1918, reportedly near Tonti and Gravier Street, 80-year-old Joseph Romano was found by his nieces Pauline and Mary after they heard him struggling. His head was bashed in. The two girls allegedly saw the attacker and described him as, quote, dark, tall, heavy set, wearing a dark suit and a black slouch hat, end quote. Joseph Romano would die two days later. This guy sounds like the villain from Rocky and Bullwinkle. Yeah, he does. What's a slouch hat? I think it's, um, I don't know. I was about to talk out of my ass there. Are you gonna Google that? I'm gonna look up a slouch hat, because that sounds like something I need. Right now we're at the side of the fourth attack. The yellow house? It may be. We just know it was on this corner. Honestly, this ax man might just like, could be a fan of quaint houses. He's a fan of corners too. Not that it's okay to kill anybody, but the elderly above all. Yeah. Well, at least he lived a full life, right? No. Oh, you're I mean, right, actually. Well, he didn't. I'm sure that's not how he wanted to go out when he was picturing retirement. Well, nobody does. Getting but hit with an axe. I but. rescind my statement. Maybe if you're if you're gonna be a serial killer, you maybe kill elderly people. Kill the elderly. That's a weird thing to advocate, but I mean, but they've lived a long life. That's true. Around this time, August 1918. The New Orleans State's newspaper allegedly recounted, quote, armed men are keeping watch over their sleeping families while the police are seeing to solve the mysteries of the ax attacks. Extra police are being put to work daily, end quote. And when looking at the timeline, it apparently worked, for a while that is. As nearly seven months later, on March 10th, 1919, the Cordomiglia family was attacked. Rose Cordomiglia woke to her husband Charles fighting the Axemen, a fight that Charles would lose. Rose and their two-year-old daughter Mary were also attacked. Rose and Charles would actually survive, but their daughter tragically did not. In typical Axeman fashion, the axe used belonged to the Cordomiglias. Did they call it Axeman fever or Axemania? Or did they call him Axie? Or were they like, everybody in town's got Axeman fever as the terror continues to grip the community? This just in, throw away your axes. This just in, more skulls crushed. Whoa, <laughs> oh, throw out your axes. <laughs> Five days later, a New Orleans newspaper called the Times-Picayune received a letter from the apparent Axeman. Quote, Hell, March 13th, 1919. Esteemed mortal, they have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible, even as the ether which surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a fell demon from hot as hell. I am what you Orleanians and your foolish police call the Axeman. End quote. This guy's a poet laureate. <laughs> I know. This is incredible. Is this Robert Frost? <laughs> he also goes on to insult and threaten the police. Quote, they have been so utterly stupid so as to amuse not only me, but his satanic majesty. But tell them to beware. Let them not try to discover what I am. For it were better that they never were born than for them to incur the wrath of the Axeman. End quote. It is very Old Testament. It's like most serial killers just like to stroke themselves, and this is just... He was right, maybe he was judged. like, Ooh, <laughs> just, <laughs> see. Just, the devil, his satanic majesty. <laughs> just, <laughs> Jesus Christ. That'll get him. Time to go murder again. He also goes on to remind the people that he could be worse. Quote, Undoubtedly, you Orleanians think of me as a most horrible murderer, which I am, but I could be much worse if I wanted to. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in close relationship with the angel of death." End quote. Not to, not to discredit him, but he is killing people in their sleep with an ax. And what's his success rate? I gotta say, your striking power and aim isn't Johnny on the spot. Yeah, you should be batting a thousand at that you point. You should be batting a thousand. However, the most important clause is a specific threat that would terrify the entire New Orleans community. Quote, now, to be exact, at 12.15 o'clock, earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I'm going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I'm going to make a little proposition to the people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, 
and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions, that every person shall be spared in whose house a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well then, so much the better for the people. One thing is certain, and that is some of those persons who do not jazz it on Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Jazz it! <laughs> you better jazz it! <laughs> he turned jazz into Honey, a Honey, we gotta jazz it. <laughs> Jazz it to I'm not gonna throw out this X, so we better jazz it. He's a bit like Santa Claus. Okay, I'd like First to hear First of all, he says he's gonna pass over New Orleans. That's a bit magical. Sure. Just imagine him flying through the skies with his big axe, riding a crocodile, <laughs> or an alligator, or whatever they got. Or a, a demon. Traveling on demon's wings, and just looking down at all the little houses, listening for jazz. <laughs> It's like the good enough so He's like the Grinch trying to listen to the Whoville people sing. Exactly right. I still don't understand how he's Santa Claus. Santa Claus never bashed anyone's head in with a big sack of toys. That's true. But he does give him coal. What? <laughs> this letter would later spark the creation of a jazz song entitled Don't Scare Me Papa, also known as the mysterious Axeman's Jazz. Tuesday night mentioned in the letter was March 19th, 1919. It is said that the city was truly alive that night, as people blasted jazz music in their homes, and those who did not have a record player poured into local jazz clubs to stay clear of the Axeman's wrath. It's worth mentioning that nobody was killed on March 19th, 1919. So, he kept his word. Very kind. Apparently everyone was jazzing it. You know what, he was probably just gonna be out of town. <laughs> he thought, wouldn't this be funny? I've got a business trip that weekend. Let's see how many smokers I can make dance. Yeah. On August 10th, 1919, Steve Boca was badly injured in his home after he awoke to a man next to his bed with an ax. Boca managed to survive the attack, reportedly staggering to a friend's home, who then called the police. Boca did not regain his memory, likely due to the blows to the head. Yeah, that'll do it. Yeah, that usually does it. Yeah. I once fell into a pile of bricks when I was a kid. What? and I don't remember much of it after that. What? Yeah, I was climbing because we were playing hide and seek. I was trying to hide and I thought I had the best hiding spot. Turns out I was wrong, the branch broke and I just- This fell. explains a lot. You fell into And after water. that I could see ghosts. I don't think it gave you the vision. It gave me my eyes. I think it put a hole in your brain. <laughs> Later that month, or in early September, on 2128 2nd Street, 19-year-old Sarah Lawman was reportedly attacked by someone who entered through an open window. When she regained consciousness, she could not recall details of the attack. So this is the site of the second to last attack. And apparently the house is gone. Yeah. About two months later, on October 27, 1919, at the corner of South Scott and Uloa Street, the suspected Axeman attacked Esther and Mike Pepitone. Esther reportedly awoke around 1 a.m. to her husband screaming and ran to the bedroom. Her husband's head was struck 18 times and died two hours later. Esther saw two figures in the bedroom, but could not identify them as they fled the scene. By the way, two figures. Razor boy. Oh my god, no. He's back. No, we're not calling that. He's back from boarding school. <laughs> a bolt with a heavy nut, something used to secure a circus tent, was one of the apparent weapons. There was a circus on the nearby Tulane Avenue that weekend. Was this the last one? Uh, yes. If this guy survived for two hours after getting struck 18 times, the axe man probably wasn't used to that kind of resilience. He probably hit him once and the guy was like, oh boy. What a bump. And he was or, like, uh, all right, I guess I'll hit you again. And he was like, oh my goodness, that didn't feel much better. <laughs> I was like, three, four, five. This takes us to the supposed end of the Axeman's killing spree. And with that, let's get into the theories. The first theory is that perhaps not all of the killings were the work of the Axeman. Some speculate that the Axeman's presumed final killing of Mike Pepitone was actually a mafia killing due to Mike Pepitone's father killing a man in the past. Another Axeman attack that is scrutinized is the second attack on Louis Bessemer and Anna Lowe. If you'll recall, Louis Bessemer was severely injured and his partner Anna Lowe was killed in that same attack. 
However, Bessemer was charged with the murder of Anna in bizarre fashion. Police found that Bessemer had written letters back and forth in Yiddish and Russian. They eventually came to the conclusion that Bessemer was part of a German spy ring or spy master for the Kaiser, and the attack had nothing to do with the Axeman. A spy's not gonna bash someone's head in with an ax. And then bash his own head in. Right. He's gonna, he's gonna lower a string from the ceiling and put a drop of poison on it and let that poison fall into a sleeping person's mouth. Right in there. Well, if they're, they're sleeping, then why don't you just drop it into their mouth like a little droplet thing? Why do I don't know. That's what spies do. That's I've just never, what they do. That's the first time I've heard that. I think you just made Everybody it up. does that. I think you made it up. I did not make it up. Okay. It happens in a James Bond film. Which one? Um, the racist one where he's in Japan. <laughs> Before dying, Anna Lowe allegedly blamed her partner, Louis Bessemer, and said that he was a Nazi spy. They also theorized that this case was a domestic dispute that ended with Louis attacking Anna. Nonetheless, Louis Bessemer was acquitted. There were definitely things that suggested this was the work of the Axeman, mainly the fact that it happened at home at night while they were sleeping with an ax. That would take such an enormous amount of fortitude to be able to be, you know, really smash someone. And then, and then also, yeah. like, I have a hard time pulling off a Band-Aid. Though, you are a wimp, and if anyone would have mental fortitude to do something that would be painful, it would be a spy, wouldn't they? I just think it's very rich that you're calling me a wimp. Yeah. <laughs> because you hear a, a footstep and you go into, ooh, I better hide under the bed. In vain with this theory, it's also speculated on the internet that some of the killings of the Axeman could have been the work of a copycat. The second theory is that given the context of his bizarre letter, some believe the Axeman to be a supernatural figure that could slip through tiny entranceways and become the large man that witnesses describe the killer to be. No, 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 no. It's just a theory. That it, well, it's, it's uh, dumb. <laughs> he shrunk down like a little mouse. Is that what you're saying? I, He's like Ant Man. He's like. <laughs> now I'm big. Time to die. At what? <laughs> The last theory is actually a legitimate suspect, a man named Joseph Mumphrey. To start on Mumphrey, let's return to the Axeman's last crime, the attack on Esther and Mike Pepitone. If you recall, Esther survived the attack and her husband did not. Esther later moved to Los Angeles and remarried to a man named Angelo Albano. However, on the second anniversary of her former husband Mike's death by the Axeman, her current husband, Angelo, disappeared and was never found again. Esther recalled that before their marriage, Angelo had ended business relations with a man who went by many names, including Joseph Mumphrey. On December 5th, 1921, Mumphrey visited Esther's home at 554 East 36th Street in Los Angeles. He demanded $500 and Esther's jewelry, threatening that he would, quote, kill her the same way he had killed her husband, end quote. But, like a badass, Esther then killed him with a revolver. Whoa! Good for her! We've had two badass ladies in the story. The girl who got whacked over the head, still gave birth and survived, and then this girl who got threatened and was like, oh, fuck that. Well, you know what I'll do is I'll shoot you. <laughs> this is the spot where Esther shot Joseph Mumphrey to death. Kind of crazy to think that this may be the location where the Axeman actually was killed. Good for you, Esther. Shoot him in the face. Yeah, I mean, what more can you do? If he actually indeed killed two of her husbands, yeah. whether or not he's the ax man, shoot him in the face. Yeah, face That's full of bullets, you had it coming. <laughs> Give him a bullet sandwich. Now, what does this have to do with the ax man? Given the fact that Esther was present for the ax man slaying of her husband, Mike Pepitone, when Esther was arrested for shooting Joseph Mumphrey, she claimed that Mumphrey was the ax man and had seen him run from her bedroom the night her husband was slain. The LAPD noted that there was evidence linking Mumphrey to the death of Mike Pepitone, and Esther was acquitted for Mumphrey's death. Here are some other things that seem to suggest Joseph Mumphrey was the Axeman. Upon investigation, the police found that Mumphrey led a blackmailing gang in New Orleans that preyed on Italians, and almost all of the Axeman's victims were Italians. These guys are racist? Most of them were Italian grocers. Oh, fuck this guy. <laughs> <laughs> this is what made you turn? If there's already the basis that he's gonna be killing, I do not approve of that, but if he's gonna do it, then at least do it randomly. I, I think just, how about 
don't kill people. Look, Ryan, what are we here for? <laughs> just, I thought we were here to get into the mind of a serial killer. I know, I'm just saying, what if they all just happen to be Italian grocers? Oh, that's rich. It all just <laughs> happened to be, yeah, that will okay, hold so up in court. Mumphrey was in and out of prison for the past 10 years, and his time outside of prison coincided with attacks by the Axeman. That being said, there was not enough evidence to directly link Mumphrey to the crimes, and eyewitnesses can be wrong. Only circumstantial evidence led people to believe Mumphrey was the killer. If you'll recall, Esther Pepitone originally said there were two men in her bedroom the night her first husband was killed. So either she's lying, or is the ax man, perhaps multiple people. What do you think? I think that's it, by the way. It very well could be him. I know it says there's not a lot of evidence, but that was sort of <coughs> the sweet spot for serial killers, right? I think it may have been a series of copycat killers. Yeah, that sounds likely. Leading a blackmailing gang in New Orleans that preys on Italians. What a strange thing to I've spearhead. never even heard of a blackmailing gang. What does gang? a blackmailing gang do? They Did just get together and they're like, I saw this guy f fucking a goat. <laughs> In the end, there aren't many leads on the identity of the notorious New Orleans Axeman. Was this the work of a series of copycats? Or was this the result of one troubled individual? For now, the case remains unsolved. If someone started bashing people's heads in in Los Angeles, it was like, if you don't play Bruno Mars every you Tuesday, play Bruno. I'm gonna be very angry. If you're not Brunoing on Tuesday if, night. If we don't Bruno it, me and the devil are big fans of Bruno. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we covered the unfortunate murder of the unknown boy in the box. This case has been highly requested and is as bizarre as it is mysterious. I love bizarre and I love mysterious. So I am titillated. Yeah, you look like you're excited to hear about this boy and his box. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I am. Well, let's get into it. On February 25th, 1957, the body of a boy was found in a box in an illegal dumping ground near Ferry Road in Philadelphia. The boy was estimated to be around four to six years old, weighed 30 pounds, and stood three feet, three inches. He was found naked, but wrapped in a blanket. The boy's hair was cut and his body was recently washed. There were small scars in several places, including his chin, groin, and left ankle, some of which suggested he underwent a medical procedure. Head injuries were determined to be the cause of death and there were no witnesses. Wait, so I was excited to hear about this boy who lived in a box. I told you it's not as magical as it sounds. They just found a dead kid in a box, that's it? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's gonna be more weird details, but I thought it was gonna be like, oh, and he, boy, did he not like his box. And he spent years in his box not liking his box. I mean, this was the titular moment. We just went over why this boy was in a box, because he was dead. <sighs> what else do you want? Well, the boy in the bubble, the movie starring John Travolta, he spent so much time in that bubble. You, you we have see a, a lot of bubble content. You have a habit for citing movies as I've evidence. I've never seen this movie. Well, I just know it's about John Travolta and he can't go That's outside even worse. because germs are, will kill him and he has to stay in plastic okay. and he kisses a girl We're through moving. the plastic. <laughs> We're moving on. Okay. The body was first found by a young man who was walking through the abandoned lot. Strangely, this man waited a full day before tipping off the police. And even stranger, it turns out that a second man had previously found the boy's body, but had not contacted the police because he claimed he did not want to get involved. That's fair. Yeah, I, I, I thought that was odd and maybe damning at first, but now that I think about it, if I found a boy in the box, you immediately make yourself a suspect when you say, I found this boy in this box. I found a boy in a box. <laughs> I had nothing to do with it. And then the police sergeant on the other line's like, you're like, oh, tell me more about this boy in the box. Does he like his box? And he's like, no, he, he was he was He dead. hates it. He was dead. Because he's dead. <laughs> exactly. With the cold weather at the time of year and the delayed phone call from the person who found the body, it was impossible to accurately estimate when the boy had passed away. In hopes of finding his identity, the police kept the boy at the morgue while visitors from over 10 different states tried to identify the boy by looking for any significant marks to no avail. Police sent out 400,000 flyers of images of the boy to police stations, post offices, and courthouses all over the country. Even the American Medical Association sent out a description of the boy, but it led nowhere. What kind of description are they sending out? It's just, oh, it's a boy. He was in a box. I mean, they have He's like dead. defining, you know, 
kids have faces. I know, but they all kind of look the same. When babies are born, everyone That's... goes, oh, what a cute baby. That's a baby. Either your baby's ugly or f normal. I mean, when you came out, I imagine they go, whoa, that's I a was, huge noggin. I was an, a very ugly baby. I imagine your first steps were your head dragging along the floor, like some kind of crab creature. Okay. <laughs> well, that is not true. Is that enough head jokes for you? Yeah, that's plenty. <laughs> okay. The police compared the child's footprints to hospital records in the area. Fingerprints were taken of the boy, but no record was found to prove the boy ever existed. I mean, it's strange to just see that no somebody's completely off the grid. What kind of box are we talking? I know this isn't- It's funny you would ask that because that's exactly what we're about to get into. I have and the mind that... of a, a detective. Yeah, it's the first clue. Good. You don't have the mind of a detective. You just- I think I do. You stumbled upon a good a, a question for once that, you know, actually pertained to the story. You can sip your tea all you want. <laughs> I'm just saying it's clearly a coincidence. Let's run through some of the key clues left at the scene of the crime. One promising clue came from the actual box itself. The box contained a serial number which allowed investigators to pinpoint the shipment, who were able to trace it back to a JC Penney store 15 miles away. Eerily, before the boy, the box was used to ship a bassinet. The store had shipped 12 of these boxes of bassinets. However, all of the purchasers paid in cash, leaving no record. Eight purchasers ended up contacting the police when they read about the story in newspapers to go on record that they either still had the boxes or had put the boxes out for trash collection. Though, the police were able to determine that the box was shipped to Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. This all makes sense. <laughs> what do you have against Pennsylvania? I don't know, it's quiet up there. People got too much free time. You know what happens next. What do they even do? What's Pennsylvania known for? What, what Putting are... boys in boxes. <laughs> I don't think that's, I wouldn't say that Pennsylvanians are, have a proclivity for I boxes. I think if you look boys. at their state flag, you'll see so. a boy in a box. False. No, it's a, okay, you know what? The blanket was examined by the Philadelphia Textile Institute, which believed the blanket was made either in Granby, Quebec in Canada, or Swannanoa, North Carolina. But there was no way to tell where this particular blanket was purchased since thousands were made and sold. Ultimately, the blanket lead was a dead end. Poor guy working on that lead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm re you're really you're gonna find something with these blankets if you just follow the trail. And you're like, all right, just we're doing some work here. It looks like it was made in the country of Canada. They only made a few thousand of them. <laughs> Another propitious clue was a hat found 15 feet near the box, a blue corduroy Ivy League style cap, size seven and one eighth. It was labeled Eagle Hat and Cap Company and made by the small company owner, Mrs. Hannah Robbins in South Philadelphia. Dump a hat, dump a boy. People dump things in lots. Yeah. There's a boy in a box in a lot. Also, not always intentionally. You lose a hat in a lot. Well, I'm pretty sure the boy in the box was dumped there intentionally. That's probably intentional. No one's like dragging a boy in the box and then like, as they get home, they're like, I'm forgetting something. Janet, we left the, <laughs> we left the box. <laughs> Our boy was in that box. Mrs. Robbins remembered the man who purchased the hat because she had customized it for him. The man, who was described as blonde between the ages 26 and 30, requested that a leather strap and buckle be added to the hat. He paid in cash and she never saw him again. Detectives visited over 100 stores within the area, but nobody recognized the hat nor the boy. There was also strands of hair found on the boy's body, suggesting a hasty haircut, and one forensic artist named Frank Bender believes the boy was possibly raised as a girl. In fact, Bill Kelly, an original investigator of the case, recounts that in 1957 and 1958, a West Coast artist did circulate a rendition of the child as a girl, but it never produced any leads. Wow, they're really going all out for this. So it could have been a girl in the box, but it wasn't. It was a boy. Maybe he had like long hair. Or maybe, like I cut my hair throughout most of college, my own hair. I mean, it's cheap. You did? Yeah. How'd that turn out? Do we have any pictures pretty of Pretty good. People were actually pretty impressed when I told them. With all these dead ends, let's get into the theories of what could have possibly happened to this boy and who he could be. The first theory comes from authors Lou Romano and Jim Hoffman, who came across a lead from a man in Philadelphia who said that his family once rented a place to a man who sold his son. Possibly the boy in the box. Who sold his son? Yeah, so he rented a place to this guy who sold his son. 
He sold his Which son. is weird because unless he was there to actually see the sale go down, that's not something you really tell somebody in passing. <laughs> no. Wow, the place is beautiful. I'm selling my son tomorrow. I'll take it. How much is it? How many bedrooms? We'll need one of them. bucks. Can you believe it? How much is rent again? <laughs> A forensic pathologist looked at photos of the boy's potential father and possible brother and agreed that similarities would warrant further laboratory testing. He found similarities in the facial structure, the helix of the right ear, and the nose. A DNA sample was taken from the man they believed to be the brother. Oddly, investigators on Philadelphia police did not say whether they would test DNA to compare the potential brother to the DNA of the boy in the box. They only said they would, quote, investigate further, end quote. Okay, here's what I don't get about that. If we had a possible match on this boy in the box and you had an opportunity to compare it to DNA of a suspect or a, a person that's possibly a relative, mm -hmm. why not just do it? How much do DNA test cost? That's true. It doesn't make sense to me, but apparently nothing came of, you know, maybe they did do it and nothing came of it and they just didn't report it. Could be. Or it's just, you know, bureaucracy, man. Or a cover up. Or a cover up. The second theory comes from medical examiner Remington Bristow, who investigated the case for over 36 years. Bristow gathered newspaper clippings of the boy and spent thousands of dollars of his own money and countless hours trying to identify the boy. He traveled all the way to Arizona and Texas for leads. Bristow even consulted with a psychic who held staples from the bassinet box, hoping he or she could gather some clues. Bristow went even as far as carrying a mask of the boy's face in his briefcase. Okay, <laughs> let's think about some things here. The he, last two went a little off the edge. Yeah. Especially um, the latter. That doesn't even seem helpful. So would he wear it and go to people and be like, you, you know, do you know me? Do you see my little boy face? Does this look familiar to you? Wow. You know what's even weirder? Even if he didn't open with that and he's like interrogating someone like, you seen this kid? No, no. All right, let me pull out one more thing. <laughs> clip, clip, clip. Now. <clears throat> now have you seen him? And they're just like, no, can you please leave can my home? Can you please leave? <laughs> Bristow theorized that the boy died accidentally. His freshly cut hair and nails indicated that he was well taken care of. Perhaps the boy's family never came forward because they did not want to be charged with murder. Based off of a psychic's clue, Bristol looked into a foster family that lived nearby where the boy was found. The foster family had already been interviewed by the police. At this foster family's 1961 estate sale, Bristol found a bassinet that he believed could have previously been stowed in the box the boy was found in. They don't know what the other bassinets looked like? That's weird, yeah, I guess. I guess the, the must have, nothing must have came of that because it's like, it may have looked like it. Huh. Then again, keep in mind, this is not an official investigation. Yeah, I know, this, this is, is just a man with a passion. A passion for justice. Yeah. Respectable. Bristow then began to theorize that the boy was an illegitimate child of the daughter of the foster family and was perhaps abandoned by the daughter so she would not be revealed as a single mother. Bristow would eventually pass away in 1993, but shortly after, Philadelphia detective Tom Augustine took up the case where Bristow left off. On February 23, 1998, Detective Augustine went to the home of Arthur Nicoletti, the man who led the former foster care home. Nicoletti's wife, Anna Marie was the woman Bristow theorized to be the mother of the boy in the box. In addition to being Nicoletti's wife, Anna Marie was also Nicoletti's stepdaughter. So he married, wait, what are the, wait, hang on. What? <laughs> your, your brain is imploding right now. I need like a visual here. So his wife. Well, when a man loves a woman. And so, <laughs> so yeah. All right. Okay. But it's, it's his, it's his wife. Yeah, it's not incest technically because it's, it's not, not. Yeah, I, anytime you have to say it's not incest technically, <laughs> that's not great, Ryan. True, but it isn't. It's not his blood. Okay. Anna Marie told Augustine that she did have a boy who passed away in bizarre fashion, with morgue records supporting her statement. His cause of death was electrocution from a nickel ride outside of a store, once again leading to a dead end. That's pretty funny. <laughs> Do you think? She was like, hey, here's a nickel, Timmy. I'm gonna go inside and get some groceries. I'll be right back. Or the more horrifying version of that. Do you think she made him ride the ride and sat there and watched as he was apparently having too much fun and got really excited if and was like, like, yeah! And then- <laughs> You think he screamed like R2-D2? <laughs> yeah! 
See, that's kind of horrifying when you think about that. Sure one. is. But there was a moment where she was probably like, "Wow, he's really enjoying that ride." Yeah, it's just one of those unfortunate deaths where obviously it's a tragedy, but boy, oh boy, is that a laugh riot. <laughs> The third and final theory comes from a woman named Martha. A psychiatrist from Cincinnati contacted Augustine and said one of her patients insisted on speaking to the police. The patient went by the name of Martha and said that when she was 11 years old, her mother took her to a house where she handed an envelope over for a boy. Did oh. you just realize something? What just happened? Well, remember in the first theory, I said there was the guy who did said you not, he, he sold his son. Yeah, did you just not realize that until now, though? Yeah. <laughs> because, <laughs> Jesus, I've never seen you. Eureka! You could put a light bulb, but can we play that back and put a light bulb over Ryan's head when that happens? Was that clear, That what the connection I made? There was the guy who they thought maybe sold his son. Yeah. And here's the purchase happening. And you didn't make that until you read it just now. I'm so in each theory. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't like them. Martha said that she was sexually abused by her mother and the mother wanted to do the same to the boy. Martha said her mother beat the boy to death after struggling to bathe him and drove Martha and the boy to Philadelphia to abandon him. Martha spoke with investigators Tom Augustine, Joseph McGillan, and William Kelly. McGillan and Kelly were one of the first on the boy in the box crime scene. All three were allegedly convinced by Martha's story. According to Bill Fleischer, a retired FBI agent, details of Martha's story add up. The testimonies, addresses, and descriptions. It is a strong theory. But even with Martha's lead, the police were not able to verify if the boy was who Martha claimed he was. Did I actually just solve something? It I think you did, to be honest. I may have just saw something. Oh my God. You've done it, Ryan. But, but if, it would, if that's the case, then the police would have just released it. So obviously this, that's, it, this is not right. Feels right. Wow, that not, doesn't take a lot to convince you. Either way, to this day, the boy's identity remains a mystery. His grave is marked as America's unknown child at the Ivy Hill Cemetery in Philadelphia. To this day, people are mystified as to why nobody had come to claim him. Perhaps someday, we will learn who this boy was and what happened to him. But for now, the case remains unsolved. I'm gonna still say this is very unsolved. Yeah. But for a moment there, I thought I had solved something. Yeah, you could see it in your expression. The day you solve something, I'll give you $500. Oh, wow, 500 real dollars? Yeah. I, I could go to Disneyland with that kind of money. That'll last me a couple days, maybe. Thank you, Shane. Let's make it 200. 200 dollars? That's still good. Oh my, you're so generous, Mr. Madej. 500 is too much, I got groceries to buy. <laughs> okay, well, but there you have it. Shane's okay. gonna set me for life if I ever solve something with that 500 big ones. 200 queens, baby. <laughs> 200 shekels. This week on BuzzFeed and Saul, we cover the Trom family. This one happened recently, and believe me, Odd doesn't even begin to describe this one. It's very strange. My interest is piqued. Really? Yeah. You, you said that with a complete dead face, so I, I can never tell when you're being serious. My interest is piqued. Okay, don't do is that. Is that better? Nope, that wasn't better. Let's get into it. On Monday, August 29th, 2016, in Sylvan, Australia, 51-year-old Mark Trump and 53-year-old Jacoba Trump, along with their three children, 29-year-old Rihanna, 25-year-old Mitchell, and 22-year-old Ella all inexplicably fled their farm. This strange family road trip would set into motion a hunt for the family that would captivate Australian media. Local police sergeant Mark Knight called it, quote, the most bizarre case in 30 years, end quote, as officials were baffled as to why the Trump family simply ran away from their home. The seemingly healthy and stable Mark and Jacoba Trump ran an earth-moving business, along with a berry farm, where all of their children worked seven days a week. They're making their kids work seven days a week? My parents would maybe be like, empty the dishwasher on a, you know, a Thursday, and I'd be like, this is bullshit. It is excessive. I guess I'd run away from my parents if they made me work seven days a week, especially if I was shoveling horse shit, moving dirt. I'd fake my own death. Oh man, okay, you took it a step further. I'd, I'd set the barn on fire and throw a cadaver in there and flee this country. Later, when police investigated their home, they found the following. 
mobile phones, passports, and credit cards. The trip, it appeared, was meant to be cash only and, quote, off the grid. End quote. I mean, I've gone on some spur of the moment vacations. You strike me as one of those idiots who likes to put their phone down and go walk into the woods and experience nature and all that bullshit. Absolutely not. Get eaten by a bear. No, that's not me at all. Either way, leaving your house at this day and age without your phone, without your credit cards, that's already a death sentence. You can't do that. It's not smart. It's not smart. You can't even use Apple Pay on your phone. I've been to places nowadays that don't even accept cash. The family left in 22-year-old Ella's Peugeot SUV. They drove for the first day and night till they reached Bathurst, roughly 500 miles away from their home in Sylvan. Unlike the rest of his family, 25-year-old Mitchell Tromp brought his cell phone. Mitchell! You traitor! <laughs> you are a traitor to the Trump clan. It seems he didn't want to disconnect. Or he was thinking, uh, maybe one of us needs to keep or our he sanity was thinking, here. My family's insane. <laughs> exactly. However, roughly 19 miles into their trip near Warburton, his parents forced him to throw his phone out the window because they were convinced it was being used to track them. If your parents told you at age 25 to throw your phone out the window, would you do it? No. He did it. This is what happens when you live on a farm. <laughs> okay, so what wide generalization are you gonna make about people on farms? Right I just now? think you gotta read some some culture, watch some Two and a Half Men. I don't care. Just connect yeah. to popular media and know what the world is thinking. Otherwise, you go nuts. Yeah, because nothing says sanity and civilization like a red robin, right? They have bottomless onion rings. They do have bottomless fries there. They're pretty good. Yeah. The next day, on Tuesday, August 30th, Mitchell left the family around 7 a.m. The family later headed out from Bathurst toward the Janolan Caves that Tuesday. At the Janolan Caves, Rihanna and Ella broke off from the family by stealing a car. They drove this car to Goldburn, where they reported their parents as missing. But from there, Ella and Rihanna strangely split up. Rihanna Trump was found in the back of Keith Whitaker's Ford F-250. He was driving when he felt a kick. When he came to a stop, Whitaker called the police. Rihanna was catatonic and did not know her name or location. This actually happened. He was driving, he felt a little kick. He's like, oh, I must have not tied and down the gear. it was a girl who didn't know her own name. How scary is that? You don't think you'd be scared if you went into your truck bed and you looked and there was a girl and she was just like, I'd probably be like, get out of my truck bed, you And if weirdo. she didn't respond, would you touch her? Would you think, oh, she's turning into a zombie? Is she? No, because I'm not an idiot. <laughs> Ella Trump actually made it back home by Tuesday night, and the police were already there. When police began to investigate the Trump home, the place was unlocked and in disarray. According to the Daily Telegraph, police found evidence that the Trumps had gone through years of their farm's financial records shortly before leaving. There were several piles of documents throughout the home, including passports and credit cards of every family member as mentioned before. An officer is quoted saying, quote, the piles were very ordered and they were clearly looking for something, end quote. How much trouble could a family of farmers get into? Oh, a, a pretty fair amount of trouble, my friend. We hold thousand dollars to the bear down the street. The bear down the street. Yeah. That's their neighbors, right? Like a bear that lives in a little cave. Farmers and bears don't mix. This There's is no a, bears this on This is farms. clearly a, a cartoonish example I was giving. It's not a even a good cartoon. I've never even seen a cartoon where a farm, ha there's a bear on a farm. There's Goldilocks and the three bears. There's nothing in that story about the bears owning cows or chickens or going out and milking something. Were or... you not picturing a farm in your head when you were no, thinking No, it's this? just bears in the woods. That could be a farm. It's not a farm. <laughs> It's just bears that own a house. They, they're eating porridge. One day later on Wednesday, August 31st, Mitchell Trump, the first Trump sibling to break off from the family, arrived home via the train. Meanwhile, his parents, Mark and Jacoba Trump, drove to Wangaratta and also separated. Jacoba headed north, while Mark remained in Wangaratta, where it is believed that Mark is linked to a case where a young couple was dangerously tailgated by a car of the same make and color that Mark was driving on Wednesday night around 10 p.m. The couple was playing Pokemon Go at the time. The young man driving is quoted saying, I could barely see his headlights because he was that close to my car, end quote. I imagine this is a little bit more than they bargained for when they were trying to find that Pikachu, but some serious tailgating right there. That's some shitty driving. When the young man pulled the car over, the car tailgating them would also stop. They claimed that eventually, Mr. Trump got out of the car and ran towards them, but he stopped in the middle of the road 
and stared at them. He then walked into Wangaratta's Marawa Park and disappeared. That's fucking terrifying. How scary is it you just lock your door? You're in a car, drive away. That's not that scary. And then, you know, if, if the doors don't work and he starts breaking a window, then guess what? Time to die. <laughs> Okay, and that's, that's a bummer. That's, but see, at that point, it's like, oh, I'm dead. I guess I don't have anything else to worry about. So at, at what point does the fear come in for you? About when the life is draining out of my body. <laughs> Police searched the park, but no one was found. The car still had the keys in the ignition. In an effort to track down Mark Tromp, the police investigated Miller's Cottage Motel in Wangaratta, where a room had been broken into. They believed he might have stayed there for the night. On Thursday, September 1st, Mrs. Tromp took public transportation to Yass and tried to book a motel in the city. Allegedly, a member of the public helped escort her to a hospital in Yass, where the hospital staff recognized her and called the police. If, if a woman comes up and is trying to rent a hotel room and she doesn't have ID and you're at she's McDonald's cash and she's like <laughs> oh, I don't know where I am or what my name is I'd be like okay why don't you just take a seat yeah Mom makes phone calls it's true yeah, it's true it's very kind of them it's, it's kind looking out for, look out for your fellow man and and lady on Saturday September 3rd five days after first leaving his home Mark Tromp was found wandering down a road in Wangaratta around 5.50 p.m. He was promptly questioned by the police and given a mental health assessment. He spent five hours at the station before he was escorted out by a family member and gave the waiting media the finger. Though, Mark would later publicly apologize for, quote, the hurt and concern caused by these events, end quote. Rude of him to act like it's no big deal. Of course people want to know what the hell's going on with you. Oh yeah, excuse the public for wondering about your safety, sir. It does make me realize I don't give people the middle finger enough. <laughs> like if someone's like, hey, uh, you want to grab some salads for lunch? They'd be like... It's meaner without the noise, oh, I think. Oh, so it's just kind of be like... <laughs> <laughs> Is that better? That's better. So, right. Yeah, that's like how Adam Sandler made his career. Yeah, basically. Basically, by making fart noises yeah. and funny faces. Oh, ta -ta -ho. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. The next day, Mitchell and Ella appear before media, thanking police and media for finding their father. They do not go into detail about what happened, and essentially state that they are still perplexed by it. Weird that they just go along with it. I guess they're their parents, but, I, you know, it's a long road trip. Can you imagine them just in the back seat kind of exchanging glances with each other? Like, what's dad doing? Well, one of them seems like he was the only one who was not on board. So he, imagine, oh he, imagine his plight. Yeah. He's in the back and he's like, you know when you're, when you're in a situation, you're like, this is dumb, and you try to give someone a look like a, what are we doing, and they don't give you anything, and you're like. <laughs> if, you turn, if you just turn to the sisters. He's just like, and they're That's like. And you're just like, oh, I guess I'll go fuck myself then. What's weird to me is the fact that after the fact, they don't know what happened still. Yeah. They're still confused. Mm. Considering that the family had no history of mental illness, and also the fact that Sergeant Mark Knight, who worked on the investigation, says there was no sign of the family using drugs, having outstanding debts, or being part of a church or cult, many have wondered what triggered the family to simply leave their home. And furthermore, what prompted each member to leave individually. That being said, let's get into the theories. The first theory is that the Tromps were poisoned by an environmental toxin on their farm, causing them to have bizarre delusions, but there doesn't seem to be anything else to back this theory up. Mold, that's all I got. <laughs> okay. Some moldy Cheerios, maybe some bad cheese. I, I don't know yeah, what else bad cheese, be. that's a thing. I don't know if it would do this. The second theory is just internet speculation that perhaps the mob had been involved. Maybe there was truly somebody after the Trump family, so they skipped town. At one point, the entire family had planned to flee the country if necessary. They had changed their minds because they decided it was possible that their passports would be tracked. I just love that the only reason why they didn't leave the country was like, oh, we could do that, oh, but they're gonna track our passports. Not. Do you think it's a little weird that we're just leaving our country? They wanted to go somewhere where technology couldn't reach them. Credit cards and traceable items were clearly left behind. And if you'll recall, an officer did note that, quote, they were clearly looking for something, end quote. However, if they were truly fearful for their lives, it's a bit strange that Mark and Jacoba Trump would allow their kids to leave the car, which in my opinion, makes this theory unlikely. Did they mean to let them leave though, or did the kids 
bolt. You would think that if your kid's bolted, you wouldn't be like, mm, gotta press on. Well, unless the kids ran, like they stopped at a rest stop, the kids ran and hid somewhere and then proceeded to run away. Then guess, what are you gonna do then? You're gonna go find your kids. Not if I'm trying to get off the grid. Well, off the, the grid, the, no more kids. They would be very selfish parents at that point, in my, in my opinion. If you thought your family was in danger enough to take them away from the home, why not go after them if you think you're truly being, you know, tracked? Well, they don't seem like they make good decisions, Ryan. <laughs> I'm just saying, that's why this theory doesn't make sense. I guess, I don't know, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. The third theory is that the family collectively suffered from a delusion called folia du. It is a rare psychological condition that can affect close families. The term was coined after a French married couple that began exhibiting delusional and paranoid behavior. The couple believed that their home was targeted by people who would spread dust and lint throughout their home while wearing the couple's shoes as they slept. How did this dust get here? They must have been wearing our shoes and doing a little dance at night. I just think of all the delusions you could have, that's the most funny and harmless one. Though doctors were unsure who first began the delusional behavior, it was clear that they were reinforcing each other's paranoia. Over 90% of cases of folia du have been couples, parents and children, and siblings. Media coverage later revealed that Jacoba and Mark Trump had been showing increasing signs of mental stress. Allegedly, one of them believed that someone was out to rob them and kill them. When asked what had possibly triggered the trip, Ella stated, quote, it is very confusing. I still feel confused. I think our state of minds wasn't in the best place and there's no one reason for it. It's bizarre, end quote. In the end, the perplexing Trump excursion covered almost 1,000 miles with no definitive answer as to why, leaving the case for now unsolved. All right, well, once again, we've solved nothing. That was fun. Yeah, it was a good one. Good yarn. It was a good yarn. Fun for fun, fun to do a little story without so much... Uh, death. Death. So you know, you know what's good about this one? It's unsolved, but the people are still walking around breathing. Yeah, it's just some shenanigans. Yeah. Do you think you could become part of a shared delusion, or do you think... I think so. Really? Yeah, I think it creeps up on you, Ryan. I don't think so. I think so. Anytime I've ever offered even a little bit of a delusional thought, you immediately shut it down. No one thinks they're susceptible to shared delusions and then it happens to them. The people who are you know, victim to that probably think they're fine. They don't know what's happening. What if we're in a shared delusion right now? What if we think we're talking to cameras and we're doing an episode of BuzzFeed and Solve when in fact, we're actually not doing that at all? What if no one's watching this? Is this all in our mind? It could be. This could be the most elaborate delusion of all. And we're talking about shared delusions which in term is actually a weird delusional loop. This week on BuzzFeed and Solve, we discussed the death of John Benet Ramsey, a case that to this day still captivates the nation. I gotta say, this one really gives me the creeps. It's not fun. No, it's not fun. A child died. I'm not stoked here. No, I'm not stoked, but everyone seems to want to hear about it, so here we go. On the morning of December 26, 1996, in Boulder, Colorado, Patsy Ramsey claimed to discover a ransom note for her six-year-old daughter, JonBenet Ramsey, on the back staircase inside the house. This prompted Patsy Ramsey to call the police at 5.52 a.m. to report JonBenet as missing. The people inside the house at the time were John Ramsey, her father, Patsy Ramsey, her mother, and Burke Ramsey, her nine-year-old brother. Bizarrely, the body of John Benet Ramsey was found less than eight hours later. And even stranger, the body was found inside the Ramsey residence, in the utility room in the basement. The body was found by John Benet's father. She was found with duct tape over her mouth and a smooth cord around her neck. It is widely reported that the crime scene was heavily compromised by people arriving at the scene. The police later claimed that they had not searched the house after Patsy's call because there was no reason to believe from the ransom note that John Benet was in the house. At the time of her death, John Benet Ramsey was a well-decorated beauty pageant competitor. Having won at least five high-profile competitions, her death was ruled a homicide. Strange, right? Yeah, it's weird. It's peculiar. I mean, I'm trying to think of, like, I've read a lot of these cases. I can't recall one case where the missing person was inside the house. It's spooky. It is spooky. Have you checked the children? The autopsy found that John Bonet was bludgeoned to death, 
while the county coroner ruled that John Bonet had died of asphyxiation caused by being strangled. A paintbrush from Patsy's hobby kit was used to tighten the rope that strangled John Bonet. There was DNA found on John Bonet's long johns and underwear, both belonging to a single unidentified man, who when compared to the FBI's database of convicted violent offenders in 2004, was not found among 1.5 million samples. When you say DNA. Oh, it, it's not like that. Okay. I don't, no, no, not like that. I just, yeah, I wanted to be, yeah. know how gross we were getting here. There were two sets of unidentified footprints found at the scene. There was a rope found close by John Bonet's bedroom that did not belong to the Ramseys. However, as of 2006, the rope had never been tested. If somebody broke into the house, they did so cleanly, as there was no footsteps in the snow outside the house, as well as no sign of forced injury. This is Colorado, right? It's snowing. I mean, conceivably, maybe the snow got covered up. No. But <laughs> no. there's also- I the know snow. You don't do know you, snow because you, you're a Southern California lily. Oh, you're uh, going to pull this but, car right. now from your Chicago, from the Windy City, and I, I don't know anything about weather because we know California snow out there. We know so snow. nice. It's not that hard. It falls from the sky and it hits the ground. What, there's a, there's, the there's some nuance history? to it. There's some intricacy, and if uh, such as what? Oh, you don't even know. Let's move on to the contents of the ransom note. The note requested one hundred and eighteen thousand dollars in exchange for John Bonet Ramsey. Strange. Why is that strange? Weird number. Oh, I guess it is very specific. Actually, we're gonna to touch on why that may be so specific. This is my later. detective brain, this is what I'm telling you about. I think it is. Did that think, number I think stick out to you the first it, time? It did, but I think you're tooting your own horn a little bit too much. Shame the brain. Okay. With the exchange to take place the next day between 8 and 10 a.m., the highly scrutinized note starts with, quote, Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We respect your business, but not the country that it serves." End quote. A strange declaration that would ultimately lead nowhere. If you're sending someone a ransom note, I would imagine you would want to put in as little detail as possible. <laughs> That's true. I'm not gonna say, dear Mr. Ramsey, it's me, a tall fellow. It almost seems cartoony, mm -hmm. almost as if it was fake. Mm. Let's move on. Here's another excerpt. Quote, the two gentlemen watching over your daughter do not particularly like you, so I advise you not to provoke them. Speaking to anyone about your situation, such as police or FBI, will result in your daughter being beheaded. Jesus but Christ. <laughs> Yeah. What? It's a fucking ransom note. You can try to deceive us, but be warned that we are familiar with law enforcement countermeasures and tactics. You stand a 99% chance of killing your daughter if you try to outsmart us. Follow our instructions, and you stand a 100% chance of getting her back. Fucking mathematician over here. <laughs> I know, this guy is a smug piece I've of crunched shit. the numbers. <laughs> I've run the permutations through my little computer, and all of them say, you're fucked. My murder laptop. <laughs> my murder laptop. The letter was signed, SBTC, initials that still remain a mystery. One curious fact is that the sum of $118,000 was close to the amount that John Ramsey received for a bonus that year. Mm. That's when you asked the question about the specificity of the number. Yeah. There it is. I've connected the two dots. You didn't connect shit, but... I've connected them. However, the most chilling fact about the ransom note was that it was determined that the note was written using pen and paper from inside the house. While this detail is absolutely horrifying, it also brought a lot of suspicion into the integrity of the note. This suggests that the killer somehow entered the house, wrote the note inside, and for some reason then killed John Bonet Ramsey after writing a ransom note. All of this occurring while the other three Ramsey family members were inside the house. I feel like I've been in some big houses where you could be in one end, someone in the other end could be straight up murdering a human being and you wouldn't even know. Would you take that kind of a risk as a killer to do all these weird little things inside the house? Yes. Analysis of the notepad used suggested that a practice letter was written and part of a practice note was found. 
They were spelling errors in the letter on words thought to be easy, like possession. Yet some wonder how words such as attache, with an accent on the E, were spelled correctly. Some believe this adds up to the letter being a hoax, and when combined with the lack of evidence of an intruder, this case becomes even more puzzling. Maybe the practice letter was just sort of, you know when you write like a banner and you write with a big marker and then oh, suddenly you're the you've got like three letters to squeeze in at the end and it looks all shitty? Are you under the impression he wrote this in bubbly letters? No, I'm just saying maybe he was spacing it out. It's a notepad. He doesn't need to space it know. out. Okay, then I don't understand the practice. No, neither do I. That's the point. Jesus, I don't understand the beheading. <laughs> what is that all about? With that, let's get into the suspects, starting with the Ramses themselves. In the early goings of the case, the Ramsey family was under heavy scrutiny, given the suspicions of the ransom note's authenticity and the little evidence to suggest an intruder. The actual person responsible for the murder varies depending on who is theorizing. A recent television program claims that police theorized that Patsy accidentally killed John Bonet. That same program also posited that Burke Ramsey, John Bonet's nine year old little brother, accidentally killed John Bonet as well. However, for Patsy or Burke to be the culprit, not only would the note have to be staged, but so would the strangulation. And that doesn't add up when you consider the evidence suggests that John Bonet was still alive as she was being strangled. Furthermore, handwriting analysis also ruled out John Ramsey and ruled Patsy Ramsey as inconclusive. Experts believe the signs are more consistent with child abduction and murder done by an intruder. Fascinatingly, in 2013, it came to light that in 1999, a grand jury had voted to indict John Bonet's parents on charges of child abuse resulting in death. However, the Boulder District Attorney at the time, Alex Hunter, did not sign the indictment, believing that there was not enough evidence to support the charges. Casting further doubt on this theory is the fact that the DNA evidence procured from the crime scene officially exonerated the entire Ramsey family. You could see why people would think it may be one of them in the family though, because if it was indeed an accident, you would have to cover it up, you would have to write a note. Which brings us to our first non-Ramsey suspect, a local man named Bill McReynolds who had visited the Ramsey house two days before John Bonet's murder. He sometimes dressed up as Santa Claus. His own daughter had been kidnapped 22 years before the John Bonet murder. His wife had written a play about a child getting molested and then murdered in a basement. According to the Denver Post, this man felt close to John Bonet. Here's a quote from him. Quote, her murder was harder on me than my operation. She made a profound change in me, end quote. McReynolds even brought a vial of glitter gifted to him by John Bonet into heart surgery. The gift had been meaningful to him since no child had ever given him a gift while playing Santa. He even asked his wife to mix the glitter with his ashes if he were to die. I don't like this man. <laughs> This also could be just the, uh, the, the acts of a kind old man. It is up until him wanting her <laughs> glitter mixed with his ashes. Fair. <laughs> I tell you what, did he murder her? Maybe not. Is the glitter with your ashes a weird thing to ask for? It's the Absolutely. weirdest. Yeah. That's very weird. I don't mm -hmm. like that at all. No. I wish I didn't know it, but now it's in my brain. And now it's on all your brains, whoever's watching this. Deal with it. However, beyond these sensationalized details, which can also be interpreted as the acts of a friendly old man, there is nothing to suggest McReynolds as the murderer. The next suspect is Gary Oliva, a man who lived a few blocks away from the Ramsey home at the time of the murder. In 2016, Oliva was arrested on charges of child pornography. In December of 2000, Oliva was arrested on unrelated drug charges and was found to be carrying a photo of John Bonet in his backpack. He explained why he had the photo to the Denver Post. Quote, John Bonet's murder touched me very deeply. I felt she was an exceptional girl whose death was an exceptional loss. I felt the need to build a monument, a shrine, to remember this little girl. Oh, I don't like End it. quote. Ryan, Ryan. I know everybody wanted to hear about this case, but I don't want it anymore. <laughs> I'm done. Touching on the suspect, this guy's very suspicious. Yeah, Ryan, he is. And it's gonna get worse. Why? A high school friend of Oliva named Michael Vale revealed in an interview with In Touch magazine that Oliva called him a day after the murder occurred and said, quote, I heard a little girl, I heard a little girl, end quote. According to Vale, Oliva also revealed the location of where he had hurt this girl, Boulder, Colorado, after which Oliva hung up the phone. 
thought this is interesting if true because records show that no other girl other than John Bonet was harmed in that area that night. Vale also revealed that the strangulation method used on John Bonet was also allegedly used by Oliva when Oliva attempted to strangle his own mother with a telephone cord. Why, why, why would someone make that up? I don't know, you gotta imagine these people, since the story so sensationalized, they would get paid to give an interview, right? An exclusive, because it is an exclusive with In Touch, which we all know is the major true crime publication of the United States. Yeah. <laughs> Nonetheless, Gary Oliva was also not a match to the DNA evidence. The final suspect is John Mark Carr, a divorced- oh. <laughs> you don't even like his name? Do you not no, like him with I, rem I remember this fucking guy. <laughs> okay. A divorced father and elementary school teacher, Carr did not become a suspect until nearly 10 years after the murder, when he confessed to the murder via email to a journalism professor named Michael Tracy. Tracy had emailed back and forth with Carr for four years in order to gain his trust. That's good journalism. It's good journalism, but I mean, you gotta imagine it takes a toll on you emotionally. Yeah, to have a weird pen pal like that. <laughs> Weird pen pal, yeah, that's a good way to say it. I just don't know what you say to someone for four years. I'll hey, be like, do yeah. you know anything about that kid that got killed yeah, in Colorado? No one's, no one's ever asked me if I murdered anyone. Maybe they're not asking the right questions. Tracy said this of the experience, quote, you are reading and hearing a truly dark side of the human psyche and having to pretend it's okay that I wasn't going to sit in judgment because otherwise the communication would have stopped. This is the worst experience of my life by far. It was horrible, end quote. Was he also pretending to be a weirdo? He had to have been, right? Was he like, yeah, man, I'm a journalist, but I'm a sicko, trust me. Trust me, I'm a sicko. <laughs> That's all he said over and over again. That's <laughs> For four years, trust me, I'm a sicko. Write me back. Judging from the character of this guy that you'll learn later, John Mark Carr, I don't think it's gonna take a lot to outfox him, to be honest. Yeah, I remember this dumb dumb. In his emails, Carr used similar wording as the ransom note. At one point, he used Patsy's mother's nickname in an email, Nettie, and it was bizarre that he would even know that. Carr would eventually write that he was in love with John Bonet and would later confess to hitting John Bonet in the head with a flashlight. Here's some of the email. Quote, she of course was asleep from the time that she was, that I took her from her bed and took her into the basement. Her first reaction was, where am I? And I said, you're in your basement. She wasn't in that little room to be disgraced, and I would never disgrace her or dishonor her. She was there temporarily, and what really hurts me is that she stayed there, and that's where her father found her, and it's just a horrible thing." End quote. I got, I, yeah, this is, I'm just it's, getting kind of bummed out and sad, but we'll keep going here. On August 16th, 2008, with the help of British intelligence, the Royal Thai authorities, and the US Department of Homeland Security, they were able to track down Carr in Bangkok, Thailand, where he had traveled to from the US to escape child pornography charges in California. A few months after this confession, Boulder County District Attorney Mary Lacey issued a formal apology to John Ramsey for the suspicion his family had lived with and said that no one in the Ramsey family is considered a suspect. Carr's DNA did not match the DNA found on the scene, and he was not charged with the murder. However, the US Department of Homeland Security continued to investigate John Mark Carr. He had always maintained that he had not acted alone. If you'll recall, there were two sets of unidentified footprints found at the scene. It's worth mentioning that former Boulder Police Chief Mark Beckner, the lead investigator on the John JonBenet Ramsey case for a time, said in a Reddit AMA in regards to John Mark Carr that, quote, his confession, once they shared it with us, did not match the evidence at the scene. We knew in about 18 hours he was not the guy. We were able to confirm he was not even in Colorado at the time by just doing some routine checking and then obtained photos of him in Georgia at the time. End quote. I think in all these cases, you just want justice to be served so badly that you just kind of want to just plug in the holes. On um, this one though, I almost, I don't want him, I, you know, if he's just lying, I don't want him to get what he wants. Yeah, it's true. If you are the kind of person that wants to take credit for a child murder, yeah. I don't know if we want to give him that satisfaction if you didn't do it. No. You don't get prison, you weirdo. <laughs> Now that we've looked at the suspects, I'd like to point out that in a recent CBS program, DNA expert Dr. Henry Lee, best known from the O.J. Simpson case, studied the DNA from the JonBenet scene. 
Dr. Lee found that JonBenet's underwear may have held transfer DNA from the manufacture process and proved this by testing an unopened bag of underwear, which also had foreign DNA on them. The CBS program concluded that the DNA from the crime scene was therefore fallacious, meaning that conceivably, any of the listed suspects could possibly be the killer. Oh shit. So basically, it's just making the case even more open-ended than we already thought it was. Yeah, because the DNA was ruling out a bunch of other people. Yeah, so it could conceivably be anyone. Well, what the fuck are we doing here, Well, man? that's why it's unsolved. This is a, why? I mean, There's a reason why it's unsolved. In the end, nobody truly knows what happened to John Benet Ramsey. The odd details of the case will likely forever cloud the truth, and the case tragically remains unsolved. say who I think did it. Our legal team has informed me that I can't chime in on that, so. But I will now blink to you in Morse code who I think did it. You don't know Morse code. He doesn't know Morse code. Well, everyone who knows Morse code knows who I thought did it. So, so. So, it's unsolved. unsolved. <laughs> okay, All right. well we did nothing here once again. No, this was, a, this was the worst. Yeah, this was great. Thanks, Ryan. Same time next week? No. Okay. You, that's my chair. That's mine now. One way to treat people. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we discussed the enduring mystery behind the disappearance of famed pilot Amelia Earhart. This one has been the topic of wide speculation for about 80 years now. There's a lot of interesting theories out there. I don't know any of them. This seems cut and dry, but... Oh no? Know. There's more to oh, it? There may be more than meets the eye here. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> All right. Uh, shall we just get into it then? Yes. On July 2nd, 1937, Amelia Earhart, the first woman to cross the Atlantic and one of the most famous women in the world, disappeared along with her navigator, Fred Noonan, while attempting to circumnavigate the globe at the equator. Before we get into the incident, let's quickly provide some context into how accomplished Earhart truly was. The babe of the sky. Oh, that what they called her? I've heard that, yeah. That's dope. It's pretty sick. Babe of the sky. Yeah, there goes Amelia Earhart, babe in the sky. <laughs> Amelia Earhart was born on July 24th, 1897 in Atchison, Kansas. In 1928, Earhart became the first woman to cross the Atlantic, albeit as a passenger in a plane with two other pilots. However, on May 20th to the 21st of 1932, Earhart would make the trip again, this time alone, flying from Newfoundland to Ireland for about 15 hours. She was the second person to ever complete this flight. During this trip, she demonstrated her resourcefulness in times of peril, as her plane suffered a leak in the fuel tank, ice on the wings, and a cracked manifold, which caused the engine to spew flames at one point. Yet, she still completed the flight. On August 24th, 1932, Earhart flew from LA to Newark, setting a record at that time for longest distance flown without refueling. She also became the first female pilot to complete a nonstop transcontinental flight. She's got some salt in the game. She's the Michael Jordan of flying. Well, Michael Jordan never disappeared on a basketball court forever. Well, I mean, so. in terms of, of accomplishments, Michael Jordan never went up for a dunk and then just disappeared. Like, whoa, where'd he go? Where'd the air go? <laughs> this takes us to 1937 when Earhart set her sights on circling the globe, zigzagging along the equator, requiring long hauls over water. If successful, she would have been the first female pilot to fly around the world. Her journey would have taken her about 29,000 miles over roughly 40 days, starting and ending in California, and would have included 20 stops, including San Juan, Calcutta, and Bangkok. Hope she's bringing some, some chewy bars. <laughs> One time, I went on a flight to Asia, and I felt like I wanted to die. How long was it? It was, I don't know, like 19 hours. So and she, this was 40 this days? This is 40 days. Ay, ay, ay. That's a month. Yeah, that's more than a Can month. Can you imagine doing one thing for a month? Like eating popcorn, our favorite thing to do in the world. Imagine sitting in a chair and all you did was eat popcorn Every, okay, that sounds pretty that sounds good. Pretty That's good. pretty good, actually. Yeah. That's a bad example. Yeah. Earhart flew in a twin-engine Lockheed 10 Electra, a 10-passenger high-performance airliner, specifically outfitted with special tanks that allowed it to carry over 1,000 pounds of fuel rather than the usual 200. So when they built this one, they specifically said, let's make a plane that won't catch on fire. I mean, that's the goal with every plane, is it? Seems like they're not doing a great job at that. Though. I'm just saying, do you, do you imagine there's someone that's like, oh, it would be funny if this plane caught on fire halfway through the Could trip. be. There's some sickos out there. If, if there's some, some misogynist pieces of shit on there, you know, on that, on that team, he's like, he's, you know, 
he's screwing the little bolts on, and they're like, well, you know what they're going to use this for? No. Well, they're that babe of the sky. She's going she's gonna to fly around the globe. Oh, is that so? Is that what she thinks she's going to do? Oopsie. Oops. There goes a screw. Yeah. The sky belongs to men. <laughs> On May 21st, Earhart and her navigator Noonan started their journey from Oakland, California. On the morning of July 2nd, 1937, 42 days into their journey, Earhart and Noonan prepared to leave La'e, New Guinea. Leaving La'e, the Electro was carrying the most fuel it had on this expedition, about 1,000 pounds worth. They were already roughly 22,000 miles into the trip and had about another 7,000 to go before returning to California. She planned to stop 2,556 miles away on Howland Island to refuel. It was about an 18-hour flight. Harry Balfour, the radio operator for Guinea Airways and La'e set up a schedule for he and Earhart to send transmissions to each other once every hour. Soon after Earhart's plane took off, Balfour noted that the headwinds were stronger than anybody had thought. He sent transmissions of this information to Earhart three times over the course of two hours. However, Earhart did not seem to get these transmissions. Headwind speed could affect plane speed gas consumption, and length of flight. Around 2.18 p.m., Earhart's transmissions, which had been blocked earlier, were finally received by Belfort in La A. She gave her speed, 140 knots, and altitude, 7,000 feet, and things seemed to be okay. A little over an hour later, her next transmission stated that she had climbed to 10,000 feet. This may have been uneconomical in terms of fuel usage. It's unclear why Earhart made this climb but author Elgin Long, a veteran pilot, guesses it may have been to avoid clouds or mountains. You think she just went vert? Just like... <laughs> I don't know. What do you think of this, Noonan? Maybe there was something she had to avoid that was coming at her. Okay. Uh, if this is a preview of what's to come. Maybe. You never know. This transmission also seemed to be delayed, though they were still on course, and it's believed that the experienced pilot Earhart would have realized the problem with the headwinds by this point. As they neared Howland Island, the plane was likely down to a last 97-gallon tank of fuel. The Coast Guard's Itasca, a 250-foot boat off the coast of Howland Island, was to provide communications and weather for Earhart upon her arrival to the island. It is thought that Earhart's plane must have gotten fairly close to the island because the Itasca did hear her transmissions, which grew stronger as sunrise came and went. In fact, they thought Earhart was close enough that the radio operator on board the Itasca went outside to look for her plane. In one of her last transmissions, Earhart told the Itasca, quote, we must be on you, but cannot see you, end quote. She radioed, quote, gas is running low, end quote. Earhart's last transmission at 8.43 a.m. was, quote, we are on the line 157, 337. We will repeat message. We will repeat this on 6,210 kilocycles. Wait, end quote. While there are conflicting reports, the transmission may have also included, quote, we are running north and south, end quote. In her final transmissions, Earhart's voice was described as, quote, frantic, end quote. Did Fred chime in during any of these, uh... Not really. I think mm. Fred was too busy white knuckling it on the on the passenger seat. <laughs> this is a bad idea. This is a bad idea. <laughs> My wife told me not to do this. <laughs> exactly. After that, Earhart was never officially heard from again. When Earhart's plane never arrived, the Itasca searched the waters northwest of Howland Island. On July 7th, five days later, the U.S. battleship Colorado began to search the waters to the southeast. An aircraft carrier, the Lexington, arrived soon after from its base in San Diego and stayed searching the region until July 18th. To this day, neither Earhart, Noonan, or their plane were ever found. But that hasn't stopped the world from speculating about what happened. Let's go over the theories. The first theory is perhaps the most widely accepted theory, that Earhart's plane ran out of gas, and she and Noonan died when they crashed into the ocean northwest of their destination. Although skeptics have pointed out that an Electra with that amount of fuel should have lasted 24 hours in flight rather than 20 as Earhart's plane did. Analysis by the Jet Propulsion Center at Caltech concluded that with the headwinds and the 10,000 foot climb Earhart was forced to take early in the flight, her plane would have been out of fuel when she disappeared. Near Howland Island, the ocean is about 18,000 feet deep. From 2002 until March 2017, a company called Nauticos teamed up with other groups to search a nearly 2,000 square nautical mile area of the Pacific Ocean floor, where Earhart's Electra may have sunk. They used sonar mapping to search the seafloor, but have not found evidence of the aircraft. Open and shut. I don't get this. It's all there. Is this going to be your Occam's Razor thing that you always cite? 
I think perhaps they slammed into the ocean and sank to the bottom of the sea. They're gonna comb that ocean, baby. And when they do- No one can comb the ocean. They're you gonna, can't drag the ocean. They're gonna comb the shit out of it. No, the ocean, no. That ocean's gonna have nicely groomed hair. The second theory is that Earhart became a castaway on Gardner Island, now called Nakumaroro, roughly 350 nautical miles south of Howland Island. Nakumaroro is along the 157-337 line Earhart last reported flying along. As her plane lost fuel, it is thought she spotted the coral atoll of Nakumaroro that at low tide could have worked as an emergency landing strip. Roughly two to three years later, in 1939 or 1940, a British colonial officer named Gerald Gallagher found the remains of a campsite on the island, along with a box for a sextant, a tool used to determine latitude and longitude via celestial bodies. I think that's interesting. I, I do think it would be interesting if they did end up on an island. Yeah, if they were running out of gas, yeah. which still is in line with your uh, whatever you want to yeah, call it, for sure. your calculations, uh -huh. they could have landed. Yeah, they could have. She was an expert aviator. She was. And she was good at problem solving under pressure. She f flew a fire plane. <laughs> she, she flew a fire plane. However, the most provocative thing discovered on the island by Gallagher was a partial human skeleton, as well as 12 other bones. The bones were analyzed by a physician named D.W. Hoodless, who was working in a medical school in Fiji. But Hoodless determined that the bones belonged to a man who was short, stocky, and of European descent, and could not be Earhart or Noonan. Unfortunately, after this conclusion, Hoodless discarded the bones, thereby preventing anyone from DNA analyzing them in the future. I think that this guy may have jumped to conclusions a little bit, and maybe, just maybe, should have not thrown out the fucking bones. He threw out the bones? I just said that. He said, it ain't them, trash them. <laughs> That's him. Ah, these bones, these, bo nah, these bones don't belong to anybody. Put them back in the ocean. Yeah, it, this guy wanted to go home early that day. I think. Just throwing the bones out. What scientist does that? I feel like the majority of these true crime cases that you do are plagued with people who don't want to do their jobs. And they're not thorough. Yeah, half the reason half of these cases are unsolved is because people got evidence and were like, too much work. Burn it! <laughs> However, the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery, aka TIGAR, used Hoodless's original measurements of the bones and today's updated databases to determine the bones could have also belonged to a taller than average woman of European descent. And Earhart was said to be five foot seven or five foot eight. That's like a foot taller than you. <sighs> I knew you were gonna say that. I'm five ten, by the way, so. No, there's no quotes there. Well, when you wear your special shoes, yes, no, you're No, 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 that's from the doctor. Yes, your shoes are from the doctor. No, <laughs> no they're not. Yeah, they I'm are. five foot ten, damn it. According to Tigar director Rick Gillespie, the reason for there being only partial bones on the island was because of the coconut crabs that live there. He suggests the coconut crabs carried the bones off into burrows and that they may have eaten her. Coconut crabs grew up to three feet long can break open coconuts with their pincers and are the largest anthropods living on land. These are majestic. They're kind of horrifying looking. Anytime you think something's a majestic, just imagine it if it was like 10 times bigger. Or if it was the last thing you saw before you died. Looking into those little beady eyes. Yeah. Tigar director Rick Gillespie has also said that a photo taken in 1937 by a British expedition to Nakumaroro shows what he believes to be landing gear from a plane sticking up out of the water. He also believes that Earhart would have used her plane's radio to signal for help for up to a week following the crash, but that if the radio had been in water, it would not work. Interestingly, according to Gillespie, several possible radio transmissions from Earhart were heard throughout the week after her disappearance, all of which coincided with the low tide on that island, a time when the plane radio was perhaps not underwater and possibly functional. A teenager named Betty Clank claims that via her shortwave radio, she heard a female voice saying, quote, this is Amelia Earhart, help me, end quote, and also heard the female voice arguing with a disoriented male's voice. She also claimed to hear, quote, water's knee deep, let me out, end quote. Well. A little on the nose there. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess if your radio's malfunctioning, you want to get straight to the point. You're not going to say, the story is 1937, I landed on an island. Let me spin you a yarn that you'll, you shan't soon forget. <laughs> you have one. I'm being eaten alive by crabs right now. <laughs> 
Clank listened to the voice coming in clips for three hours and recorded what she heard in a notebook. Clank's father reported his daughter's findings to the Coast Guard, who did not seem to take the claim seriously, as there were reports of dozens of messages supposedly from Earhart heard in all parts of the world in the days after her disappearance. In 1991, Gillespie found a partial rubber shoe sole on the island stamped with the words, Cat's Paw Rubber Company USA. The sole was from the same type of shoe Earhart is seen wearing in a photograph taken in Indonesia shortly before her disappearance. Though, the sole belongs to a size nine shoe, which would have been too big for Earhart. What the fuck, man? <laughs> Come on. I just, I just that's, gotcha. That's right. It's stupid. For a second there, I saw you perk up. You were yeah. Like, Gillespie also found a roughly 19 inch by 23 inch piece of riveted aircraft aluminum under Kumaroro. Tigar believes it to be from Earhart's Electra, specifically from a shiny patch near the tail. Though, Elgin Long, the first aviator to fly around the globe over both poles and an Earhart researcher slash author, says the piece in question is definitively not from Earhart's plane. Other experts, including a Lockheed employee who had worked on Earhart's plane, concluded the same according to Long. Further damning to the theory that Earhart was marooned on this island, was the fact that Navy planes flew over the island Nikumaroro on July 9th, one week after Earhart's disappearance, and saw nothing. Personally, I love the island theory. I would love it to be true because I like, I like the peril of it. I, I like think the you drama. just like her getting eaten by crabs. I love the thought of someone getting eaten by crabs. <laughs> there it is. I, I, I like how you tried to sugarcoat it. Yeah. And I went immediately to the core of what I knew you would find interesting about it. There's just something, it. something truly gross about it and horrifying. <laughs> The third theory, championed by Roland C. Reinick, a retired U.S. Air Force colonel, is that Earhart was in cahoots with the U.S. government and was indeed a spy. Reinick posits that Earhart had a plan B, where if she couldn't find Howland Island, she was to ditch her plane near the Marshall Islands, which are only 800 miles away from Howland Island. That way, the U.S. government would be able to perform reconnaissance in the Marshall Islands, which were at the time occupied by Japan under the guise of searching for Earhart. Corroborating this notion are Marshallese locals who for decades have said they witnessed Earhart's plane crash on their island. However, the plan went awry when the Japanese intercepted Earhart and Noonan and captured them, releasing them years later after the war. Then, Earhart and Noonan returned to live out their lives in the United States under assumed names. Some believe Amelia Earhart moved to New Jersey and changed her name to Irene Craigmill, though she married and became Irene Bolum. Though, this theory seems improbable, at least to the thought that Earhart is actually Irene Bolum, since Bolum sued the publisher of a book that shared this speculation. Also, according to Tigar, the resemblance is not that strong, and comparing photos of Earhart to photos of Bolum taken four decades apart proved nothing. Regardless, Irene Bolum passed away in 1982. This is dumb. <laughs> It's pretty dumb. Can you imagine if someone just accused you of being Amelia Earhart? You're her. I know you are. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm going to tell the world. I do love the idea that the government tells her, land in this area so we can do a little reconnaissance. Another version of this theory is that after being captured in the Marshall Islands, Earhart and Noonan were eventually executed. An army sergeant by the name of Thomas E. Devine claimed that in July 1944, he met a group of U.S. Marines guarding a hangar containing Earhart's Electra on the formerly Japanese settled island of Saipan, which had recently been liberated. Devine also claims the soldiers destroyed the plane. Furthermore, a photo believed to show an obscured Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan on a dock in the Marshall Islands was found in the National Archives by a retired government investigator named Les Kinney. It sounds like he's very accomplished and distinguished and probably knows what he's talking about. That photo looks like shit. <laughs> so I don't care what he thinks of it. He might as well be looking at like a Rorschach blot and being like, that's a, it's your mother. I don't care. Just what he thinks? The expert is only as good as the material he has in front of him. The photo was analyzed by various experts who were optimistic that it was indeed the missing aviators. Unfortunately, this photo was promptly and apparently debunked when two bloggers found the photo in a Japanese book published in 1935, which is two years before Earhart even disappeared. 
So that this photo might as well have been taken in front of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. <laughs> no, t- it's like, hey, here's a lady who looks like Amelia Earhart uh, <laughs> in Idaho I'm- in 1946. <laughs> photo aside, skeptics have pointed out that Earhart, given her fuel situation, would not have made it to the Marshall Islands regardless. Among those skeptics are Elgin Long, a former pilot, and Fred Patterson, a pilot for World Airways and expert on electrodes. So you're wasting my time. You're wasting everybody's time right now. (laughs) Okay, all I'm saying is it's not impossible that they overshot the island, went down, and then wherever they landed, even if it wasn't on the Marshall Islands, they got picked up by some freight boat or they floated close enough that they got picked up by a freight boat. That does not seem crazy to me. (laughs) Sounds like a fairy tale to me. Okay, well, I'm just saying that I, I like this theory quite a bit. All right. I'm glad you like it. Which brings us to our fourth and final theory, that Earhart may have made contact with alien life forms, either by accident or knowingly and in collusion with the US government. I don't even want to talk about it. Why? Because it's stupid. Is it completely impossible that it happened? No, because I actually do, you know, look, aliens are a lot more probable than ghosts. Admittedly, this alien theory is a bit tinfoil hat, but an episode of Star Trek Voyager from 1995 capitalized on the idea. So that's kind of (sighs) cool. Okay. I just love that every time I ask you, can you definitively say no? Mm. What's the answer? Can you definitively say no? We don't need to get into that. No, what do you say? Answer the question. It's crabs, it's crabs. Definitively, can you say that aliens did not have a part in the abduction of Amelia Earhart? No, I can't. There you go. In the end, many believe that Earhart simply crashed and died on impact, but still, there's no way of telling if any of these alternate theories may have transpired until a plane or body is discovered. The case of Amelia Earhart will likely remain unsolved. You know what? I may be with you here. I think crabs one, aliens two, crash three. I bet the crabs built a little uh, restaurant on the island called Joe's Amelia Shack. <laughs> they ate for weeks, probably. Do you think they ate her with butter as well? Oh, yeah. Mm, that's delicious. And one of them was like, oh, a little too humany for me. I don't really like it when it tastes too humany. I like it meatier. And they were like, shut up, Fred. She's a bit too bold. I'm sorry, you have no culture. Was that morbid? Mm-hmm. You know all of this is morbid, That's right? True. Whatever. I'm sure human with butter would taste pretty good. Where are you going? I to don't s- know. To sleep? Okay. Well, it was aliens. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we covered the creepy death of Roland T. Owen. I gotta say, this one uh, really gives me the willies. Gives you little goose pimples? Yeah. I don't like it. There's, I read about this one at night, much like some of you watched this at night, and uh, I was not a fan of some of the small details. There's things in this that just... It rustles your jimmies? Rustles my feathers, yeah. Ruffles your feathers. Ruffles or rustles, it could be either. I don't think so. I think it could be rustles. All right. Well, rustling, you could like rustle through the brush. Agree to disagree. Sure, whatever. On Wednesday, January 2nd, 1935, around 1.20 p.m., a man calling himself Roland T. Owen checked into the hotel president in Kansas City in room 1046. Witnesses said he was aged anywhere from 20 to 35, with brown hair, a scar on his scalp visible above his ear, and a cauliflower ear. He was nicely dressed in a black coat. The bellboy, Randolph Probst, helped Owen to his room where he reported that Owen seemed to have only packed a brush, comb, and toothpaste. The maid, Mary Soapdick. <laughs> What's her name? Oh God, I know what you're, she's a maid, her name is Soapdick. I'm ha, trying ha, to move <laughs> What a really funny big laugh you got out of that. Look how, yeah, look how happy you are. Oh man, Soap what a dick. gem of comedy we've mined here today. <laughs> The maid, Mary Soapdick, said Owen allowed her to clean while he was in the room, but asked that she not lock the door on her way out because his friend was about to visit the room very soon. Soapdick said that Owen kept the shades tightly drawn and the lights off, with the exception of one dim lamp. Other staff members who entered the room also mentioned this detail. I don't want to be in the room when they're in there. That's scary. Yeah. I imagine him just sitting in a chair in the corner, just just a shadow man. Clean it. Clean the room. You, I think you're getting Anton Chigurh vibes from this guy. Fluff the pillow. <laughs> According to the maid Soapdick's statement to the police, she felt that Owen was, quote, either worried about something or afraid, end quote. And that, quote, he always wanted to kind of keep in the dark, end quote. At 4 p.m., Soapdick returned with new towels, finding Owen laying on the bed, completely dressed, in the dark, 
with the door unlocked. She also saw a note that read, quote, Don, I will be back in 15 minutes. Wait, end quote. It's weird, right? Yeah. I would not go back into that room. If you were the maid? No. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good instinct to have. If you see a guy laying on a bed in the dark, awake, just like looking at you, I think that's your cue to leave. The next day on January 3rd, Soaptic came back to clean the room at 10.30 a.m. She noticed that the door had been locked from the outside and assumed that Owen locked it as he was leaving the room. However, Owen was sitting inside, again with the lights off, which meant that someone else had locked the door from outside the room. While Soaptic was still in the room, Owen answered a phone call and said, quote, no, Don, I don't want to eat. I am not hungry. I just had breakfast, end quote. Repeating, quote, no, I am not hungry, end quote. What hotels allow you to lock a room from the outside? This hotel did. It's weird. I would imagine you could just call the front desk and say, hey, I'm locked in my room. Let me out of here. It's just my thought is who is this person that's locking him in the room or who is he waiting for that he's sitting in obedience in the dark? Well, if this guy's a weirdo to begin with, he's got weird friends. Okay, I guess that's fair. Weird attracts weird. Soaptic came back around 4 p.m. to deliver fresh towels. She heard two male voices from inside the room. When she knocked, she heard a rough voice say, quote, who is it, end quote. When she explained that she had fresh towels, the man said, quote, we don't need any, end quote. Even though there were no towels left in the room. During the night, a woman staying in room 1048 would report hearing loud voices, both male and female, cursing on the same floor. Though, there was apparently a party going on that night in room 1055. Now things begin to get very strange. The next morning on January 4th, around 7 a.m., the hotel phone operator noticed that Owen's hotel room phone had been off the hook for a while without being in use. So she sent the bellboy Probst upstairs to 1046. Despite the locked door having a don't disturb sign, Probst knocked a few times and heard a low voice say, quote, come in, turn on the lights, end quote. However, the door was locked and no one was getting up to let him in. So after knocking repeatedly, Probe said, quote, put the phone back on the hook, end quote, assuming that Owen was drunk. Around 8.30 a.m., about an hour and a half later, the phone was still off the hook and another bellboy, Harold Pike, let himself into the room with a pass key. Using only the light from the hall, the bellboy Pike observed that Owen was in bed, naked, and seemingly drunk. He also noticed that the bedding was darkened around Owen. The phone stand was kicked over, so he fixed it and put the phone back in the receiver. They went in there and they saw this person on the bed with a dark, dark stains all around them and were like, chill. Those are, <laughs> those oh. are your sheets. He's obviously making himself into a Sunday. Nothing to see here. Right. Let's go back down to the front Don't desk. Don't just leave. Well. Stupid. At approximately 10.30 to 10.45 a.m., the phone was once again out of the receiver. They sent the original bellboy probes to resolve the situation. When he opened the door, he stumbled upon a truly horrific scene. Here's his statement to the police. Quote, when I entered the room, this man was within two feet of the door on his knees and elbows, holding his head in his hands. I noticed blood on his head. I then turned the light on. I looked around and saw blood on the walls, on the bed, and in the bathroom. This frightened me, and I immediately left the room and went downstairs." End quote. It seems like everyone kept checking in to be like, let's make sure nothing horrible is happening here. <laughs> oh, seems like it might be. We'll give it another hour. <laughs> and then an know. hour later, okay, yep. This murder's warm. not ripe yet. <laughs> it's not ripe yet for the plucking. Yeah. Also, the way they found him. Imagining that is truly horrifying. He said he was within two feet of the door on his knees and his elbows, holding his head in his hands. Like No, I'm, not like that. He's not taking glamour shots. <laughs> nice of you to come in. I'm dying. Just blood. <laughs> Owen was discovered with extensive injuries. He had been tied up with a cord around his neck, wrists, and ankles. It appeared he had been tortured. Blood had even gotten on the wall and ceiling above the bed. I'm a little tired of people being so aghast that blood is on the walls and the ceilings. Of course blood's gonna get everywhere. So a person is <laughs> beating the shit out of someone and stabbing just, them. It's also, I mean, come on, it's a, it's a visceral thing to imagine that someone's getting beat so heavily that blood is splattering everywhere like a Tarantino flick. Uh, yeah, well, that's what happens. If you put your finger in a cup of blood and just went, 
Okay, wait a There's second. blood on the ceiling. <laughs> wait, what? He had been hit repeatedly on the head and his skull was fractured. He'd also been stabbed in the chest several times. His lung was punctured. There was bruising around his neck that could mean he was strangled. Remarkably, Owen was somehow still alive though. One of the detectives to arrive on the scene would ask Owen about anyone else who had been inside the room. Owen responded, quote, nobody, end quote. Although he was hardly capable of talking and not fully conscious. He explained, quote, I fell against the bathtub, end quote. Hell of a fall. <laughs> <laughs> so in this scenario, he falls against the bathtub, rolls over into the bed, and then starts bouncing up and down so the blood splatter goes onto the ceiling and walls. Yeah. And probably bouncing on the bed so hard that he hits the ceiling a few times <laughs> and, and breaks fractures, all his bones. And fractures his skull. Yeah. You know, I'd bounce my head off the bathtub and I thought I'd go for a little bounce in the bed. Jesus Christ. And tied himself up somehow. After this brief exchange, he was completely unconscious and was taken to the hospital. According to a doctor, the injuries on Owen's body had occurred six to seven hours prior to Owen being discovered. It's a long time to bleed. That means that by the time when they first went to go check on him, when the phone was first off the hook, he was already injured at that point. He was already bleeding out and still said, come in turn on the lights. Unless, of course, it wasn't him. It was Don waiting to do more murdering. Detectives found no weapon, nor any of Owen's belongings in the room, therefore removing suicide from the equation. Four fingerprints were found on the phone stand, potentially from a female. Owen would die after midnight on January 5th at the hospital. When Owen initially checked into the hotel, he mentioned he was from Los Angeles, but Los Angeles authorities were unable to find any record of a Roland T. Owen, bringing into question whether that was the victim's real name. His body was placed for viewing at Melody McGilley Funeral Home. As the story spread, more and more people began reaching out to Kansas City authorities to see if their missing loved one could be Owen, to no avail. Next, police focused on the mysterious Don that Owen referred to several times while at the hotel. Don was also conceivably the man with the deep voice that the maid heard through the hotel door. Nevertheless, the police's search returned no results. Owen's upcoming burial was announced by the Journal Post on March 3rd to be in a potter's field. However, the Melody McGilley Funeral Home received a call from an anonymous individual who said they would send the money necessary for providing Owen with a proper funeral. Somebody knows who he is and my suspicion, what if it's Don? Here, because like- Don is a very, <laughs> Tough love kind of guy. I suppose, I mean, there's two reasons why he would not give up his killer, right? Love, uh -huh. or maybe he was being entrapped somehow. Like maybe there was some kind of leverage against him. You think this was a lover's quarrel? It could have been. Oh. Why would he pay for his funeral if he killed him? Or like, and if it wasn't the killer who's paying for the funeral, why wouldn't that person just step forward and be like, yeah, that's fucking Jerry. Right. The plot thickens. It does indeed. This is a thick ass plot. This one's thick. Plot is thick as juicy. hell. Juicy. This is a juicy peach. Oh, it's a juicy peach, all right. And I got juice running down my chin. <laughs> sure enough, on March 23rd, money, bundled in a newspaper, was delivered to the funeral home from an anonymous sender. Funeral flowers were anonymously arranged with the Rock Flower Company, along with a card that said, quote, love forever, Luis, end quote, placed on Owen's grave. You know, I'm just gonna start sending flowers to people's funerals and say, love forever, Luis. <laughs> you should just say, love forever, Shane, in a picture of yourself, like that. But then people are gonna ask me questions like, why'd you do that? And I'd say, eh, it's a funny joke. It's a, it's and they'd say, this is a funeral, you know. <laughs> Skipping forward about a year and a half later, in 1936, a friend of Ruby Ogletree found an American Weekly piece chronicling the Owen case. Upon looking at the magazine, Ruby would correctly identify Owen as her son, who left Birmingham in 1934. Owen's actual name was Artemis Ogletree, and he was only 17 years old. Sounds like a Harry Potter boy. What? That sounds like a little uh, Hogwarts student, Artemis Ogletree. Oh, oh, okay. I thought you were referring in to the context of the case. It sounds like the story of Harry Potter. 
No, yeah. things turned out better for him. Yeah, I think he went on to great, have great adventures. And yeah, he wasn't uh, brutally murdered in a hotel room. That would be a rough end to that tale. Ruby Ogletree, his mother, had actually received three letters from her son in the spring of 1935. However, these letters were delivered after Owen's death and were typed. According to a sensational newspaper account of the murder case, this was especially suspicious because Artemis didn't know how to type. This article also reported that the letter's tone was, quote, slangy and unfamiliar, end quote, to Ruby Ogletree. Is it weird back then that you could just pretend to be someone? You could still do that today. Nah. I bet you I could check into a hotel right now and say my name is uh, uh, Ricky Goldsworth. But then they're gonna say, oh, do you have a credit card, sir? And I'll be like, oh yeah, this is my, uh, my friend. Uh, I'm just putting a, it, it's just a deposit, That's right? That's not, not gonna fly. They're gonna put handcuffs on you right away. Where'd you grow up, Ricky Goldsworth? Oh, I grew up down the road. Where? No. What city? Oh, New York City. You grew up in New York City. This is city. happening in New York now. What's your mother's name, Ricky Goldsworth? Uh, Lucy Goldsworth. What's her maiden name? Lucy Gold. <laughs> See? Crumbling. Well, I wouldn't stumble like that. I'd have a, I'd have a, a, a prepared response. And You'd be firing them off? I'd be firing them off, and I'd be like, what's the fucking holdup? <laughs> trying to check into a room, and you're giving me a goddamn inquisition? Is this how you treat all your customers? All right. Who do you think you are? That's fair, huh? okay, And I, and I poke him in the chest like this, huh? At this point, huh, I'm Buster? giving you a room, all right? You did it, you're, you're, you win. <laughs> you win, Ricky. After some time, it was revealed that Artemis Ogletree had also stayed at the St. Regis in Kansas City with another man, possibly Don. In the early 2000s, Dr. John Horner, the author of an exhaustive account of the murder case published by the Kansas City Public Library, received an out-of-state call about Artemis Ogletree. The caller claimed to find a box containing newspaper articles about the Ogletree murder in a deceased elderly person's belongings. According to the caller, there was something else in the box, something else that had apparently been referenced in the newspaper articles. Unfortunately, the caller did not say what that item was. After that, the case would have no further revelations and would disappear into obscurity. And with that, let's get into the theories. The first theory is rather simple, that the man referred to as Don beat Artemis Ogletree to death in room 1046 and acted alone. As mentioned before, it came to light that shortly before his death, Ogletree had stayed in a different Kansas City hotel with another man, possibly Don. Don was also conceivably the man with the deep voice that the maid heard through the hotel door. But even if this theory is true, the police were never able to figure out who Don actually was. The second theory is that the unknown Don didn't act alone. This theory relates to an observation by Charles Blocker, the elevator operator the night of the murder. His observation also perhaps sheds a little light onto who Don could be. The night of the murder, Blocker saw a quote, commercial woman, end quote, going to the 10th floor. The elevator operator estimated that the woman was 135 pounds and about five and a half feet tall. She had dark hair and was wearing a quote, coat of black Hudson seal or imitation Hudson seal, end quote. What is the commercial, what a commercial woman? She would look like she was dressed in very nice clothing, so they called her commercial woman. What? Anyways, I didn't make up the name, that's what they called she her. Looked, she looked like the pine saw lady. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, she was hanging out with uh, the brawny guy. It she her, was next to a big, tall, bald man in a white t-shirt. Yeah, it was her, brawny, and Mr. Clean. Yeah. They all went and they just went off on little adventures. Sure. Blocker claimed this woman was looking for room 1026 to meet a man she was unable to find. It's possible that this woman was looking for Ogletree and had mistaken room 1046 for 1026. This commercial woman was also seen with a man from the ninth floor, a man that the elevator operator said was the same height and weight as the woman. Some speculate that this man could have been Don. If you'll recall, there were fingerprints, potentially from a female, found on the phone stand and a woman staying next door in room 1048 reported hearing loud female and male voices cursing. So it wouldn't be unreasonable to suspect that this commercial woman and the man from the ninth floor could have been responsible for what happened to Artemis Ogletree. However, there is nothing official on the woman or the man beyond what little is on the internet and my own personal speculation. The third theory comes from many sensational articles published in the following years that suggested Ogletree was killed for being unfaithful to his fiancée. I'd like to call to mind the announcement in the Journal Post that Ogletree would be buried in a potter's field. The announcement that appeared to prompt an anonymous caller to fund Ogletree's funeral. According to a sensational article published in the Newcastle Sun called Mystery Murder in Room 1046, 
that sequence of events went a little differently. The article states that a woman called the local paper to say, quote, you have a story in your paper that is wrong. Roland Owen will not be buried in a pauper's grave. Arrangements have been made for his funeral, end quote. I'm gonna start using it. A pauper's grave? Well, just a pauper's as sort of a descriptor. Like if I get a, if I get a subpar salad, Oh, you get, this is a pauper salad. I will not eat this pauper salad. Or if you get like a hotel room that just has a view of the parking lot or the freeway, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna sit in this pauper's hotel room. Front desk, yes. I will not accept this pauper's view. This is Ricky Goldsworth. You know what the deal is. Do you want me to come down there again? Didn't think so. Man, that guy's scary. Yeah, he's really scary. When asked to identify herself and what actually happened to the man still known as Owen at the time, she replied, quote, never mind. I know what I'm talking about. He got into a jam end quote, before hanging up the phone. At the same time, a man called the funeral parlor where Owen was held and said, quote, don't bury Owen in a pauper's grave. I want you to bury him in Memorial Park Cemetery. Then he will be near my sister. I'll send funds to cover the funeral expenses, end quote. These people hate paupers. <laughs> I think maybe that may have just been slang for the time. It was it? I mean, it seems, unless these two people just love saying paupers, Either way, the more important detail to mine from that is sister's the fact grave. sister's grave. Did they look into the cemetery and see? Oh, or about, they were gonna get into that grave. Right well, kinda. The man apparently explained that Owen had jilted a girl he was engaged to, and that in room 1046, Owen the man and the jilted girl had a quote, little meeting, end quote. Before hanging up, he said, quote, cheaters usually get what's coming to them, end quote. Shortly after, the Rock Floral Company received a call asking for, quote, 13 American Beauty roses sent to Roland Owen's funeral, end quote. The voice added, quote, I'm doing this for my sister, end quote. These poor people at this funeral home <laughs> are just trying to d make a nice little occasion for this brutally murdered man. And, and they have th just this cartoonish cast of characters calling them up to deliver these grisly, grim messages. If I'm working at that home, I'm just, I'm getting fed up. You wanna come do the job? You wanna do my job? How about I be you and you be Show me? Show up! Why don't you bury them, asshole? <laughs> Stop just calling me, I'm busy. It's fucking annoying. You know how hard it is to reconstruct this man's skull? Other than that, the mysterious death of Artemis Ogletree has been left to collect dust on the shelves of investigators, with no other possible leads or clues. To this day, it is unknown what truly happened in Hotel Room 1046. Was Ogletree held prisoner? Was he actually punished for cheating on his fiance? The case will unfortunately remain unsolved. After I read about this case, I was in a weird headspace, so I watched clips of people falling on YouTube to go to sleep. You watched people falling down? Yeah, like down? a compilation of people falling down. Huh. That's what I did, and it's then I went to sleep. a weird way to make yourself well, feel Well, you know what? Better to think about that than think about a guy in prayer hands uh, bloodied on the floor. On his hands and knees bleeding to death. All right, well, that's that. You think they cleaned that hotel after? I'm sure. Oh, that maid probably had to clean it. Oh, I don't even want to think about Anyways, that. Anyways, get out of my house. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we discussed the highly controversial drowning of Natalie Wood. Get your sunglasses ready because this one is packed full of bright stars. Wow, he had them ready. He didn't even know I was gonna say that. Had them good to go. I'm I'd, always uh, ready, baby. <laughs> I'd like to say that this story isn't gonna be chocked full of terrible Christopher Walken impressions, but I can't say that. And Watch out. Boys. <laughs> Two mice. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. On November 29th, 1981, at about 7.30 a.m., Natalie Wood's body was found floating face down in the Pacific Ocean around 200 yards off Catalina Island's Blue Cavern Point. She was wearing only a flannel nightgown, blue wool socks, and a red down jacket. Before we get into the details of the scene, let's establish what led up to that point. Natalie Wood was one of the biggest stars in Hollywood up until her untimely death with roles that include the classic Christmas film Miracle on 34th Street, which she starred in only at age 11, Rebel Without a Cause in her teenage years, West Side Story, and Gypsy. Gypsy? Yeah, that. <laughs> oh, the famous <laughs> Gypsy. <laughs> Admittedly, I was like, oh, Miracle on 34th Street, cool, Rebel Without a Cause, great, West, West Side, Side Story, Story, classic, and of course, Gypsy. Gypsy. 
eerily. From her early childhood, Wood's mother was said to have filled her with a fear of dark water, as a fortune teller had once prophesied that she would die of drowning. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Did her mother bring her to a fortune teller? I imagine it was like one of those like fortune tellers you see at like a carnival. And like, oh, it wouldn't be funny if you tell my fortune with the little playing cards. Oh, and it... maybe she'll tell you you're gonna marry a rich man. <laughs> <laughs> and she, like, she would. You're gonna drown one day. Water's gonna fill your lungs. <laughs> And I was like, girl. all right, we had enough of this, thank Let's you. Let's go get funnel cakes. <laughs> in a chilling incident from when Wood was 10 years old and filming The Green Promise, a bridge rigged to collapse threw her into the water, despite her mother assuring her it would be safe. Wood broke her wrist and left the incident even more terrified of the water than when she began. As a child, she had such a phobia of water, it is said she was afraid to wash her hair and had recurring nightmares about drowning. This is brutal. <laughs> It came true, so she was actually uh, warranted in all these fears. This though, this would be like if you were eaten by a shark. Or a bear. Oh, I'm sorry. This would be like if you were eaten by a bear. I thought for a second we were talking about things that are actually scary. I made the mistake of thinking of the most apex predator, and I forgot that you're afraid of one of the lesser predators, so yes. No, no. I'm gonna let this slide because I know you're just trying to get a rise out of me, and you truly do believe that the bear is the most dominant animal. I truly animal. believe that. Yeah, it's the most dominant all-terrain animal in the world. And yeah, there's no sure it it's is. It's a killing machine. Yeah, pop, pop that thing in the ocean, see yeah. how it does. On Wood's 18th birthday, she went on a date with actor Robert Wagner, later star of television series Heart to Heart, who was 26 at the time. They married in 1957, but divorced just a few years after. Wood married and divorced another man later in her life, only to marry Robert Wagner once again in 1972. Wood herself had said that she believed her feelings of torment were rooted in a feeling that she did not truly know herself, as people had told her what to do her whole life, including her mother. Jesus. Yeah, she seems uh, a lot more tortured than I originally uh, anticipated. Wagner must, I mean, does that have, man have a magical penis or something? She, they got divorced and then she... You think the only reason someone would go back to someone is because they have a magical penis? I mean, I feel like divorce is probably a lot of work. Do you not know how love works? Maybe I don't. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Pushing forward to more recent history of the incident, it was the weekend just after Thanksgiving of 1981. Wood had been working on the science fiction film Brainstorm with Christopher Walken at the time, and he was invited to join her and Wagner on their yacht named The Splendor that weekend. According to the captain of the boat, Dennis Davern, who had worked with the couple for years and considered himself a family friend, Wood had become infatuated with Walken during filming, and Wagner had even flown out to where they were filming to make sure he wasn't going to, quote, make a fool of himself over this, end quote. This is, this is rough. To be fair, can you blame her? I, here's, I'm actually a little curious about that. I have a hard time imagining someone going gaga over Walken. You go go go. You go 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 over walk. I go go go. You go 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 go. You know he's probably magnetic. I bet uh, when you get in a room with him, he commands the the space. Yeah, no one's like, oh, Chris Walken's here. Everyone's like, you see who just fucking walked in? Chris Walken. What a Walken. Boys, Boys, the party's here. I brought uh, some cocktail weenies. <laughs> <laughs> Though. Wagner was not the only one with a jealous streak, as around the same time, reports say Wood was suffering from jealousy over Wagner's on-screen romance with his heart-to-heart co-star Stephanie Powers. The group left on the yacht around noon on Friday, November 27th, about two days before Wood would be found dead. Everyone on the boat, including the ship's Captain Davern, had been drinking for much of the weekend. On that Friday night, Wagner and Wood argued, to the point that Davern was concerned and asked Walken to get involved. Walken is known to have refused to intervene, saying, quote, never get involved in an argument between a man and a wife, end quote. Davern ended up taking Wood ashore that night in the yacht's 13-foot inflatable dinghy named the Prince Valiant, and they slept at the Pavilion Lodge Hotel in Avalon. The first time Davern was questioned about this night, he lied, saying that all four of them had stayed on the yacht. The police, however, already had evidence that they had not been on the boat the first night, so Davern was prompted to tell the truth. He went on to say that he and Wood spent the night in the same room, but they just drank wine and went to sleep. Davern also claims that in their relationship, he felt very protective of her, and she was very comfortable with him. He seems like a good influence here, maybe. You could spin it that way, you could spin it the other way. You, you could see both sides of the coin here. I mean, if he's removing her from a volatile situation, yeah, but 
the intentions behind that perhaps weren't the most valiant. Hmm. The next morning on Saturday, November 28th, they returned to the Splendor, where Wood apparently decided to stay for the remainder of the weekend based upon Watkins' expressed desire to stay. Watkins and Wood went ashore that afternoon to begin drinking at Doug's Harbor Reef, where they were later joined by Wagner and Davern. The party's waitress recalls that at dinner, they consumed two bottles of wine, two bottles of champagne, and one of the men was also drinking daiquiris. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Holy shit. The 80s are great. Yeah, just going to town. I'd like to imagine it was walking, but. Just throwing back the daiquiris? <laughs> he seems like a daiquiri guy, I don't know. Five daiquiris. <laughs> She also recalls that Wood did not eat much of her dinner and that she did not seem to be in a good mood and when she left the restaurant, appeared to be stumbling. In one moment, Wood was said to have thrown a glass down onto the floor, though Walken later explained the incident saying that it was his fault because he threw his glass on the floor after making a toast and Wood had just followed suit. So fucking Walken is essentially Thor. Yeah. I like this drink. <laughs> Another. Davern has said Walken and Wood seemed very flirty throughout the dinner. They boarded the dinghy the Valiant to return to their yacht for the night at about 10 p.m. As they were boarding, a witness from the Harbor Patrol office said they heard Wood scream about something, which he assumed was just because she was drunk. Witnesses sleeping aboard a nearby boat, John Payne and his girlfriend Marilyn Wayne, reported hearing shouts at around midnight. However, there was a party going on somewhere nearby, so he figured it was from that and did not respond. Payne claimed to hear a woman yelling, quote, help me, someone please help me, end quote, coming from the near stern of the Splendor and potentially from someone in a dinghy. He also believed to hear a man who sounded very drunk respond, quote, okay, honey, we'll get you, end quote. But his tone was so mocking, he claims this is why he believed the cries were associated with the party. Mocking tone, when you say mocking tone, you mean like, okay, honey, we'll go get you. We'll help you. Like intimidating, <laughs> scary, spooky. Oh, you, you went a little darker with it. Maybe that's what he said. Or maybe he was just joking around like, oh, go get you. Or maybe this didn't happen at all. Maybe this guy didn't hear what he thought he heard. Yeah, is he just like parked next to them? <laughs> is it like binoculars, like a creep? <laughs> a star watcher. Oh, what's going on now there? Now they woods up on that boat. Oh, she's screaming. Better, <laughs> oh, shit. better take a note about that. <laughs> Reports say there was a nonviolent argument aboard the yacht soon before Wood disappeared. Wagner has said that he and Walken did have a political debate that he began at dinner, that they continued while aboard the yacht. He describes the event saying, quote, there was no fight, no anger, just a lot of words thrown around like you hear in most political discussions. Natalie sat there not saying much of anything and looking bored. She left us after about a half hour and we sat there talking for almost another hour. Then I went to kiss her goodnight and found her missing. End quote. Mm. What are you what are you on to here? Are you just holding the pen and saying, hmm? He didn't notice she was missing till he went to go kiss her goodnight. Yes. So that doesn't really line up with the whole screaming woman. It doesn't. Aspect. That's what I'm saying. You kind of don't really know who to believe here. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay. At 1 30 a.m. that night, Wagner and Sea Captain Davern made a distress call to the Coast Guard, saying that Natalie Wood had disappeared from the couple's yacht, the Splendor. And about six hours later, taking us back to the start, the body of wood was found floating about a mile away from the yacht. The Prince Valiant, the inflatable dinghy, which he had presumably left the boat on, was found washed up on the rocks just a little further south. The ignition was off, the gear shift was set to neutral, and the oars were locked, which implies she may have never started the vessel. The coroner reported that she had drunk seven or eight glasses of wine before the incident. Her blood alcohol level was at least 0.14, and the police ultimately ruled her death as accidental. She also had superficial bruises on her arms and lower legs, as well as a cut on her cheek. Though at the time, these were all attributed to what might have naturally occurred as she fell in the water. She was a little drunk. I don't know how many, I'm not a big wine guy, so I don't know if. Well, you know what blood alcohol is, 0.14. 0.14 is pretty high? That's 0.08 is the, oh, you're drunk. You're drunk, you should be driving. 0.14 is you should be laying down. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, this is gonna be tricky. I'm interested to hear the theories because it does sound like it could be a case of accidental drowning. With that, let's get into the theories. The first theory is that Natalie accidentally fell into the water and drowned. The conclusion drawn by the chief medical examiner in the LA County Coroner's Office, Thomas Noguchi, was that Wood had fallen into the water while trying to board the Valiant. 
Noguchi hypothesized that her down jacket had likely become heavy and soaked, but she never thought to remove it due to her inebriated state. Fingernail scratches found on the side of the Valiant show she tried to climb back aboard the dinghy. Eventually, she likely finally drowned due to hypothermia and exhaustion. Ultimately, it's likely she clung to its side as it drifted away from the Splendor. However, Wood's sister, Lana Wood, had this to say on the notion. Quote, My sister was not a swimmer and did not know how to swim, and she would never go to another boat or to shore dressed in a nightgown and socks. End quote. I guess if she's her, spent her whole life being afraid of water and she can't swim. Probably probably put on a life vest well, or something. Well, why would she even attempt to or do even this? attempt. In her nightgown, no less. Yeah. In her nightgown, no less. That's why it's strange. I guess when I'm drunk, I I've attempt I've done to, some stupid things. I guess I would attempt to do things that I'm scared of, but going back to my fear of bears, I would never go, hey, let me go pet this bear. No, I wouldn't. One of my greatest fears, I think I've said this before, is that someone will trick me into doing heroin. Which is the dumbest fear I've ever heard in my life. It, it would be against my will. How many situations could even put you up to that potential danger? Like, I don't know. All it takes How many parties are you going to with heroin? Involved? None, but uh, it someone- It seems like could, a lot. It's not the fear that I'm at a party. It's a fear that someone would come up to me on the street and put heroin in me. And then I'm hooked forever. <laughs> what the fuck? Speaking of the nightgown and socks, Robert Wagner also said in a 1986 biography, quote, It was only after I was told that she was dressed in a sleeping gown, heavy socks, and a parka that it dawned on me what had really occurred. Natalie obviously had trouble with that dinghy slamming up against the boat. It happened many, many times before. And I had always gone out and pulled the ropes tighter to keep the dinghy flush against the yacht. She probably skidded on one of the steps after untying the ropes. The steps are slick as ice because of the algae and seaweed that's always clinging to them. After slipping on the steps, she hit her head against the boat. I only hope she was unconscious when she hit the water." End quote. Maybe she did just slip. Mm, Wagner slip. sounds like he's putting forth a pretty solid theory. Anytime someone has a very hyper-detailed account of what would have happened that <laughs> makes them Here's what free to must go. have happened. Here's what must have These happened. These 40 things in succession. <laughs> exactly. However, some have criticized this theory, as the Valiant was a rubber dinghy, which according to Noguchi would make very little noise when they bump a yacht. Additionally, Noguchi reported forensic evidence, including the untouched algae on the swim step. It appeared that Wood may have been attempting to board the dinghy, rather than adjust the rope. Police investigators also found broken glass in the Splendor's main salon, which Wagner attributed to the rough seas, a possible factor in why Wood may have fallen into the water. However, it's here that the testimony of Captain Davern defers. He claimed that Wagner grabbed and smashed a wine bottle after going into a jealous rage over Wood and Watkins' interactions. He claims Wagner exclaimed, quote, Jesus Christ, what are you trying to do? Fuck my wife? End quote. So you could see <laughs> where the two accounts of what happened are drastically different. I just don't understand what the captain would have. Why would he make this up? True, unless he was, here's another turn, unless he was in love with Wood and jealous of Wagner. Oh. See what, it, you can spin anything you want, how you want it. Damn it, Ryan. <laughs> what do you think Christopher Walken said when he said that? No! No! Uh, Bobby! Bobby! <laughs> Two mice! <laughs> Two mice! Strangely, despite blaming the rough seas at first, Wagner admitted to having broken the wine bottle that night in the salon in his autobiography in 2009. Yeah, weird. So, it's weird that his memory up. got clearer yeah. almost 30 years later. Uh -huh. And with that, let's get into the next theory that there was foul play involving Robert Wagner. Before we move forward, it's worth noting that Davern is an unreliable witness for a variety of factors, including that it took years for him to come forward with what he says is the truth. Additionally, he seemed to release bits of information to the tabloids in the years following the incident in a relatively unsavory way. That being said, on the whole, many factors of his story ring more consistent with testimony of other witnesses and other evidence. In fact, Walken's description of what happened when they returned to the boat is also closer to Davern's than Wagner's. Walken claims an argument broke out between Wood and Wagner over Wood's time spent away from family, to which Walken defended Wood at first, but then stepped outside rather than get further involved. When he returned, the two had made amends. Davern also describes events this way, but instead of Wood and Wagner making up, he states he also heard the two continue to argue from where he was on the bridge of the boat, and even claims he heard the dinghy being untied. He claims there was then silence, until Wagner returned at about 11.30pm, looking quote, 
tousled and sweating profusely, as if he had been in a terrible fight, an ordeal of some kind." End quote. Davern also says that Wagner discouraged him from turning on the floodlights or starting up the engine in any attempt to search for her, saying that Wagner said he didn't want to alert the people nearby. <laughs> yeah, I would not want to be this captain. I gotta say though, after hearing this account, the one person who I didn't expect to just be very innocent, fucking Walken seems like he was just chilling. He was just, you know, he was just trying to fuck somebody's wife. <laughs> Davern has since said that he has always believed something malicious may have occurred to Wood, as he believes she would have never tried to go to shore alone, and feels sure if she did want to return, she would have had him take her, as she had the night before. Based on new information, including information from Davern, the case was reopened in 2011. In 2012, the LA County Coroner's Office changes the cause of death from, quote, accidental drowning, end quote, to, quote, drowning and other undetermined factors. End quote. The new report casts more questions on the nature of the bruises and abrasions on Wood's body, positing that they likely had to have been on her body before she fell into the water. Dr. Lakshmanan Satyafajiswaran, the chief medical examiner, said in the report, quote, The location of the bruises, the multiplicity of the bruises, lack of head trauma, or facial bruising support bruising having occurred prior to entry in the water since there are unanswered questions and limited additional evidence available for evaluation. It is opined by this medical examiner that the manner of death should be left as undetermined." End quote. You know why it's good to re-examine these cases like this every now and then? Because the investigators nowadays aren't big Heart to Heart fans. Was Heart to Heart that big of a thing? Was Wagner that big of a star? I feel like I'd have watched it. It was about a husband and wife Detective team? I honestly don't even know. I'm gonna check it out. Okay, well you do that and you report back to me how it is. Heart to Heart and Gypsy. Gypsy, these you gotta see my, Gypsy. My watch Those list, two. I hope these are on Netflix. As of 2013, the LA County Sheriff's Department spokesman, Steve Whitmore, had described the case as, quote, open and ongoing. Nothing definitive has closed it, end quote. However, he had also previously stated that Wagner is not a suspect. Natalie's sister said, quote, I can't imagine that he, being Wagner, purposely would have done anything to hurt Natalie. However, I know things happen when there is too much drinking and fighting, end quote. I'm surprised her sister defends Wagner. Does she though? She, she well, says- Well, the thing that she said is very interesting about how, you know, when everybody's drunk, I, I can't imagine ever murdering someone. But even when you dr drink, you can't <laughs> imagine murdering <laughs> no, someone? No, I'm saying even drunk. But I had, like, I ate a pumpkin once when I was drunk. I just took a bite out of a pumpkin. You're, you're a weird dude. <laughs> Why is that Eating just pumpkins, afraid of people sticking you with heroin needles. These That's a rational fear. I that bet. is not a rational fear. Yes, it is. No, it's not. What are you're, we talking about, Natalie Wood? I don't know. These are the musings of a paranoid man. Whether or not he was responsible, Wagner claims to feel responsible in part for her death, in that he did not notice she was gone sooner. Christopher Walken has spoken on the incident as a whole, officially saying, quote, the people who are convinced that there was something more to it than what came out in the investigation will never be satisfied with the truth, because the truth is, there is nothing more to it. It was an accident, end quote. Dwayne Rasher, the former lead police investigator on the case, still says, quote, I can't tell you exactly how she got in the water, end quote. In the end, the tragic passing of Natalie Wood will continue to confound the world. The familiar faces involved only add to the mystery, and unfortunately, we may never know what truly happened to Natalie that night, as the case of Natalie Wood will remain unsolved. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we covered the Chicago Tylenol murders, a case unlike anything we've seen on this show before. At the time, the case was the center of a national media circus. Some may even say frenzy. Okay, yeah. you're welcome to. It's an interesting case. That's what I'm trying to get at here. Illinois is known for soybeans and poison medicine. And Shane Madej. And me! The nation's greatest tragedy. Uh huh. Let's get into it. Okay. On September 29th, 1982, seven people in the Chicago area ingested poison Tylenol pills, consequently collapsing and dying shortly after. The victims included 12-year-old Mary Kellerman, 27-year-old Mary Reiner, 31-year-old Mary McFarland, 35-year-old Paula Prince, 27-year-old Adam Janus, 25-year-old Stanley Janus, and 19-year-old Teresa Janus. The last three were unfortunately all from the same family, 
Adam Janus collapsed after ingesting extra strength Tylenol. He was rushed to the hospital where he died. When the family returned home to mourn, both Adam's brother Stanley and Stanley's wife Teresa took a Tylenol, resulting in both of their deaths, making it three deaths in the same family on the same day. Oh no! Yeah, I, that's what I was saying. It get, it's so much worse than you would think. The fact that all three of the Janus's died in the same house would eventually lead to investigators connecting the dots. On the night of the 29th, Cook County investigator Nick Pichos compared the Janus's Tylenol bottle to the bottle from another victim named Mary Kellerman. Once Pichos had both bottles, he noticed that they shared one similarity, a control number, MC2880. Deputy Medical Examiner Donahue says he told Pichos to smell the bottles, and Pichos remembers that they both smelled like almonds, and cyanide is said to smell like bitter almonds. Exposure to a large dose of cyanide by any method can lead to seizures, cardiac arrest, and respiratory failure. Blood test results would show that the victims had taken a dose that was 100 or even 1,000 times the lethal amount. This, yeah. this boogeyman is very thorough. Perhaps too thorough, maybe even careless. You think he got lazy and was like, oh, I'm gonna make like thousands of these pills. And he got through like five of them. And he's like, this is fucking hard. Yeah. I think I'm just, you know what, just put them all in one. Could have been 7,000, I guess. It could have been 7,000. I guess we're lucky he got lazy. Yeah. Deputy Medical Examiner Donahue says he spoke with an attorney for Johnson & Johnson, Tylenol's manufacturer parent company. By the evening of October 1st, after all seven victims had died, authorities were fairly certain the Tylenol had intentionally been poisoned with potassium cyanide by someone. Late that night, it was announced that all Tylenol would be pulled from the shelves. Immediately, McNeil Consumer Products, the subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson that manufactured Tylenol, recalled over 31 million bottles of Tylenol and issued warnings. They also offered to replace recalled bottles with new bottles and put up a $100,000 reward for anybody with information about the person who had done this. These precautions were estimated to have cost the company roughly $100 million. I mean, because before this point, they did not have... No, like the, seals on the bottles, well, right? This case was the it's reason what, why tamper-proof seals were created. The greatest safety precautions of our time are um, f written in blood. That's actually that's pretty true. It's accurate. I can't think of one instance where that where we were smart enough to take the the precedent. No, it's usually just well, scrub off all the guts over there, and I guess let's put a cross guard there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> By Tuesday, October 5th, the U.S. Attorney General as well as the FBI were on the case, in addition to local authorities. Tyrone Fawner, Illinois State Attorney General, says he believes in the initial stages there were about 1,200 actual leads. It's estimated that U.S. newspapers ran over 100,000 separate articles about the incident. A nationwide panic ensued. People who believed they might have been poisoned overwhelmed hospitals and poison control call centers. CPD actually went throughout the city giving warnings about Tylenol through loudspeakers. Whoa! So this is like straight up like end of day shit yeah. going on in Chicago. That's pretty good. Actually not Chicago, the whole world. The whole I mean, world. Not the whole, or at least America. Yeah. I'd quarantine myself, I think. I don't think you would have to do, oh, you mean f to, so that you weren't affected by yeah, anything? Yeah, you don't know if it's airborne. You don't know if this is like, this could be the beginning of the zombie apocalypse in my mind. Though I have daydreamed about having an um, uh, amazing bunker that has like satellite TV. And yeah, that'd be like pretty that. baller. I'd I be guess a... satellite TV wouldn't really matter. Get some. If there was an apocalypse. No. There were a slew of copycat product tampering incidents according to the FDA about 270 of them just in the month after the Tylenol murders. Some copycats of them also poisoned pills with things like rat poison and hydrochloric acid. One fact that baffled police initially was that all of the victims bought their Tylenol from different stores, and those stores got their Tylenol from different production plants. Spooky. How could that even be possible? I could see why they were baffled by that. Labs were set up and capsules began to come through for testing. Over 10 million recalled pills were tested. In total, 50 capsules were found to contain cyanide across eight bottles. Five of these bottles belonged to the victims. Two of these bottles were sent back in the recall. And chillingly, one bottle was found sitting on a shelf, still unsold. No fingerprints or other physical evidence was found. There was also no evidence clearly showing the killer's trail in the stores, as surveillance cameras were not as common then. Investigators explored the possibility of this being a white-collar crime syndicate, 
intent on tanking Johnson & Johnson's stock. In fact, Tylenol's share of the non-prescription pain reliever market plummeted from 35% to 8% after the murders. Investigators also looked into every disgruntled employee who worked or had worked where the tainted Tylenol was made, stored, or sold. Do you think Advil was behind this? No, I don't think Advil was behind Is this Big Advil? No, I don't think Big Advil. I'm not, I'm not slandering the company of Advil. Big because Advil I use sounds your... like a shitty indie band. <laughs> The latest release from Big Advil. You see the Big Advils and the new Coachella, Coachella lineup? <laughs> Any shoplifters who had been caught at the drugstores where the poison Tylenol was found were reevaluated. Those who had just been released from prison or psychiatric hospitals around Chicago were interrogated. The police publicized the victims' funerals, hoping the killer would show up at one of them. Eventually, the police reached the theory that whoever did this visited the various stores, purchased the Tylenol, planted the potassium cyanide in the capsules, placed those pills back in the bottle, and then returned the bottles around September 28th. This would be one day before the first deaths occurred. Their reasoning was that the cyanide would eventually eat through the capsules, so whoever committed the crime would have to do it close to when the capsules were purchased and consumed, and would therefore have to have done it in Chicago. We always refer to the Wild West as, you know, just being this crazy time of crime. You could actually get away with a lot of shit in the- Wild West was the 80s. A couple, yeah, essentially, you could, it's a couple decades ago, you could get away with a bunch of shit. Walk into a store, pocket a cola. You could pocket a cola, punch the guy in the face. Yeah, and be and like- And then be like, um, see you later. My name's Shane Bidet, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> Cops wouldn't get to your door for weeks. Yeah, fingerprinting wasn't really around that much. No. Uh, there was no surveillance cameras. They'd have to go off a description, and for you, it'd be tall white guy with a large head, and that's yeah. a lot of people in Chicago, that's a I lot imagine. of people in Chicago. Let's get into the suspects. The first suspect is 48-year-old dock worker Roger Arnold, who said some suspicious things about the Tylenol murders at a bar one night. The police questioned him and searched his home. They turned up several interesting connections. Roger Arnold worked at a jewel warehouse with the father of one of the victims named Mary Reiner. Adam Janus, another victim, had purchased his Tylenol from a jewel convenience store. According to the New York Times, the store where Mary Reiner bought her fatal pills was actually across the street from where Roger Arnold's wife's psychiatric ward was located. How-to crime manuals were found in Arnold's home. Police also found evidence of chemistry in Arnold's home, such as beakers and other equipment, as well as a bag of powder. Though, the powder was tested and it turned out to be potassium carbonate, not cyanide. Roger Arnold also refused to take a lie detector test, and the police never found enough to prosecute him. In June of 1983, the following year, Arnold shot an innocent man named John Stanisha outside of a bar late one night. Arnold did so under the impression that Stanisha had turned Arnold into the police for his suspicious comments at the bar, which he hadn't. Stanisha died, and Arnold was sentenced to 30 years, but got out early on parole. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of his connections to the case seem circum uh, circumstantial. Uh, I mean, there's how-to crime manuals in his house, there's chemistry there. I mean, it, it just said how-to crime? No, like, I don't think it was titled how-to crime. Oh. There were manuals of how-to. If he had a book called how-to crime. How-to crime. <laughs> then there, there's your guy. <laughs> yeah, it was written in crayon. The second suspect is Theodore J. Kaczynski, AKA the Unabomber. A once brilliant mathematician, Kaczynski is currently serving life in prison for killing three people and wounding 23 others with bombs sent through the mail. Oh, hey, I yeah, this guy's, he's crazy. Yeah, he's out there in the character universe. Everybody knows who he is. Here's the thing, this goes back to what we've talked about in the past, that people seem to think that serial killers are all like in this character universe. Yeah, he's can, for sure in the serial killers Avengers, even though he's not a serial killer, he's no, just sort of a terrorist. There, there's no serial killer character universe. All right, anyways. Here are some things that match up with the Tylenol killings. Kaczynski is an Illinois native, and his first bomb was found in Chicago, where he lived at the time. As you already know, all seven killings occurred within Illinois. However, one Tylenol death that is not official is the cyanide poisoning via extra strength Tylenol of J. Adam Mitchell in Sheridan, Wyoming, that occurred a little over two months before the Illinois Tylenol killings. This is noteworthy because Sheridan, Wyoming is a town on the way to Kaczynski's cabin in Montana 
where he lived at the time of the killings. Kaczynski's victims also had connections to Wood. For instance, one of the surviving victims was named Percy Woods, who resided in Lake Forest, Illinois. Another victim was Gilbert Murray, president of the California Forestry Association. Furthermore, Kaczynski's bombs were partially made of wood, and he often used return addresses and pseudonyms involving types of wood in the past. One example was Frederick Benjamin Isaac Wood, with an address of 549 Wood Street in Woodlake, California. Not super creative. Yeah, I'll tell you why this is, this is all relevant. Why I'm talking about wood so much, I'm about to spill that. Oh, let's spill I'm it. about to drop a bomb right now. Drop that bomb, oh, I see. Get You're on brand here with the bombing. What? Bomb, Unabomber. No, I, I didn't even No, it was that. very good. Yeah, okay, sure, I'll take it. This is relevant because two of the three founders of Johnson & Johnson have the middle name Wood. Oh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm good. No, it's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah, a bit of a reach. Not really. It's his calling card. He's the Wood guy. Admittedly, those seem like thin connections, but in February 2009, the FBI office in Chicago announced that it would use advancements in forensic technology in a review of all evidence relevant to the Tylenol killings. The FBI requested a DNA sample from Kaczynski. Here's Kaczynski in his own words. Quote, the officer said the FBI was prepared to get a court order to compel me to provide the DNA sample, but wanted to know whether I would provide the sample voluntarily, end quote. Kaczynski wrote that he was willing to provide the sample on one condition, that the courts not allow the United States Marshals Service to conduct an auction of Kaczynski's belongings. Here's his reason why, quote, even on the assumption that the FBI is entirely honest, an assumption I'm unwilling to make, Partial DNA profiles can throw suspicion on persons who are entirely innocent. For example, such profiles can show that 5% or 3% or 1% of Americans have the same partial profile as the person who committed a certain crime." End quote. He then goes on to say that if a match were to occur, quote, some of the evidence seized from my cabin in 1996 may turn out to be important. End quote. In summation, Kaczynski believed that the items up for auction may be crucial in proving he never owned potassium cyanide. Regardless, the auction went forward as planned, and Kaczynski declined to give his DNA voluntarily. I'm trying to think of how I'm gonna phrase this where I don't sound like a psychopath. Good luck. <laughs> if they're gonna conduct an investigation of him as an official suspect for the Tylenol killings, it makes sense that they wouldn't auction off all of his shit so they could actually conduct a thorough investigation. Otherwise, they're gonna be like, oh, you know what, we'll just have to cross-reference this with the typewriter he used. Oh wait, we sold it to some old lady in Florida, fuck. Some old lady in Florida bought the Unabomber's typewriter? I don't know, oh. it could be anybody. Oh, okay. But my point is, if they wanted to cross-reference cross evidence and go back and look at things, they wouldn't be able to do that if they fucking sold all of his shit. The third and prime suspect was tax accountant James Lewis. On Wednesday, October 6th, one week after the first deaths, Johnson & Johnson received a photocopy of a handwritten unsigned letter. On this letter, the FBI found fingerprints of James Lewis. The letter reads, quote, Johnson & Johnson, parent of McNeil Laboratories, gentlemen, as you can see, it is easy to place cyanide, both potassium and sodium, into capsules sitting on store shelves. And since the cyanide is inside the gelatin, it is easy to get buyers to swallow the bitter pill. Another beauty is that cyanide operates quickly. It takes so very little, and there will be no time to take countermeasures. If you don't mind the publicity of these little capsules, then do nothing. So far, I've spent less than $50, and it takes me less than 10 minutes per bottle. If you want to stop the killing, then wire $1 million to bank account number 84495970 at Continental Illinois Bank, Chicago, Illinois. Don't attempt to involve the FBI or local Chicago authorities with this letter. A couple of phone calls by me will undo anything you can possibly do." End quote. As mentioned before, James Lewis's fingerprints were found on this letter. A warrant for his arrest was issued, and the ensuing manhunt would end on December 13th, after Lewis was spotted at a New York Public Library annex. So James Lewis, by the way, he's the guy whose fingerprints were found on this letter, who wrote this letter. And they spotted him at the library reading How to Crime? <laughs> Strangely, 
The bank account number listed in Lewis's letter did not belong to Lewis, but instead belonged to a man named Frederick Miller McCahey, a man who Lewis believed had stiffed his wife Leanne out of $511 in change. Basically, Lewis only included McCahey's bank account number in hopes that it would expose this $511 theft and ultimately had nothing to do with the murders and was as petty as it was idiotic. Seems like a long way to go for it's a, a lot. That's a lot to do. You can't, he doesn't even think like, oh, maybe the feds will be angry at me on this one. <laughs> you think this was like an anniversary gift for his wife? I don't know. I don't know what he could have done to He's me. He's like, I did, I did a real sweet thing for you, honey. Maybe he was really in the doghouse and he was just desperate for any kind of turn of affection from her. So he I thought, know what I'll do. <laughs> I know what I'll do. I'll write the FBI. That being said, Lewis's past did lead investigators to suspect that he could be the Tylenol killer. He allegedly chased his mother with an ax when he was 19. Not great. <laughs> no, no, off, off to no a bad good. start. I've never done that. You didn't do that, did you? No, I didn't. What? Is there anything to suggest that I would chase my mom with an ax? Not outright. I feel like if you Not peel the outright. layers back. You think you peel the layers back from this onion, you'll see something you don't want to see? Yeah, I think you wear a mask sometimes. Mm. I think you should keep digging and maybe see what happens. Oh, no, I'm good. In 1966, he was committed to the Missouri State Mental Hospital after taking 36 anison pills. There he was diagnosed with catatonic schizophrenia. Later, he tried to explain that both of these events were attempts to avoid the Vietnam draft. Later in his life, Lewis was charged and acquitted for the murder of a man named Raymond West, who had been found dismembered in his own home in the summer of 1978. After that, Lewis and his wife launched a short-lived business venture attempting to import pill-making machines made in India. In 1981, Lewis was suspected for falsifying credit card applications using fake addresses and mailboxes. In a search of Lewis's home on December 4th, 1981, the police did find plenty of evidence to arrest Lewis for these particular crimes. As a result, Lewis and his wife fled to Chicago, where they lived under assumed names for almost a year, bringing us to the timeline of the Tylenol murders. However, the Lewises bought Amtrak tickets from Chicago to New York City on September 4th, 1982, which was 25 days before the Tylenol deaths began. And if you recall, the Tylenol killer would have to plant the cyanide within close proximity of the consumption date, and 25 days was too long. But some investigators on the original case believed it would have been possible for the perpetrator to fly into O'Hare Airport, rent a car, plant the poison, and leave Chicago. Can you imagine just, just going home to your wife and being like, hey, I've got an idea. It's a little weird. <laughs> and she, she just goes, well, sounds good. Yeah, I know. Like, these are two messed up weirdos Unless who have she... found each other, and it's almost a shockingly beautiful love story. Surveillance video from one of the drugstores did show a bearded man who some thought looked a lot like Lewis, but there was no positive ID and nobody could place Lewis in Chicago shortly before the deaths. He's got just a bag full of mailboxes and beards. And, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He's a regular criminal carrot top. Yeah. He's got a whole little case full of things and like little intricacies. <laughs> a little, little horn. Honk, yeah, honk. horn, Elmer's glue, we're good to go. I just cut up an old man. Honk, honk. <laughs> Ultimately, authorities never even had enough to prosecute Lewis, let alone convict him of the murders. However, Lewis's letter writing fiasco did lead to him being convicted of extortion. Lewis was sentenced to 20 years in prison, but served a little less than 13. While in prison, Lewis bizarrely offered his help and explained and drew in detail how someone might go about injecting the capsules with lethal amounts of cyanide. Lewis was released in 1995 and he and his wife now live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In 2010, James Lewis published a book titled Poison, The Doctor's Dilemma. Lewis would insist that the book had nothing to do with the Tylenol murders and also stated that he regretted sending the police the ransom note. The fictional plot of the book is about death by water poisoned with lead in Southern Missouri. When he went on public access television in January 2010 to promote his book, he ended up giving a 48 minute interview in which many of the questions were directed at his role in the 1982 Tylenol murders. Lewis referred everyone to his lawyer and refused to comment further. I just want to talk about my book about poison, not about... <laughs> I don't get it. I just want to talk about my work 
And uh, everyone just keeps seeming to bring up all my past of all the shitty stuff I've done. No, we're good. Ugh, this guy's gross. One positive thing to come of the case came from the FDA and Johnson & Johnson, who together created the tamper-proof foil seals that we now use to determine if containers have been tampered with. I do think it's possible that someone could have flown in, did a little day trip, plant some pills and go back home. I mean, it's not that crazy to me. Obviously, this person has a way with uh, fooling the police. It must have been fun to be a criminal in the 80s. <laughs> Everything before the 80s, just lawless. Yeah, it's true. My takeaway is people from Chicago are weird. Th th this does not represent Chicago. This is people who go, hey, Chicago, Tylenol murders. <laughs> home with the Bean, the Cubs, and the Chicago Tylenol murders. <laughs> And of course, our nation's greatest tragedy, Shane Madej. That's not, that's not me, I'm, I'm not. I read it somewhere. You didn't read, you probably wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> In the end, nobody really knows who the Tylenol killer was or why he or she did it. What truly transpired on that one fateful day in Chicago continues to baffle and the case remains unsolved. What do you suppose is in here? I'm not looking in there. Want me to look in there? What I is it? I don't know what the fuck that is. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we discussed the horrifying Keddy Cabin murders. We're actually gonna go visit the former site of the Keddy Cabin, which is Cabin 28. It's been since demolished. Strap in, because this one is rough. Yeah, this is gross. I'm aware of some details of this and it's, it's yucky. <laughs> That's something like a, a toddler says when they don't want to eat, like if they have like squash in their plate. It's also something an adult says about a gruesome, gruesome murder. I guess so. Let's get into it. On April 12th, 1981 in Keddy, California, the Sharp family and some friends went to sleep in cabin 28 in the Keddy Resort Lodge. What occurred next would shock the county and is a crime that is still actively being worked on today. Four people sleeping in the house were brutally murdered. So right now we're approaching Keddy. The site of this horrible murder. Worth noting it's a town of 66 people. I'm not a gambling man, but I don't really like those odds. Because they've never caught this person? Is that the... Uh... Yeah, so we could conceivably run into this guy, you know, taking a dump in the woods or something. Are we going to stop into town and tell him what we're doing? No, I'm not going to stop into town and tell him what we're doing. Are you fucking out of your mind? I'm starting to think you want to die. Which way do I go? Left. Oh boy, I think this is it. Imagine this is debris from the house. The house was demolished around 10 years ago because there were squatters and people like us that would come inside the house and try and stay overnight. Shit, maybe this is from the house. Could this be. looks like the bottoms of the foundation. Oh, Jesus Christ, dude. Look at that, it's like tie open the bathroom right there, it looks like. <laughs> you really turned a corner on that one pretty quick. Yeah, but I didn't see it up close until, oh my God. It's fucking horrifying. There's an elk though. There's a deer over there. But there's the remains and rubble of one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of all time, and you're looking at the fucking deer in the forest. As mentioned before, four people were killed in Keddy, three of which were found dead inside Cabin 28. Their bodies were found by Sheila Sharp, who, unlike the rest of her family, had slept at a friend's cabin next door. Sheila found the bodies of her mother, Sue Sharp, her 15-year-old brother, Johnny Sharp, and Johnny's 17-year-old friend, Dana Wingate. Sheila's 12-year-old sister, Tina, was missing from the scene, but her remains would be found at a different time, a fact that we'll touch on later. The sister of the people who got murdered here, the next morning she walks in, finds most of her family brutally murdered. She was staying next door at a friend's house. Yeah. Cabin 28 was right here, and that's where she found the bodies of her mom, her brother, her brother's friend, and they couldn't find her sister. Are, are you spooked knowing that there were just, you know, right around here? Strangely, Sheila's two younger brothers, Greg, age five, and Rick, age 10, were found in the cabin, in a bedroom, 
asleep and safe. In the same room, also found asleep and safe, was the boy's friend, Justin Smart. When you look at the scene of the crime, it's tough to fathom how they could have slept through such a tragedy. It's very hard for me to believe that three people could have been asleep while it was happening in the same fucking house. The woods get loud though, is my only thing. Like you're in a cabin. In a cabin. Were they in the same cabin in the, in in the, the room same next cabin. door? So maybe they were in there telling ghost stories or something. I don't think they were. They were probably asleep. Well, they could have. I mean, they could have been in there telling ghost You know how kids do, pillow talk, stuff like that. That's not what pillow talk is, I don't think. That's what it was for me, telling ghost stories. Pillow talk like, could either mean something you do after sex, or it could mean... Yeah, I think that's what It could that mean is. what's like a sleepover Do you tell talk. ghost stories after sex? <laughs> that's for me and my girlfriend to know. <laughs> maybe. You just spark up a, a cigarette. Let me tell you about the Keddy Cabin murders. <laughs> Johnny, Dana, and Sue were all bound to some degree by electrical wiring. These weapons were found at the scene. A bent steak knife found on the floor. A bloodied butcher knife and claw hammer, both found on a small wooden table near the entryway to the kitchen. Blood splatters were found on the walls and ceiling, suggesting the kind of force used. All very effective. For, he, they for stabbed murdering. them so hard, the knife bent. I think people get a little too hung up on that. It's not hard to bend a knife, right? You ever, you ever dip into a thing of ice cream All with a I'm spoon? All I'm saying is there was a considerable amount of force. Being, oh, I, I have dipped a, oh, a spoon into ice cream when so, it's not. Ice cream can bend a spoon. Why when, are we so... Normally I dip the spoon in hot water though, and then I put it in ice cream so I could get a nice clean scoop. That's just smart. It does look like this is pretty central to all the houses. So you would think that there'd be at least one witness. There was so much blood everywhere and there was such force within the murders themselves. There was blood splattered on the ceilings, the walls. So whoever did this had to be covered in blood. Yeah. Maybe he went down that way, but it looks like that's a forest. You can't no one's gonna, if it, You see someone running through the forest covered in blood, you're not gonna bat an eye. You'll probably just be like, oh, <laughs> as you were. That's not how the forest works. You see someone in the forest covered in blood, you're gonna be like, excuse me, sir. Why are you covered well, in blood? Well, I'm not gonna stop him, but maybe I'll like take a good look at what he looks like. I'll Call just the let police, him, that sort of thing. I'll just let him mind their own. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad to know that if you would be the worst <laughs> crime scene witness of all time. <laughs> Here's some background on Sue Sharp and her children. Sue Sharp had left a broken and abusive marriage and was described as a quiet woman who loved her kids. In 1980, Sue moved her kids to the Keddy area where they lived in relative poverty. Let's return to the body of Tina Sharp, the one Sharp sibling missing from the cabin. Tina's skull would eventually be found due to an anonymous tip called into the police on the third anniversary of the murders. The skull was found about 50 miles away in a whole other county. Aside from the timing, which is undoubtedly suspicious, what's truly dubious is the fact that the caller identified the skull as Tina's. But how could the caller have known that based on the skull alone? Because the caller was the murderer. Yeah, that, that's what I'm suggesting. Oh, you were phrasing it in a dramatic way. Yeah, it's creepy. What is it about killers that they want to get caught so badly? Or like they want to get as close to being caught without being caught? I, like if I, I guess I'm not, I can't put my mind into the mind of a criminal, but like. I can. Um, I think some of them want to get caught. I think they do. Or do you think they just want the notoriety? Like the, it's maybe a little bit of both. Oh, it looks like you're not good enough detectives to figure out what I've done. Here, let me throw you a bone. Literally. Literally. Oh. oh. Let's go over the suspects, of which there were really only two examined by the police at the time. Marty Smart and his roommate, Bobo Betty, who lived two cabins down from the Sharps. Let's go over a possible motive. Marty Smart was married to Marilyn Smart, the mother of Justin Smart, who was one of the kids that was found alive and well in the cabin. Marty was reportedly an abusive husband, and there are reports that Sue Sharp had been counseling Marilyn on her marriage. When finding out about Sue's interference with his marriage, Marty reportedly went ballistic about it. Marty reportedly left for Reno, Nevada soon after the murders. Law enforcement at the time felt that the killer was, quote, more than one person, end quote. Hence them throwing Marty's roommate, Bo, who was an ex-con into the case as an accomplice. Because three people's a lot for one person to kill silently 
all at once. What do you think about the his kid being in there and not dying? It's weird. So they're all just pals? So yeah, they were all pals. Um, and they were friends with this boy named Justin Smart. They were all sleeping in the same room mm -hmm. in this cabin. And they were the ones left alone. Interesting. And this dad is the suspect. Marty Smart, dad of Justin Smart, does not kill his own son. And the other two sharp boys were sleeping in the same room as his son. Ah. That's why it makes sense. So they may have only lived if Marty's the killer because they were in the room with his son. Exactly. Despite there being much more to this case, at the time, the investigation strangely stopped there. There was evidence that seemingly went unnoticed, and people of interest that may have not been vetted properly. The father of Dana Wingate, the friend of the Sharps that was also killed, said in 2001 that the police had, quote, stumbled over each other and fouled up the case, and he isn't alone in that line of thinking, as many suspect the police on the case may have been involved in a cover-up. At this point, the entire town is a suspect. You would imagine they're all closely knit and friends. Well, I don't think they're great friends. Oh, well, obviously, because someone murdered the That's other right. Yeah, That's what I'm I mean, getting I'm at. getting, some of them must be friends. Yeah. Others would like to plunge knives into each other. If I can imagine any of my friends murdering me. I could imagine one friend of yours murdering you. Is it you? No. Oh. Former Sheriff Doug Thomas, who was sheriff at the time of the murder, is accused of a cover-up in many online theories, which allege that he was a close friend to Marty Smart at the time. Sheriff Thomas did say that he gave one session of advice to the Smart couple, which took place before the murders. However, Marilyn Smart does not recall the meeting with her husband Marty and the sheriff, but said that the two were not friends to her knowledge. Though, some consider Marilyn Smart a conspirator as well. The scariest thing about this is, I'm pretty sure that there was a cover up by the police department. Police in the 70s, like 70s and 80s police were always just like, oh, you murdered someone? You got 40 bucks. Former Sheriff Doug Thomas recently addressed these accusations. Quote, there was no shortage of suspects, but suddenly now everybody 35 years or so later have all figured out what happened and that all of the investigating officers were corrupt. It's laughable is what it is. Martin Smart was not a friend of mine. At one point, he and his wife were having marital problems and they came to my office when I was sheriff and wanted me to counsel them. End quote. Was he like a relationship counselor? No, he was just a sh it's a small town. I can't imagine there was a, a, a practicing psychiatrist in the area. It just seems like a weird decision if you're having marital troubles. Well, let's mean, let's take this to the police. <laughs> I guess. Maybe they'll help us. Mend us, sheriff. In 2013, the case was reopened by current sheriff Greg Hagwood and Mike Gamberg both of whom had personal connections to the victims of the case. Here's what Sheriff Hagwood had to say about the police cover-up theory. Quote, it has brought to light some amazing timelines, histories, and what some may call coincidence. Others may look at it more accusingly. I don't put anything outside the realm of possibility. Let's go over some interesting new developments brought on by the reopening of the case. The first development happened when Gamberg organized boxes of case reports and evidence from the case that had been shoved aside. What he found was a letter written by Marty Smart to his wife Marilyn, reportedly written soon after the murders. It reads, quote, I've paid the price for your love, and now that I've bought it with four people's lives, you tell me we are through? Great. What else do you want? So why would she want him to murder people? The theory before had mentioned that they were going through problems, Sue Sharp had tried to counsel them, and that he saw it as her meddling with his marriage, and maybe she got annoyed by it too? There must be something else here because that seems like pretty strong evidence that he did this. I guess he never really went out and said, I killed them. Right. He could be speaking in it like metaphorically. I do sort of love the, the language here though. You tell me we're through. Great. What else do you want? I, know. I murdered people <laughs> for you. I know. Now what? Clearly she's the jerk in this one. Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, so I'm the psycho because I murdered four oh, people. Oh, because I murdered four people. Ruined that perfectly good knife. Marilyn doesn't recall receiving the letter. However, she did recognize her ex-husband Marty's handwriting. So this must be why he's not indicted because maybe they can't make it absolute that it is his handwriting indeed. What, the police but, were just writing fanfic? Yeah, what the fuck is this? It was maybe, unless someone wanted to 
implicate him in the murders. Also, but it was in an evidence box. It was official evidence. So and if she recognizes his handwriting. There's something weird going on in this little town. Something it's doesn't add up. Something stinks. The second development was something also found in those boxes of case files. Gamberg found the taped anonymous phone call that tipped off the location of the remains of Tina Sharp. The audio of that 911 call is now being compared with audio of suspects looking for a match. Though, it's worth mentioning that the tape was never voice analyzed at the time. Here's current investigator Sheriff Hagwood on that tape. Quote, why that sat in a sealed evidence envelope never opened, I don't have the answer to that, but we have it now, end quote. This is just baffling to me. Yeah. It looks like they solved anything that was remotely possible of helping them solve the case. They're like, box it up. Yeah. Put it in the corner. Shove it in a closet. That requires real coats work. over it. They have to put this thing to rest and probably, you know, mm -hmm. right the wrongs, bring people to justice. I guess that's technically their job. Yeah, that's what but they get paid to do. can you imagine how much goddamn paperwork is involved in that? <laughs> Holy shit. So much. You gotta do your job, man. You gotta do your job. 10% of your population was just murdered. Yeah. <laughs> Time to look into that one. The third development came from Gamberg speaking to Marty Smart's former therapist in Reno, Nevada. Apparently, Marty had confessed to the murders in a session. The therapist reportedly told Gamberg that even he was surprised that the investigators at the time of the murders hadn't used that confession against Marty. Here's a question, the therapist. So you're a therapist, someone comes to you, oh, I got some troubles. Oh yeah, like what? Well, I murdered four people. Okay, well, I'll see you next week. Take a little drive, go to the police station. Hey, quick note. This guy said he murdered four people in your town. Police go, okay. You drive back to Reno, and then you he don't hear anything else about it. You you're done? That's it? Think of it this way. If you told someone so point blank that that happened, and they did nothing, do you really think you're gonna go back to follow up? Because if the police don't give a shit, in my mind, oh hey, maybe the police were involved. Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't go back and be like, hey, you boys should start doing your jobs. I wanna talk to that therapist. You should start going, <laughs> The fourth development was the discovery that a man had found a steel blue handled claw hammer using a metal detector near a pond near Ketty. The hammer matched the description of one that Marty had told investigators he'd lost. As of late November 2016, it was being tested for DNA or blood residue as a possible additional murder weapon. Dude, what in the world? Why is there so much just stuff dumped around here? Because it's a Shanty it's a, town, it's Ryan. A ghost town, yeah, makes sense. You hear that? Yeah, it's a car. Oh. But maybe he dumped some stuff in the river down here. The river's rather full. I think on account of the monsoon. I don't know if this is the actual pond that Marty Smart dumped his claw hammer in, but. Weird that he would dump a murder weapon when he left the other three in the house if it was him, in fact, who did it. Here's Sheriff Hagwood on the current status of the case. Quote There are people locally who know more than they've said and I believe we've identified some of them, and we know who they are, and we know where they are, and I have every confidence that they either participated after the fact or they have firsthand information." End quote. It's worth mentioning that Hagwood said that there are at least six of these people of interest, all of which are alive. It does chill me that they don't know who did it. No, they could be uh, looking at us through a window right now. There's smoke coming from over there. What do you suppose is in here? I'm not looking in there. Want me to look in there? Wait. <laughs> it's probably just... What I is it? I don't know what the fuck that is. Okay. Maybe it's like an old part of the chimney. <sighs> Looks like a Black Widow bike. In regards to the killers being Marty Smart and Bobo Betty, Hagwood said this, quote, it's a theory that we are working to the degree possible to conclude or dismiss. There's a disproportionate amount of evidence and information that tends to point in that direction, end quote. Yeah, uh, we have a confession letter. A therapist. We have a therapist who said that he confessed. Uh-huh. I mean, how Gosh, many, that is pretty dis disproportionate. How many more forms do you need that in? As of now, nobody has been charged, though you can rest easy knowing that Hagwood and Gamberg continue to dig deeper on what really happened that one night in Cabin 28. 
Here's one final thought from Sheriff Hagwood. Quote, there is not an expiration date on homicides, and to the extent that we have surviving siblings and family members, it is our fundamental obligation to them to understand who did this and why, end quote. And I'm pretty sure we're being watched, so I kind of yeah. want to leave, to maybe, be honest. I think I've go. had enough of Ketty, and I haven't even been here that long. No. I hate this place. Sheila Sharp, one of the surviving members of the Sharp family, said this of Hagwood, quote, Finally, I have somebody who cares. In the last three years, he's done more than the Plumas County Sheriff's Office has done in the previous 32 years. Major shade being thrown appropriately, though. Well, yeah, I mean, her family was murdered, so. And they, no one seemed to give a shit. Right. Collectively, the whole town went, hmm. Sheila personally believes that the murders of her family were carried out by Marty Smart and Bobo Betty. Final verdict, what do you think? I'm leaning toward Marty. I'm interested to see where this goes. I hope, I hope the boys hit a break in the case. Perhaps one day, Hagwood and Gamberg will finally confirm those suspicions. But for now, the devastating case of the Ketty Cabin murders remains unsolved. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we cover the assassination of John F. Kennedy, a topic of controversy for over five decades. Was there actually a conspiracy? What do you think? I'm sure you are well versed in this one already. I know the broad strokes. Um, I haven't really gotten into details. I figure I'll read like a 1600 page book when I'm like 60. Yeah, you don't strike me as a detail guy. I am a detail guy. Let's get into it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> On Friday, November 22nd, 1963, President John F. Kennedy was publicly assassinated while sitting in a car in a motorcade through Dallas, Texas. Kennedy was struck by two bullets, with the second being a fatal headshot. Governor John B. Connolly Jr., who was in the car with JFK, was also hit in the shooting, but survived. Officially, there were three bullets fired by the gunman. The horrifying act was caught on film by a man named Abraham Zapruder with his eight millimeter film camera. The film, now referred to as the Zapruder film, would later go on to be integral into the investigation as it allowed for frame-by-frame -frame analysis. The shooting occurred from the sixth floor window at the southeast corner of the Texas School Book Depository, a building along the motorcade route. The official ruling was that the gunman was a man named Lee Harvey Oswald. Two days after the assassination, Oswald was killed by a man named Jack Ruby at the Dallas Police Department. In fact, that shooting was broadcast on live television. I gotta say, kudos to that camera guy for holding that shot. Because yeah, like, if a gunshot went off, all bets I, are off for me. I would throw the camera at the ceiling, <laughs> scream, and just run. Oh, I wouldn't think about anything. I'd, I'd go, ah! Returning to JFK, there are many who have criticized the motorcade route, believing it to have an unusual amount of turns, which would have caused the motorcade to have to slow down. The route was chosen by Secret Service agents Winston G. Lawson and Forrest V. Sorrells. Secret servicemen sent in advance to check out the route noted that there were over 20,000 windows overlooking the route, but since they didn't have enough men to station at every window, they opted to inspect none of the windows along the route. <laughs> Not a good alternative. <laughs> you know, there's far too many. Hey, fuck it. <laughs> You know, just call it a day. We'll, uh... We don't have enough guys to look at all these windows. What if we just uh, don't do shit? <laughs> but, yeah, but, sounds like a good idea. But sir, the president's gonna be coming to town. Eh, he won't care. What are they gonna do? Shoot him? <laughs> <laughs> One week after the assassination, newly sworn in president and former vice president Lyndon B. Johnson created a commission to investigate the circumstances of the JFK assassination and subsequent killing of Lee Harvey Oswald. This commission was to be headed by Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren and staffed with other esteemed officials. And while the official findings of the commission believes there was only one shooter, it does have one thing in common with numerous conspiracy theories, that the shooter was Lee Harvey Oswald. And with that, let's get into the main theory, which is the official ruling by the Warren Commission that Lee Harvey Oswald assassinated JFK alone with no conspiracy involved. Let's get into the background of Lee Harvey Oswald. 
Oswald had been in Russia in 1959 and had tried to renounce his American citizenship. Oswald had a history of violence from a young age. He once chased a half-brother with a knife. And while in the Marine Corps, where he spent three years, he became qualified as a sharpshooter with the M1 rifle. Oswald, a Dallas resident, was actually under active surveillance by the FBI office in Dallas. However, the local FBI, strangely, did not inform the Secret Service about Oswald. This is especially shocking, considering the fact that Oswald was employed at the Texas School Book Depository, a location right along the motorcade route, from where Oswald would eventually fire the fatal shots from the southeast corner of the sixth floor window. However, to be fair, the Secret Service did not inform the local FBI office of the motorcade route either. So. This was a, a mishandling on both of their parts. They didn't let the clue the Secret Service in, hey, there's kind of like a guy who's kind of crazy, hates America, sharpshooter, right along, you know, where you're gonna be. But then again, I guess they wouldn't know that because the Secret Service didn't let the FBI know of the motorcade route, which would be the first thing, or one of the first things I would do. Communication is important in all fields, right? Am I, do you think I'm being too harsh? No, I don't think so. In thinking that the, these were obvious steps that should have been taken. I think if you were in one of those departments, you know, Jack Kennedy would probably still be alive today. Wow, that's, that's high praise. So you think I could have saved the president? I, you know what? I'll give you it. I, I think you could have saved him. Here are direct quotes from the Warren Commission in regards to evidence proving Oswald was the shooter. Quote, the Manlicker Carcano 6.5 millimeter Italian rifle from which the shots were fired was owned by and in the possession of Oswald, end quote. This was determined due to the fact that there was a nearly whole bullet recovered from Governor Connolly's stretcher and two bullet fragments in the car that matched that rifle, quote, to the exclusion of all other weapons, end quote. The rifle was found hidden near the sixth floor window as well as three bullet cartridges matching the three shots heard. Continuing with the commission's evidence, quote, Oswald had attempted to kill Major General Edwin A. Walker on April 10th, 1963, thereby demonstrating his disposition to take human life, end quote. So this isn't his first big uh, hit job. No. The first one he missed, imagine he trained like a madman so that he wouldn't miss again. He's, man, he's gotta be good though, right? I mean, he hit two for three. Yeah. Furthermore, Oswald unquestionably also killed Dallas policeman J.D. Tippett with a revolver approximately 45 minutes after the assassination. This is backed up by eyewitness testimony and also due to the cartridge cases found at the scene belonging to a revolver on Oswald at the time of his arrest, among other things as well. So he also killed somebody right after the assassination. At that point though, you know. I mean, you killed the president, everything yeah. else is below that. Yeah, it's like when you eat a big meal and then <laughs> have a little snack afterward. Yeah, like if you go eat Chipotle for lunch, might as well have a muffin after. Because might as well have bucket, a muffin. Right? You're already doing damage to your body, might as well finish the job. Do you think he uttered the phrase, might as well, <laughs> as he did it? With all that in mind, it seems pretty clear that Oswald was the shooter. However, many have wondered if Oswald acted alone. Unfortunately, due to the fact that Oswald was killed by Jack Ruby, we may never know for sure. And while it should be noted that the Warren Commission found no evidence that Ruby or Oswald were part of a conspiracy to kill the president, it's natural to wonder if Ruby may have killed Oswald to keep him quiet. The Warren Commission also found, quote, no evidence that Oswald was involved with any person or group in a conspiracy to assassinate the president, end quote. The Warren Commission was firm in their belief that Oswald was the sole shooter. To examine that, Let's take a closer look at the scene of the crime, and more specifically, the bullets fired. The Warren Commission believes that there were only three bullets fired, with these three subsequent results. The first bullet missed, the second bullet hit JFK in the neck and also hit Governor Connolly, and the third bullet was the fatal headshot. The second bullet in particular is the most controversial in that the Warren Commission posits it hit both JFK and Connolly. This idea is referred to as the magic bullet theory. The commission theorizes that from the sixth floor window, the bullet entered through the back of JFK's neck, exiting downward, then entered through Connolly's right side of his back, exited below his right nipple, then entered and exited through Connolly's right wrist, and finally ended in Connolly's left thigh. They even concluded that the nearly full bullet found in Connolly's stretcher 
was this second bullet. However, this magic bullet, as it's often referred to online, has been met with a fair share of skepticism. The main point of contention is that many believe the trajectory from the sixth floor window is impossible. Yet, computer renderings of the event have shown that it is indeed possible when you consider that Governor Connolly was sitting on a lower seat than Kennedy, and also when you consider their body positions. That being said, I do find it hard to believe that this so-called magic bullet would be nearly intact after traveling through two bodies. That first one went through JFK's... Neck. Neck. Oh, out the front. Christ. Through Connolly's back right here, under his nipple, came out there. It went through his right wrist that was sitting like this. Oof. Went through that, landed in his left eye, and stayed there. That's a lot for one bullet. And a lot for one bullet to stay intact. Yeah. Interestingly, the Warren Commission claims the magic bullet theory is not integral to their theory that Oswald was the sole shooter. However, when you examine the frames of the Zapruder film, it shows that there was not enough time for Oswald to fire two shots within the time span that JFK and Connolly were first hit. Basically, if the magic bullet theory isn't true, then there had to be two shooters. Do you follow that? Yeah. Makes sense, right? Yeah, so I'm just gonna guess it's a single bullet then. I mean, now let me disprove the single bullet theory. Okay, I'll let you do that. <laughs> okay. Taking that into consideration, let's attempt to disprove the magic bullet theory. Here's a quote from Governor Connolly in a 1966 interview with Life magazine. Quote, there is my absolute knowledge, and Nellie's too, that one bullet caused the president's first wound, and that an entirely separate shot struck me, end quote. As stated before, if this is true, then it had to be two shooters. Let's also look at the testimony of James T. Tagg, a spectator along the motorcade route, who claims that a stray bullet hit the sidewalk near him and a fragment of that bullet struck him in the cheek. There was in fact a mark on the sidewalk that according to the Warren Commission report, quote, could have originated from the lead core of a bullet, end quote. This potential stray bullet is noteworthy because Tagg claims this stray bullet was actually the second shot and not the first shot, which is particularly damning to the magic bullet theory, which posits that the magic bullet was the second shot and the missed bullet was the first. So either Tagg misinterpreted the situation or there were more than three bullets fired. And if you recall, there was only three cartridges found by Oswald's window in the Texas School Book Depository. So that would suggest more than one shooter. Furthermore, in the 1970s, a new acoustic research technique was used to analyze the audio of the shooting, which found six points in the audio that could contain echo patterns similar to those of gunfire. This further suggests that there may have been more than one shooter. There's even supposedly footage of the JFK assassination from an angle different than the Zapruder film. This alternate footage reportedly shows a now infamous grassy knoll in the background. People who have seen the footage claim to see anything from puffs of gun smoke or a second shooter located on the grassy knoll. However, this footage has supposedly gone missing. <sighs> I know people want to figure this out and that people want justice, but I, I, it just seems like a lot of work. Have I not made great points here though? Yeah, you have, but it's like, I don't know, it's not gonna bring him back to life. It's yeah. not gonna put his head back together. Well, wouldn't you like to know what happened? Do you really want to go on the rest of your life thinking it was a, the sole actions of a madman and not a, a larger part of a conspiracy or a bigger thing? I'm content with that, I guess. Well, you know, you're... here's the thing. If it was a conspiracy, if it was a, a secretive group operating, they did a great job. I commend them. <laughs> no, this isn't... Hey, you fooled us. <laughs> Let's move on, you know? Cynthia Nix Jackson, the granddaughter of the person who took the film, sued the US government for $10 million in 2015 for the return of the film. Apparently, this film has not been seen since the House Select Committee on Assassinations in 1978. This committee, by the way, was formed in 1976 to conduct an investigation into the assassinations of JFK and Martin Luther King Jr. Why it was formed is of particular interest. The House Select Committee on Assassinations was formed after a Senate committee confirmed that the CIA had purposefully withheld information from the Warren Commission investigation. The information withheld involved plots to assassinate Fidel Castro. The House Select Committee on Assassinations concluded in 1978 that scientific acoustical evidence established a high probability that two gunmen had shot at JFK. Also, 
Here's a direct quote from the committee's findings. Quote, the committee believes on the basis of the evidence available to it that President John F. Kennedy was probably assassinated as a result of a conspiracy. The committee is unable to identify the other gunmen or the extent of the conspiracy, end quote. That's the government concluding that, not me. Yeah, again, I'm good with that. <laughs> you seem just so, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know what. I just, I, you know, I trust whatever anybody says about it. If the CIA is withholding information that they don't want us to know, great. That's, you know? that's a major bomb just being dropped right there and you seem indifferent to it. How is that not like, holy shit, how are the gears not turning in your brain now going, what else are they withholding? Like. JFK made a ton of enemies. That guy was shady as hell. So I said, oh my God, what is this gonna turn into a, a, a character? I'm just saying, if him. you go around doing shady shit, no, yeah, that's not, you know. I mean, I think every president has had to do some shady shit. Well, for sure. When considering the conclusions of this committee, the acoustic evidence, the testimonies of Connolly and Tegg, and the shaky premise of the magic bullet theory, there is evidence to suggest multiple shooters. It seems quite likely that there is more to this story than Lee Harvey Oswald killing the president with no clear motive. That being said, let's break out the tinfoil hat and get into some conspiracy theories. And trust me, you're gonna wanna stick around for the last one. The first theory is that Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson had JFK assassinated for political gain in power. Before Kennedy was elected, LBJ had attempted to take the Democratic nomination from JFK at the 1960 Democratic Convention in Los Angeles. According to the book, The Death of a President, LBJ asked the president to continue doing part of his old job as Texas Senator which basically meant LBJ was bored and emasculated by the showy office of vice president, as opposed to the actual power he had held while being the majority leader of the Senate. There were also rumors that LBJ might be dropped from the re-election ticket the following year. LBJ and JFK also apparently had words the day before the assassination. LBJ also played a big part in Kennedy going to Dallas in the first place. LBJ no longer had political control of Texas, which was an important swing state necessary for JFK's re-election. As a result, JFK reluctantly went to Dallas to try and solve the Texas political crisis. Texas was LBJ's home turf, and JFK felt LBJ should have had it handled. LBJ's right-hand man had actually been warned by a high-profile Texas lawyer named Byron Skelton that the political climate in Dallas was not safe and that he feared for the president's safety, but the president was not informed. Though, this information was also received by other officials close to JFK, including JFK's brother, Robert Kennedy. One incident that proponents of this LBJ theory point to involves a woman named Madeline Brown, who claimed to have an affair with LBJ. Brown claimed that she attended a party with LBJ, Richard Nixon, and J. Edgar Hoover the night before JFK's assassination. She claimed that LBJ had whispered into her ear, quote, after tomorrow, those Kennedys will never embarrass me again. That's no threat, that's a promise, end quote. Jesus. <laughs> I, like, that's compelling. Uh, I guess it's a character witness, so you don't really know. I get the vibe that LBJ, he was president, so obviously he's an intelligent man, but he also just seems like kind of an idiot. <laughs> he's always walking around with his pants off. Yeah, that's true. Um, he doesn't seem like the mastermind type. What stock do you put into this admission from her or this claim by her? I'm curious. If I'm LBJ and I've got my illicit arm charm out for the evening with Tricky Dick next to me and old J. Edgar Hooves. <laughs> Tricky Dick. I'm not, I'm not gonna whisper into her ear, hey, <laughs> Tricky the Dick. president's gonna die tomorrow. I can't get over Who you calling that? Richard Nixon Tricky Dick. That's what everybody called him. Is that what, was that it? Oh, uh, Tricky Dick. Tricky Dick. Yeah. Um, yeah, I will say the quote seems a little on the nose for me. Yeah. Why would someone say it so specifically when they're trying to pull off one of the biggest coups in history? LBJ was on the Texas trip the night before the assassination, where his movements were heavily documented. Therefore, it's not possible that this exchange with Madeline Brown happened. Furthermore, while there is evidence that LBJ wasn't happiest as VP, there is nothing to support the theory that he had JFK assassinated. He even helped form the Warren Commission. LBJ seemed like a cool, cool guy. Well, you just said he seems like a dumbass. Yeah, he does, but he's like a bro. 
<laughs> you could knock a cold one back with him. Yeah, play just some because you're a bit of a, a you know. A, he's probably a meathead back in the day. A right? meathead. Here he's a go. meathead. He's a meathead. He's a jock. Yeah, he's a jock. Okay, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. I don't ever. I don't think any vice president has accomplished anything throughout history. In that respect, I don't think he had the uh, uh, the moxie to pull off this. No. The second theory is that the Russians were behind President Kennedy's assassination. Obviously, there was tension between the two nations with the Cold War. Lee Harvey Oswald had tried to defect to the Soviet Union before, and some theorized that he could have been acting as a KGB agent. Oswald was also inexplicably at the Russian embassy in Mexico City a few weeks before the Kennedy assassination. Though, it's worth mentioning that Oswald would not be a smart option for the Russians to use, since he would immediately cast suspicions on Russia due to his well-known Russian ties. Unless they're doing a double bluff. I wouldn't do that. I mean, huh? think huh? about, about this. That? Well, I mean, look at it logically. Why Nicole would we hire Oswald? <laughs> when would we hire Oswald when we, uh, we cl he clearly likes us? <laughs> From a logic perspective, we're in this Cold War with them for about 10 years now. There's always the threat of nuclear war. Why the fuck would they even chance hiring a Russian, a person, a person with Russian ties to assassinate the president when they know the finger would be pointed at them? And then like if that, if they found, if someone were to find out that Russia, uh, Russia assassinated a president, that's immediate That's World war, war three. baby. Yeah. yeah, we all die. Yeah. That's not uh, Vladimir Putin fucking whispering sweet nothings into Trump's ear. That's him blowing someone's head off. Right. The third theory is that the mob assassinated Kennedy. Three different mob groups separately claimed that they were responsible for JFK's assassination. The Chicago mob, the Miami mob, and the New Orleans mob. As attorney general, Robert Kennedy had made moves against organized crime, possibly angering them. Jack Ruby, the man who killed Lee Harvey Oswald, was a Dallas nightclub owner who some theorized had mafia connections. Some even believed that the mob was working in collusion with the CIA to carry out the Kennedy hit. In 2015, an imprisoned former mafia hitman named James Files claimed to have been the second shooter in the assassination, saying he was part of a plot in collaboration between the mafia and the CIA. However, there's no evidence supporting this. Perhaps the most compelling aspect to the mob and CIA theory comes from JFK's supposed ties to Sam Giancana, the head of the Chicago syndicate at the time. JFK's father, Joseph Kennedy, supposedly worked with Sam Giancana in the bootlegging industry during the prohibition. There have also been rumors that Giancana and the mob helped JFK win the 1960 election in the first place. JFK and Giancana also reportedly shared a mistress at different times named Judith Campbell Exner. In fact, in 1975, Giancana was supposed to testify to a Senate committee about his role in a CIA assassination plot when he himself was assassinated. It makes you wonder if someone was trying to keep him quiet. But why even claim it then? Eh. Why would he even make that up? Do you think maybe he was just trying to up his cred like in prison? Like, yeah, I, I whacked Kennedy. Yeah, this happens a lot. People always just claiming. Yeah, but I feel like if you're going to claim something, maybe claim you killed uh, some dude carrying groceries down the alleyway. Don't yeah, just no. claim I killed JFK. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I feel like nothing good could come of that. Everyone just kind of rolls their eyes at him. How could I make my prison sentence a life sentence? Huh. I killed God. <laughs> Speaking of the CIA, let's move to our fourth and final theory that the CIA was ultimately behind the assassination of JFK. Ellen Doles, the former head of the CIA, was actually on the Warren Commission. And as mentioned before, the CIA withheld information from that commission. The CIA now refers to this as a quote, benign cover-up, end quote. There are plenty of wild theories out there for possible motives for the CIA assassinating Kennedy. Some feel that JFK may have found out that the CIA had a plot to assassinate Fidel Castro, and the CIA felt threatened that Kennedy might have a different agenda or even disband them, so they plotted to assassinate him. Yeah, possible. I'm not, I'm not gonna say this one's out of the realm of possibility. There are a bunch of attempts on Castro's life, right? Oh yeah. Exploding cigar. There was also the Bay of Pigs invasion. Yeah, not which great. Was, uh, <laughs> we all know how that went. Forensic historian Patrick Nolan wrote a book entitled CIA Rogues and the Killing of the Kennedys, in which he theorizes that four high-level agents not only planned the shooting, but three of them fired four shots during the assassination. People also feel that the CIA could have picked Oswald to carry out the hit, as he was a known communist and Russian sympathizer. Another possible CIA motive was that after the failed Bay of Pigs invasion into Cuba, the CIA underwent personnel changes at the hand of Kennedy, 
which may have upset them. Blaming something on the CIA is essentially pointing the finger at a shadow. There's nothing yeah. we know about them, and there's nothing we ever will know about we them. We won't. So that's. I think maybe that's why I'm so comfortable with just never knowing on this and hanging it up, because there's just unknowables. There's people who are good at covering their tracks. The CIA is very, very good at operating in, in total secrecy. So yeah, the, the CIA doesn't even leave tracks. They're the boogeyman of they, the world. They probably control more of our daily life than we'd ever know. They're pulling strings. That's all I'm saying. It, it's, it's pointless to point the finger at them, is what I'm, I'm, I'm saying. You, you could say it's anybody at that point, because it doesn't matter. You're making a baseless conclusion. You could say it's fucking Lime Cat or something. Lime Cat? You know, the cat that has a lime cut in half and he wears it as a helmet? He's the person who pulled the trigger. Or she. I don't know if Lime Cat's here. Photo. Yeah, yeah, Lime Cat killed JFK. That's what I'm saying. It's just as Do dumb. Do people call that Lime Cat? Yeah, it's Lime Cat. Is it a cantaloupe or something? No, it's, on its, it's a lime. It's a lime. I don't know. Is it Lime Cat? I'm pretty sure it's Lime Cat. I have n I've never heard someone refer to this cat so casually. Also during that Bay of Pigs invasion, Kennedy refused to offer additional U.S. military support, despite the CIA offering an umbrella of air protection. The explicit use of the word umbrella unlocks one controversial wrinkle to this CIA theory. This wrinkle, which is popular in conspiracy circles, is that Lee Harvey Oswald acted with a potential CIA operative referred to as the Umbrella Man. Whoa! I, I love names like that. Oh, it's not just a name. It is very practical. The Umbrella There's Man. There's no creative input into this name. It's all practical. I fucking love that. Oh, man, I can't the wait The Umbrella that. Man. Oh, I love it, too. I can't wait to tell you. Whoa, that. baby! The Holy Umbrella shit. Man. Don't call me baby, but yeah. In the Zapruder film and other photos taken at the time of the shooting, you can see one lone man holding an opened umbrella above his head. At a glance, this may seem fairly innocuous, but there are two things that make it unusual. The first is that it wasn't raining, and despite it raining in Dallas the night before, nobody in the crowd, as far as pictures and media can tell, had an umbrella. The second, and more dubious occurrence, is the fact that Kennedy is struck by the first bullet at the moment his car passes in front of this umbrella man. Also in that moment, some believe that the umbrella man appears to lift his umbrella a foot or so, both of these things in conjunction have led some to believe that the umbrella was a signal to another gunman, or that the umbrella itself was a spy-like weapon that could fire darts, perhaps explaining the slight hole in JFK's neck. He's like Oswald Cobblepot? Yeah, he's like he's like uh, James Bond, and this is a new weapon that Ooh, he's like the He's like the penguin. Or the penguin. The penguin had a gun, a gumbrella. <laughs> I, I do want to ask, though, the term umbrella in the previous quote is what links that to, wh why? So, is that just an innocuous link there? Was that an, a segue from you? Or are people a, like, that proves that this it's is It's a, a segue and it's somewhat proof in conspiracy circles. Okay, well, that's a grasp. It's the CIA said they were gonna offer an umbrella of air protection, and Kennedy said, nah, you ain't. Mm -hmm. and, okay, well, that, and then, so that's very, Tenuous. And then they're like, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna kill you with an umbrella then. Uh -huh. <laughs> as outlandish as this may seem, a Department of Defense weapons developer named Charles Sensney incredibly testified to the Senate Intelligence Committee that a form of this wacky umbrella weapon exists because he designed it. Sensney described an umbrella-like weapon that could silently fire darts. One JFK book author named Jim Mars also claimed that these darts were fired through the umbrella's webbing when opened. Furthermore, there are pictures that show the umbrella closed before and after the assassination, but during the assassination, the umbrella was clearly open as Kennedy passed the Umbrella Man. The Umbrella Man strikes. So, yeah, I don't think you have to sell me anymore on this, Ryan. I was I was all in once yeah. you mentioned the words Umbrella Man. What do you think about the umbrella only being able to uh, to fire through the webbing of the Great. umbrella? Great, I'm on board. That's pretty fucking cool, right? Look, you could convince me any of anything in the world if you just use the words umbrella man if you say amelia Earhart, her plane was attacked by an umbrella man and he took her to space i'd say that sounds about right also suspicious is the fact that after the shooting while other spectators fled the scene this umbrella man along with another man sat down next to each other on the curb seemingly undisturbed however a possible explanation came from the purported umbrella man himself this man was a man named Louis Stephen Witt, who came forward to the Senate committee to testify, even bringing the umbrella along with him. He claimed that the umbrella was a symbol of protest to JFK's father, Joseph Kennedy. Witt was not a fan of Joseph Kennedy's appeasement policies when Joseph was ambassador to the court of St. James in 1938 to 1939. So, 
as a symbol of protest, Wit used an umbrella, a reference to the signature accessory of Neville Chamberlain, who promoted appeasement as Prime Minister of England. Wit also explains that he only opened the umbrella when he believed Kennedy could see it. And as odd as this may seem, throughout history, many people both in England and America have used umbrellas as a symbol of protest. Even the paranoid former President Nixon banned his aides from having umbrellas when he was vice president to Eisenhower for fear of having a visual link to the unpopular policy of appeasement. I, this, I'm, I'm fed up with this guy. Also, oh, he shows up to court and says, no, this is the umbrella. It's not, <laughs> I couldn't possibly have yeah, two I know. umbrellas. By the way, no follow-up from this testimony, none of them searching his house. Nobody saying and confirming that this is the Umbrella Man. It's just a guy saying this flimsy little excuse about uh, some history lesson that he probably, mm -hmm. uh, I guess he couldn't have Googled it, but he he could have went to the local history professor. Or Absolutely shameful. I don't know. I find it very uh, weak. The supposed Umbrella Man wit also claimed that the umbrella blocked his view of Kennedy being assassinated thus explaining his apparent state of calm, or shock as he described it, as he sat on the curb after the shooting. But some have claimed this isn't proven in the footage. Perhaps Louis Stephen Witt is in fact the Umbrella Man, and this is all a misunderstanding. Or perhaps Witt is a puppet for the CIA to cover its tracks. Nobody can say definitively which is true. <laughs> Fucking Umbrella Man. Uh, I, I just can't believe that that's his excuse. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see it. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I heard the gunshots. I saw everyone running and I thought, oh, it must be part of the parade. It was a very nice parade. I didn't see the part where the president got shot in the head. <laughs> in the end, people continued to speculate on what truly happened in Dallas that day. A 2003 ABC News poll conducted 40 years after JFK's assassinations found that approximately 70% of Americans believed there was some sort of plot behind the killings. Only 32% accepted the Warren Commission's findings, and 51% believed there was a second gunman involved. In 1973, LBJ told The Atlantic, quote, I never believed that Oswald acted alone, although I can accept that he pulled the trigger, end quote. I just can't believe that one single douchebag could assassinate a president. Yeah, he's not a very good villain, right? No. He doesn't even have a, he doesn't even have a scary outfit. No, he's got like a nice smart sweater. And he's got like trendy hair. <laughs> trendy it's hair. It's like perfectly greasy. Side note, what do you think Lee Harvey Oswald used in his hair? I gotta get some of that product. Oh, some good, good pomade. <laughs> That's some gentleman's pomade right there. Well, I guess we'll never know what happened in Dallas that day. Lime cat. Lime cat. Lime cat. Did Lee Harvey Oswald act alone? Was there other gunmen? Perhaps the mysterious Umbrella Man? And if there were, who were they working for? The horrific assassination of John F. Kennedy will remain unsolved. It says danger, I wouldn't go in there. Holy shit. Turn the light off! Oh my God. <sighs> this week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we explore Bobby Mackey's music world, which is seemingly a normal Kentucky bar but many believe it's actually a portal to hell. Uh, as many of you know, or as many of you who watch this show know, I hate demons and I will only do one per season. So uh, this is my sacrifice for this season. I didn't know that was your rule. It's my one rule. Oh, thanks for breaking it. Would it have killed them to make this any closer to the city? Does it have to be on the side of a weird, creepy road? We'd all like to live in the big fancy city. You know what I meant. And the worst part is, I don't even have my holy water. I went to eight churches today to try and get some holy water, and I could not get one bit of holy water. So now I'm going into a demon hole with no holy water. What? Bobby Mackey's, the most haunted nightclub in America. They're certainly not hiding from it anymore. At least the sign's in nice, fun font. It's like Cheers with Demons. I'll open the door for you, you walk in first. How about that? This is, we do this every time and you throw it down like it's a challenge. But, okay. Oh. God, the creak. Oh, that's pleasant. It's got a girl's night out. No, not that, that. Warning to our patrons, this establishment is reported to be haunted. Management is not responsible and cannot be held liable for any actions of any ghosts slash spirits on these premises. 
Obviously enough weird stuff has happened here to necessitate a sign like that. You're not a little alarmed? Look at all these cool little newspaper clippings too. Let's just sit down and then I'll tell you the history of this place. Okay. Aside from housing a supposed portal to hell, Bobby Mackey's also has plenty of rich history that lends itself to spiritual hauntings. I was locking up after uh, a tour, uh, which happened to be pretty quiet that whole evening. And uh, just all of a sudden I started hearing what sounded like all of the windows and doors were just shaking violently. And you could actually feel them you know, shaking through, you know, the walls, the floors were shaking. It was, it was pretty creepy. And so I just stuck my head out the door and, uh, you know, no one was there. Originally, Bobby Mackey's music world was believed to be built as a slaughterhouse and meatpacking plant in the 1850s. The building would go through many incarnations, including a hotel in the 1920s, a country club in the 1930s, and a club and casino called the Latin Quarter throughout the 1930s and the 1950s. The club was actually run by a Cleveland gang syndicate and was reportedly heavily involved in the mob. It's unclear how many undocumented deaths and crimes may have occurred during these mob times. The room that is now the men's bathroom used to be an office in the casino that may have had darker implications. This used to be an office back then and apparently there was a trap door in here that leads directly to the portal to hell downstairs. Yikes. And uh, they would drop bodies down that. Nowadays, they drop something else in here. <laughs> Nowadays, only deuces. There is also a safe room that used to house the casino money. All right, so right now we're gonna go into the what the fuck. What? My eyes must be playing tricks with me. I, you're not gonna believe me if I tell you, so why do I even tell you? But pretty much, I thought I saw something pass by the... You're sure it wasn't just maybe it was bars the there? Maybe it was the light moving. Right now we are in the safe room from back in the old casino mafia days. Mob guys, thought you were tough guys. Thought you were big tough guys with your guns and your threatening and your cursing. Why don't you come in here and give us the business, huh? Why don't you punch me in the face, maybe smack me around a little. <laughs> What are you, a wussy? <laughs> All right, we're gonna be quiet for one minute. You have one minute. Right, ready, and now. Oh fuck, you scared the shit out of me. Oh my God. <laughs> There's I disco just, ball on the I just. <laughs> I just got startled by a disco ball. <laughs> the casino was closed in 1961 by local sheriffs cracking down on organized crime. Now that we've established the general history, let's go over some of the history and legend that haunts Bobby Mackey's. Reportedly, in the 1940s, a pregnant woman named Johanna killed herself after her lover was murdered. Johanna may have been the daughter of one of the gangster casino owners, and reportedly was also a dancer at the club formerly housed in Bobby Mackey's. The story goes that her father had her lover, said to be named Robert Randall, killed. Eerily, Bobby, which is the first name of the bar's current owner, is actually a nickname. Bobby Mackey's full name is Robert Randall Mackey, leading some to believe that Joanna thinks Bobby Mackey is her former lover, Robert Randall. She knows he's dead though. It's a ghost. She doesn't even know she's dead. Well, the ghost looks at him and doesn't realize it's a different I don't know. person. Maybe they can't. They don't, they don't see things that way. Maybe they just like hear the name Robert. Rand like I don't know how it works. Okay. Do you this think is, he's like? This take, is a theory. Do you think he's like taken his license out before <laughs> and the ghost was looking at it, but his thumb was covering his last name and she was like Robert Randall. That must be my lover. Maybe. I imagine most people walk in here and say, Hey, buddy! Yeah. So why is she confusing him with Robert Randall? I don't know. Why don't you ask her? She doesn't seem like a very intelligent ghost. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you always have to insult the ghosts of the place we're at. After her lover, Robert, was reportedly killed by her father, it said that Johanna poisoned and killed her father before poisoning herself in one of the dressing rooms at Bobby Mackey's. So the roses are for her? The roses are meant for Joanna. I'm guessing for people who come in here and investigate. All right, I'm gonna sit down. 
Joanna, are you here? What about the demons? Jesus Christ. Are they here? Ryan's not scared of you either. Oh, nope, nope, that's not true. Oh, you keep tricking me into fucking talking to them, you dickhead. It's worth mentioning that I could find no record of this specific Joanna. Though, there is apparently a death certificate of a woman named Joanna who died in Bobby Mackey's due to poisoning. Another interesting area in the bar is the former kitchen, where Bobby Mackey's first caretaker, Carl Lawson, had an exorcism performed on him. What's so funny about that? In the that? kitchen? Yeah, I, I find that a strange place to get exercise as well. Was it like an emergency? <laughs> like a house call emergency? Like, yeah, you need to come down here quick. He was eating a bagel in the kitchen yeah. and he just fell down. I don't know what's happening. Yeah. No, it didn't happen that way. I don't know why they did it there. Lawson claims that he became demonically possessed during his stay at Bobby Mackey's. As caretaker, Carl Lawson actually lived in the apartment located above the bar, where he reportedly had experiences with many entities. Right now, we're looking for the entrance to Carl's apartment. There's stairs that lead up to where he used to live up there. And one might think that's where he got possessed. Holy shit. Oof, tight squeeze. Jesus Christ, man. Oh boy. A little freaked out now. Very poor cable management. Oh boy. And the sign up front says, go away. <laughs> Carl is a bit of a bit of a curmudgeon. Oh, gross. Oh, Jesus Christ. God, I hate, I don't like the way this room, maybe it's because it's just awful looking, I hate the way. It's old. I feel it. Like pretty much everywhere we go, it's old and gross. And it certainly looks like a room where you would lose your mind. I'll give him that. What the fuck? What? You come over here and you open this. What? It says, danger, do not enter, keep out. Well, why would we go in there? Because, well, I mean, naturally you got it. No, if it says danger. Well, oh, shit. What? That fucking door just moved. <laughs> why was it pinning the door shut? I don't know, I, it says danger, I wouldn't go in there. Ghost hole. Well, they got Peter Frampton tapes in here. And Springsteen! Oh! <laughs> oh, now you go in. Let's examine one last bit of dark history. On January 31st, 1895, 20-year-old Pearl Bryan was brutally murdered by her boyfriend Scott Jackson and his friend Alonzo Walling. Pearl had been five months pregnant at the time of her death. Jackson and Walling were both dental students at the time, and legend has it that they felt their medical knowledge was sufficient enough to perform an abortion. If that was the case, then obviously things went horribly wrong, and they eventually decapitated Pearl in an attempt to conceal the body's identity. What? <laughs> what were they trying to do? They were, how, how do you go that wrong? No one's like fooling around with the tools down by like the, the pelvic area and then like slips. Oh shit, there uh -oh. was my scapula. Oh, it chopped her head off. That's not how it works. I accidentally lopped it. A little too much <laughs> off the top on this one. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be a little leery next time I go into the dentist and they put me under. My dad's a dentist. What? Yeah. Has he ever cut anybody's head off? Not that I know of. I mean, I could, I'm 99.9% .9 sure he's never cut anyone's head off in his time as a dentist. That's concerning that there's that tiny that, margin of error. That implies that maybe he may have before he was a dentist. I don't know about that time. Are you ever eating I've only known him as a dentist. Have you ever eaten dinner with him and he just kind of stares at the wall for a second and you wonder like... And there's well, like a slight glint on the knife. Yeah. And then like, like Is he thinking about that time he accidentally cut someone's head off? Though, some believe this wasn't an accident and Jackson and Walling intended to murder Pearl the entire time. Either way, Jackson and Walling were hung from the same scaffold at the same time, claiming innocence until the end, despite the piles of evidence against them. Legend says that Alonzo Walling threatened that he would come back and haunt the area after he died. Some believe he may have kept his word. That's the weirdest thing to do. Before you die, just be like, I'm gonna haunt you. Uh, it means nothing to you at the time, but yeah. if it gets, you know, other people uh, all like crazy, then why not? Yeah. I'm gonna make creeks. 
No, no, no not that specific. You're getting too specific now. Oh, you gotta be. You need to get more general. Because then every time they hear a creak, they'll think, that's Shane. I shouldn't have killed him. Anytime you get uneasy, that's me. Horrifically, the head of Pearl was never found, and the two never revealed where they put it. Legend has it that they threw the head down the well in Bobby Mackey's basement. Fuck me. <sighs> Holy shit. Oh no, no. That's Carl's old workroom. Look at the holes. There's bullet holes in this door. Huh? Whoa! That's the real deal, baby. But a history of death and violence isn't the only thing that brings this basement to life. Around the 1890s, the building that would become Bobby Mackey's closed its doors as a slaughterhouse. After it closed, it's been said that Bobby Mackey's, and the basement in particular, became a site where occultists performed rituals. And when combined with the dark mob history, there's no telling what dark entities could reside in the basement. In fact, located in the basement, there's even a cage that functioned as a makeshift prison during mob times. So we've got the spooky, Jesus Christ, spooky jail cell here. Oh, you're gonna make me sit in the shitty chair? Put the light right there. We'll start with it on and see if it turns off. Now what? I, um... Now what, Ryan? Shut up, Shane. Demon, oh. turn it on if you're planning to do us harm tonight. It yeah. only happens right away when there's something actually doing something to it. Turn it on if you want to hurt us. Fucking shit! God! Why do you keep asking questions like that? What's wrong with you? Do you want to fucking die? It's just a coincidence. The reason why Shane thinks the flashlight is BS is because a mag light, when turned to the point between on and off, will actually flicker on and off at random due to the heating and cooling of the reflector inside. This is scientifically true. However, the light can also turn on and off due to the slightest physical touch, perhaps like the touch of a spirit. And that's where it gets paranormal for me when the light turns on and off consistently on command over a period of time, like in the Sally House, and maybe like we're seeing in the portal to hell. Turn it off if uh, you think you're, if you want to follow Ryan Bergara home. Why would you ask it that? He lives in Los Angeles. Even if this, this is, why would you even take the chance? You're gonna have a hard time getting on the plane. Demons! Fucking, I'm not. Turn the light off! Fucking shut up! Demons! What is- You're not trying hard enough! Oh my god. Plunge us into darkness, demons! <laughs> what is wrong with you? Demons! Oh my god. You have a death wish. Demons, you cowards! You have a death wish. Turn the light off. No, it's just, it's a bunch of baloney, man. Can we check out some other rooms here? The center of this dark energy is undoubtedly located in the well room. A room occultists used to discard remains of the small animal sacrificed during the occult ceremonies. Some believe that Scott Jackson, the murderer of Pearl Bryan, was a member of this occult, and that he tossed Pearl's dismembered head down the well in the basement at Bobby Mackey's as part of a satanic ritual. Many people believe this well is a portal to hell, a portal that opened the door for the other unnamed demonic entities that roamed the basement in Bobby Mackey's. There's accounts of growls, dizziness, and physical assaults. All right, so this is, uh, inside this door is the well room. That's the portal to hell in there. So we're gonna do two minutes each alone in there. Uh huh. I wanna be able to be pulled out as soon as something happens, so I'm just gonna tie this around me. They used to do this in the Old Testament. I'm gonna tie this around my waist, and you're gonna hold the other end, and if I knock on this, or if I can't breathe because something's choking me in there, if I pull on this rope, you pull me the fuck out of there. Okay. Ah, oh, fucking Christ. Oh, please. Please, please. I'm not gonna talk to anything in here. I don't want to do anything. Oh my God. Oh, we got some rope. Ryan, you okay in there? 
I'm fine. I'm just walking around. I said, okay, you're gonna be okay, Ryan. You're gonna be okay. Ryan, would you be quiet? I'm gonna be quiet now. We got two minutes. Two mi- I thought we already did the two minutes. No, I'm saying we just finished. I'm good? Can I come out? You're good. You can come out. Was it scary? Yeah, it was fucking scary. Okay, I feel safe. Going into the demon hole. You're on your own. All right. Hey there, demons. It's me, your boy. I'm uh, standing near your hole, and it's very dark. And um, frankly, I don't believe in you, so I feel like I'm writing a letter to Santa Claus right now. But uh, my friend Ryan does believe in you, so maybe you are real. He's a, I wouldn't say logical person, but smart. Uh, I guess I'll be quiet now, and if you want to pick me up or scratch me or slam me into the ceiling, now would be the best opportunity for that. Understand, I do have a rope here, so, you know. All right. Maintaining silence now. Do try to kill me. Are you trying to fuck with me? You yeah. <laughs> no demons in there. This place is cleared. <laughs> All right. It's been fun, Bobby Mackey. Let's get the fuck out of here. All right. We did it. We, we... Goodbye, demon. Goodbye, demon. I'm now acknowledging you because I'm leaving. This is the only time That's... Ryan has courage. This when is the he's only time away. I feel confident when I'm walking out the door. So goodbye forever. You'll never see this mug again. It's the happiest that you ever are is when we're leaving. Yeah, because all the joy comes back in my body. Many investigators have ended their nights early due to not being able to handle the forces that reside in the basement. Nobody can say for sure if Bobby Mackey's is haunted but just going off the countless accounts of paranormal and even dangerous activity, it's not a stretch to say that there may be something supernatural at Bobby Mackey's. But whether or not Bobby Mackey's is definitively haunted will remain unsolved. The first time that light turned on, I was a little pretty, I was pretty scared. Maybe there was something in there, I just wanted to get out. So, I'm happy we're done. Uh, you escaped the clutches of yet another demon. By the way, you are a psychopath for saying the things you were saying to it in there. Demons aren't real, so that's why I tend to be so flip with them. Or one of them's gonna follow me home, so Well, the only, way, the only way to really provoke them is to provoke them, right? You don't need to provide a home address. All I said was Los Angeles. You know how many people live in Los Angeles? Oh, that demon's never gonna find you. There's only one Ryan Bergara in Los Angeles. You know is that, that true? Right? Yes, it's true. There's only two in the world. Whoa, have you met the other one? He's in the Philippines. You gotta kill him. What is that? I'm gonna go on record. This is a bad idea. <laughs> I may need to go to the hospital. <laughs> now we're heading into the belly of the beast. So right now we're driving up to Willow Creek, California, the Bigfoot capital of the world. We're gonna catch ourselves a squatch. Wait till you see where we're staying. All right. So this is Willow Creek, the Bigfoot capital of the world. It's a beautiful town. And uh, this is where we're staying. What do you think? Is this a joke? This is the one chance we get to stay someplace nice. And Willow All we Creek. do is sleep in haunted places and dirty old hospitals. We can't stay one place nice once. But how, how often do you get to say you were a part of history, which is what we're about to be? We're about to etch ourselves in the stone of Bigfoot lore. Are you you, could, you, could, about you that? could etch yourself, sir. Well, it was supposed to be fun. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we seek out the ever elusive Bigfoot and tomorrow morning search for him ourselves. We've got our ridiculous Bigfoot beards ready to go. We've got a lot to cover. So let's get into it and let's, uh, well, me and you talk some foot. I'm excited. This is the maybe the only time I believe in the thing that you're talking about. Really? Bigfoot's, you know, meat and bone. I'm not the biggest believer in Bigfoot. Why would you be? It's it's plausible and um, grounded in reality. So it's a lot more plausible than all your spooky little specters. Well, those have evidence, so. Anyway. <laughs> sure they do. 
Let's talk foot. Okay. The first accounts of big, strong, hairy people date from at least the 15th century in Caucasus, a mountain region between Asia and Europe. Different cultures have different versions or perhaps relatives of this creature. In the Himalayas, it's the Yeti. In Australia, it's the Yaoi. In Indonesia, it's the Ibu Gogo. And for America, primarily the Pacific Northwest, it's Bigfoot or Sasquatch. In fact, Bigfoot sightings have been reported in almost every US state. This corroborates the belief that there is more than one Bigfoot, that it's not a singular creature, but a species. I don't think Foot's walking around Illinois. Who are these people in, in Wisconsin saying, yeah, there's a Bigfoot there? There may very well be a hot dog vendor in Chicago who is a Bigfoot. Excuse me? Yeah, you heard me. Do you imagine Bigfoot as someone who walks around in disguises? Well, some people believe that he's just like this supernatural being, or he or she, or whatever it may be, and it's just one of them. A no, solo act. That's dumb. It's not supernatural, it's natural. Like Sting. It's like Sting? Sting's a solo act. Sting's not supernatural, though. If, if you stab Sting with a knife, <laughs> Sting will bleed. You're probably right. The hunt for Bigfoot became a global phenomenon and inadvertently turned Willow Creek into arguably the number one destination for squatchers and Bigfoot enthusiasts worldwide. There's places like Bigfoot Books, the Bigfoot Steakhouse, murals, and even a Bigfoot burger. How often do people actually put down a Bigfoot burger by themselves? Imagine it's nap time after one. That's, it's nap time for me after, <laughs> yeah. So you got two one-third patties, and on top of that, when you, when you get done with the burger, after we put all the veggies and everything on, it weighs about a pound and a half. We'll try our best. Oh, I'm not gonna try my best. I'm gonna finish that. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm you've, finishing it. You've said it. Oh. I'm gonna eat that burger. I'm gonna stay in that haunted house all night. Yeah, whatever. This is the heaviest sandwich I've ever embraced. That's the biggest bite you got? It was a nibble. I've done it. My organs are starting to shut down. I'll be dead in five minutes. I've done it. You see it? I did it. I wonder if the guy will be proud of us. Uh, I think I may need to go to the hospital. <laughs> Before we go any further, it's worth mentioning that most primatologists do not believe the existence of a Bigfoot or Sasquatch is likely. That being said, let's get into the beginning of the Bigfoot phenomenon in the modern era. In 1958, Gerald Crew discovered and casted large footprints near his bulldozer in Bluff Creek, Del Norte County. The Humble Times wrote about the story, and editor Andrew Gonzoli wrote the creature's name as it would be known from that moment on, Bigfoot. I like that he was just sort of riffing at the time and everyone just went with it. Well, could you imagine being the guy who coined the phrase Bigfoot? Yeah, just staring at that cast and thinking, hmm. That's a Bigfoot. I know. That's <laughs> <laughs> However, in 2003, the two sons of a man named Ray L. Wallace came forward to admit that their father had created the footprints using a pair of carved wooden feet. Their father, Ray Wallace, was reportedly a big prankster. Here's a quote from his son, Michael. Quote, this wasn't a well-planned plot or anything. It's weird because it was just a joke, but then it took on such a life of its own that even now we can't stop it, end quote. Ain't that like, like a couple of funny brothers <laughs> destroying their father's legacy? <laughs> it's been about a, what, a handful of decades since our father uh, duped the world. Let's burn it all down. They couldn't live with the guilt. Though, with the existence of plenty of other Bigfoot evidence, this does not deter Bigfoot believers. So uh, this is actually the local museum in Willow Creek. It's the uh, Willow Creek China Flat Museum. There's a lot of interesting Bigfoot artifacts in there that I think you will find particularly interesting because you're such a big believer. Yes. You can see the big statue, probably one of your great grandfathers it's back not, in the day. I'm not a Bigfoot. That's uh, Albus Madei right there. I'm a human being. Okay. First encounter, or first, shall I say, story that I ever heard was search and rescue came down from Oregon, said they were looking for a little boy that had been lost in the woods four years old, didn't find him the first night, but the second day they found him sitting alongside the road, and when they picked him up, all he could talk about was the big hairy man that had brought, picked him up, brought him down, and sat him down along the road. What? So, yeah, and you know, I don't think a little kid is going to talk about no. You know, a, a hairy man. And I mean, there's thousands of encounters. All these people cannot be telling 
a story. What personal interactions have you seen with Bigfoot? Like, have you seen tracks? Have you seen him himself? I've not seen one, and I don't want to. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Is that because you're scared of Bigfoot? Ah, uh, well, I think you just want to believe it's out there, but you don't really want to see it. I would agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I would love to see it. Lucky for us, we're staying near Six Rivers Forest, arguably the most famous Bigfoot forest in the world. Why this forest is so famous, I'll explain later. But all you need to know is that come tomorrow morning, we'll be there. So maybe we may run into the infamous creature himself. Morning time's here. It's time to go catch us a foot. You ready? Yeah, a big foot. This is the original area that he was noticed in before they actually started even knowing anything about a Bigfoot. You know, he's real elusive. I've heard a lot <laughs> of uh, local lore around here, people that go logging up there and things get thrown at them. They hear things. A couple of people have seen them, you know, off in the distance, and uh, but they never quite get the footage of them. If you can see over there, that's actually the original cage. What I think is hilarious is that's not gonna hold a foot. What makes you say that? These things are all muscle. No, that could hold a foot. You think so? Yeah, I just did a little wiggle. Maybe Bigfoot could pick up on energy. Don't make Bigfoot believe in your little ghostly energies. And I never stuff. said Bigfoot would... is meat and bone, Ryan. I would just say he could pick up on my energy. I'm a chill. Oh, girl. he'll pick you up, all right. And then he'd be he'll like, he'll pick yeah. you up and crack you in two. That's a guy I want to share a cold one with. Is what he'd say to uh, me. I don't think that's how Bigfoot rolls. Okay. Well, should we get this going? Yeah. As we attempt to find this legendary creature, we join the legion of current Bigfoot hunters, which range from average people to major television shows. It's a practice taken very seriously in Skamania County. Quote, the Sasquatch, Yeti, Bigfoot, or giant hairy ape are declared to be endangered species of Skamania County, and there is hereby created a Sasquatch refuge, end quote. I think we're ready to get this going. Let's gear up. Uh, actually. What is that? So, so I don't get shot. That's gonna scare it away. It's not gonna scare it away. It's gonna make me look more festive. And I won't get shot. So there's that. That's an added bonus. Have fun getting shot. I'm not if gonna help you. If we do run into a Squatch, the Squatch is gonna see you and just bolt in the opposite direction. Or you could be like, wow, what a colorful vest. I don't think that. <laughs> Laugh what you want now, but squatches actually are known to smash things over the head to kill them. So you think you honestly think we're going to encounter a squatch? The squatch is going to attack you, and your life is going to be saved because you're wearing a helmet. I mean, it's going to bring a rock down. I'm upon not going to say head. that's a hundred percent. We're going to get it on film. It's not going to say, "Thank God, Ryan had his helmet." I think we're ready to rock and roll, baby. You look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> According to first-person accounts, Bigfoot's skin color ranges from deep black, charcoal, dark brown, reddish brown, or gray, with the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet much lighter. The average height is reportedly 7 foot 10, so not that much taller than you. I'm, well, I'm 6'4", so that's significantly taller. I mean, if relative saw, to other normal people. If I see people taller than me, I get concerned about them because I think they're gonna die young. And the maximum weight is estimated to be over 1,000 pounds. Ah, leave Bigfoot alone. Oh, I wasn't fat shaming Bigfoot. Oh, I was I just mentioning that this is a creature of enormous strength. What about the little ones? I, I, th there's no information on the little ones. Oh, okay. They are also thought to be mostly silent, though they have been credited with howls, grunts, screams, and growls. Doesn't surprise me. That m much like an ape. Well, do you, you seem to know a lot about growls. I've seen some episodes of television where noted survivalist speaks of an encounter with a, with a foot, and he hears it in the woods, and it makes a, a howling noise that sort of like a... <laughs> uh, so... Other interesting tidbits come from the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, which claims Bigfoot are orderly and often stack rocks neatly. They also claim Bigfoot have legendary strength and that they, quote, take pleasure in using their strength. Check out this wood. Oh, fuck. <laughs> it's a salamander. Oh, fuck, it's alive, dude. Yeah. Does it bite? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little, uh, it's a little, sa a newt? Or a salamander? He's just hanging out. His name is Cedric. 
He struck me as eccentric when I first saw him after we destroyed his apartment. Look at his beady little eyes. I know. It looks like you. <laughs> it does. The strength of Bigfoot was on full display many years ago on the icy road, an area a short drive away from where we are now. When the icy road was being constructed from north of the Hoopa Valley Indian Reservation, crew members would arrive in the morning to find that 500 pound tires had been tossed around, bulldozers were turned over, and giant footprints were all around the site. Yeah, what if we try calling it? You call it. Here, let me see that shit. All right, do it, do your little call. <laughs> well, if it's any constellation, you look like an idiot. Let's go over some of the recent evidence. In 2006, Jeffrey Meldrum, an associate professor of anatomy and anthropology at Idaho State University, published a book called Sasquatch, Legend Meets Science. Meldrum is also an expert on foot morphology and the movement of monkeys, apes, and hominids. In that book, he wrote, quote, the evidence that exists fully justifies the investigation and the pursuit of this question, end quote. In the 1990s, Meldrum was shown casts of Bigfoot footprints that were 14 inches long, with some suggesting running motion and others actually showing skin whorls. Meldrum felt the running footsteps in particular would be hard to fake, quote, unless you had some device, some cable-loaded flexible toes, end quote. I think it's time for a little brew break. Seems like a fitting spot. Now we're breaking out the, the bait. This is gonna attract I told you, we have a different kind of vibe. That's for foot. That's for Mr. and Mrs. Foot. I'm sharing a cold, cold one. Right there. That's for you. If you're out here, I'm not gonna do a stupid mating call, but I think you understand. <laughs> that one, I'm not doing that. But I think you know what this is, huh? Waft it. If one actually walked out right now, this would be the greatest thing ever captured on camera. If we lured out a Bigfoot with a beer. Here, I'll tell you what. I'll take my helmet off so you can see my face. Small foot, take off helmet. You crush. I'm exposing my cranium to you. It's very small, but if you aim right, you could crush his tiny little head. You're a coward. He said that, but I agree with him. He meant it more though, so hit him. Dr. Wolf Henner Fahrenbach, a retired zoologist who formerly worked at the Oregon Regional Primate Research Center, believes in Bigfoot and has done analysis on over 700 footprints. It's thought that Bigfoot's big toe is aligned with the other toes, similar to human foot alignment. He believes Bigfoot's foot is approximately 15.6 inches long and that the creature weighs up to 2,000 pounds. Dr. Fahrenbach even told the New York Times in 2003, quote, I've gotten close enough to smell him. What? He's gotten close enough? What do you mean? He, well, I'll let you know in a second here, but yeah, it's an interesting thing to say. Tell me more. By the way, Bigfoot is believed to smell horrible, with some comparing it to the odor of smegma, a sebaceous secretion in the folds of the skin, especially under a man's foreskin. Lovely. You don't have to describe that. Well, that's what he smells like, <laughs> if you are wondering. One of the more promising developments came in the form of a carcass claimed to be of Bigfoot. In 2008, two researchers from Atlanta purchased a frozen Bigfoot carcass from Georgia Bigfoot Tour Company owner Rick Dyer and his friend Matthew Whidden. But the carcass turned out to be a rubber gorilla suit. How much did they pay for this? <laughs> They're is conflicting reports online, but at the very least hundreds of thousands. <laughs> <laughs> it's enough to be embarrassed about. What the hell? Uh-oh. It's just a table. Bigfoot Maybe little for, table. Yeah, where he does a little light reading. Maybe that's where he writes sonnets. Oh, Jesus Christ. Everything's fine. Oh my God, look at that cave up there. I know. Ah, oh, shit. Oh, should we do this? Okay. I'm gonna go on record, this is a bad idea. Please. 
please don't die. If we do find a bear up here, we're just gonna I'm fall and fucked. die. Oh my god, dude! I don't, I'm pretty scared. I don't want to fucking look in here. Ah, oh, Jesus. Hey, girl. <laughs> you. <laughs> That's what you do. You call out for the. Well, if there isn't a fucking squatch in here, there's definitely a snake of some sort that's gonna bite me on the wiener, so I think I wanna get out of here. There have also been attempts at DNA analysis for Bigfoot. Retired zoologist Dr. Wolf Fahrenbach has been unable to identify Bigfoot DNA, but as of 2006, there were at least 15 samples that he had been unable to identify as any other animal. In 2012, a veterinarian researcher claimed to have sequenced Sasquatch DNA, claiming that Sasquatch was descended from human females who had mated with unknown hominin males. Nah. <laughs> what do you have this against This guy's that? inhaling too many cat <laughs> shit fumes. <laughs> oh my god. In 2014, a team of researchers led by an Oxford professor of human genetics conducted genetic analysis of reported Sasquatch hair samples. Unfortunately, the samples belong to a range of known animals, such as dogs, bears, and humans. <laughs> what are we gonna actually do if we find one? I it's like, all right, some... we found you. I mean, I wouldn't approach it. I would try and get some footage of it. But what if it approached us? Then what do we do? Uh, we die, right? Yeah, That's the part where we die. Great. You know, this is all jolly right now, but could you imagine what this is gonna be like at night? Well, this is, are they nocturnal? We'll find out. There really is no studies on whether or not Bigfoot is nocturnal or not. There's not a lot of sightings of him at night, but there are some. But they're definitely in the minority. Holy shit, it is dark as fuck out here. Oh! I'm not catching anything on thermal. There you are. Holy shit, dude, this is fucking scary! <laughs> now we're heading into the belly of the beast. Fuck me, dude. We're goners if we find this guy. That's not scaring you right now? Ooh, 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 Shut ooh, 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 ooh. Stupid mouth. It is only appropriate that we save the best piece of evidence for last. And although it happened in 1967, it is my belief that this is the most convincing piece of Bigfoot evidence in existence. In 1967, Roger Patterson, an amateur Bigfoot hunter, along with Bob Gimlin, filmed a home movie in Six Rivers National Forest, the forest we're currently in. What they captured on camera is the only footage of Bigfoot that has not been completely debunked. It's enough to convince me. There, I mean... It doesn't look like a person in a costume. It the is way a, it moves... It's a very old piece of footage. It is a very old piece of footage. But that being but said... But so is... Die Hard. Still good. What? What? <laughs> I'm saying just because something's old doesn't mean it's bad. Or <laughs> That's a completely different train of thought. What the fuck it's is going on day. here? Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, the expert on foot morphology and the movement of monkeys, apes, and hominids, believes you can see Bigfoot's muscle movements in the film. He believes the ankles in particular are key indicators that this is not a man in a costume. Bob Gimlin regrets shooting the film, believing that Patterson benefited from it more than he did. In fact, it actually tore their friendship apart. They didn't make up until Roger Patterson was on his deathbed. Either way, both of them believe what they saw, and so do many around the world. This footage would become the most famous piece of cryptozoological evidence of all time, a feat that we are aspiring to right now. Bigfoot! Okay, I don't believe in him. Come crush Ryan's head! It's not gonna happen, he's not real. He's not real. <laughs> please, God, nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Please, please. Yeah, shh, shh, shh. We have to listen, too. Watches are biting tonight. That's good, that's good. That means we live to see tomorrow. All right, I'm leaving. I'm getting the fuck out of here. <laughs> I'm going. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Bigfoot. The existence of Bigfoot still firmly rests in two camps, 
believers and skeptics. The mindset of skeptics could be summed up by the thoughts of University of Florida anthropologist David J. Daigling. Quote, even if you have a million pieces of evidence, if all the evidence is inconclusive, you can't count it all up to make something conclusive. End quote. Whereas the mindset of believers is generally that it's unscientific to discount the plethora of evidence. Over the years, there have been casts of footprints, possible recorded calls, unidentifiable hairs, and first-person accounts. But in the end, until there is indisputable evidence, it really comes down to what you believe in. Is Bigfoot real? The answer will remain unsolved. to shave this stupid Bigfoot beard off. That's pretty good. You look like a man I would never talk to under any circumstances. What are you talking about? <laughs> Come on. Oh, God. You like it? No. Let's go find some ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> this week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we discuss three of the most compelling mysteries that suggest the presence of ancient aliens. So, let's drop some sweet knowledge. I'm already fed up with the folders, by the way. Looks too official, right. considering the nonsense that is within. <laughs> The existence of aliens or extraterrestrials has long been one of the great mysteries of the world. According to a 2015 survey conducted by YouGov.com, about 54% of America, 56% of Germany, and 52% of the UK believe in extraterrestrial intelligent life. That being said, history seems to indicate that aliens may have visited our world in ancient times, aiding us at the brink of civilization. There are cave paintings like this one from Australia that may be up to 5,000 years old that some interpret as creatures wearing spacesuits. Or this painting from 8,000 BC in the Sahara Desert that illustrates what appears to be spacemen leading natives in a line. They're just people. What are you talking about? I'm just saying what people interpret them as. It's a there's a has, there's basket a... of fruit. How do you think that's a basket of fruit? It's just a basket of fruit on their head. There's two, two of them with baskets of fruit and why everyone is that, else? Why does that one in the back also have a little basket? Of... Maybe it's a child. No. Look how small the rest are. Why are these so large? Okay. Here's a drawing of a Mayan carving that shows a man attached to what some construe as an oxygen source as he operates controls in what appears to be a spaceship. Other fascinating objects include this hieroglyph from the Temple of Seti I that dates back to the 14th century BC. The glyph appears to contain hovering spacecrafts and modern day flying machinery such as helicopters. Why would there be a helicopter? I don't know. Are Why they, would they know they, there's a helicopter? Are they time traveling? Possibly, I don't know. Why would they know that if less they were, uh, there was some kind of intelligent civilization that visited them that wouldn't be able to show these things. So the aliens show up, show them pictures of helicopters and fly away. Well, I mean, this isn't the entire, I mean, this is what we've discovered so far. There could well, I be... can't wait to see the rest of it. <laughs> I can't wait to okay. see a poster of the motion picture Wedding Crashers and uh, <laughs> okay. well, some lava lamps. Additionally, a funerary marker from roughly 100 BC shows a woman presenting what some consider a laptop with USB ports. How do they charge it? I don't know. Why are there USB ports on it if they don't have thumbnail <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying what... <laughs> what are they looking at on it? There's no internet. Do they have Photoshop? And finally, here is a hieroglyph from Hathor Temple in Egypt that shows workers operating what appeared to be enormous light bulbs, perhaps explaining how artists were able to see when drawing elaborate hieroglyphs inside their tombs. What are you drawing? Ryan, here's you with three butt cheeks. <laughs> okay. I've drawn it. Now it exists. Why do I have little penguin arms? I don't know. Why do you have little penguin arms? That's a good question. Here's you with little penguin arms and three butt cheeks. I've drawn it, so it must be real. But beyond these small scattered references to alien and modern technology, there are entire cities, civilizations, and architectural undertakings that make us question if we have always been alone. What follows are the best mysteries that history has to offer in regards to ancient aliens. The first mystery we'll discuss is the Dogen and Sirius B. The Dogen are a tribal group in West Africa, south of Timbuktu in the Republic of Mali that settled sometime between the 10th and 13th centuries. In the 1930s and 1940s, the studies of French anthropologists Marcel Griot and Germain Dieterlin revealed that the Dogen knew a surprising amount of modern astronomy. According to their studies, the Dogen believed these things, all of which are scientific facts. The planets orbit the sun. The Earth and other planets rotate on their axis. Saturn has a ring. 
Jupiter has four moons. And finally, that the star Sirius is actually part of a double star system containing a star called Sirius B that has a 50-year orbit and is invisible to the naked human eye. Knowledge of how planets orbit would not require advanced technology. However, to know about Saturn's ring and Jupiter's moon would require remarkable eyesight and an extremely clear sky. But what is truly astonishing is the Dogen's knowledge of the star Sirius B, especially when you consider the fact that scientists were only able to discern information about Sirius B with the use of quantum mechanics, relativity, and advanced telescopes. This leads some to believe that the Dogen were taught about Sirius B by a far more advanced civilization. Dogen mythology reportedly speaks of them being visited by a set of beings referred to as the Nomo, who according to author Robert Temple, are amphibious beings from the Sirius star system. That's cool. You have nothing to say about any of that. I, I, I will fight you tooth and nail when it comes to ghouly ghosts, but aliens are a little more uh, probable. I win. No, you don't win. Uh, I think I won. Because I'm sure you've got plenty of other stuff on here that's very dumb. Though, some people have other theories such as Robert Burnham, who believes that the Dogen could have known about Sirius B due to extraordinary eyesight. He theorizes that with a 10-inch reflecting telescope in clear skies, Sirius B could have been seen. However, if this were true, the Dogen would have also been able to see Uranus, Neptune, and other cosmic observations, which they did not. Another doubter is author Carl Sagan, who believes that the Dogen's cosmic knowledge is suspiciously consistent with an informed person from the 1930s and 40s. Sagan posits that the French anthropologist that visited during that time and broke the story of the Dogen merely entwined Sirius B into the Dogen's existing mythology to make an interesting story. Well, look, if Carl Sagan believes it, I believe it. But he, he's just saying they lied. That's what he's just saying. Well, I then he's probably got an informed opinion. He's Carl fucking Sagan. But that, all that said is he thinks they lied. That's well, like then I'm on board with Carl Sagan. But there's no evidence to back that they lied. I don't give a shit. He's Carl Sagan. The second mystery we'll discuss is the ancient city of Tiwanaku in Bolivia, a city that was high above sea level, roughly 13,000 feet. The people of Tiwanaku utilize massive monolithic stones that weigh up to 450 tons. How the people of Tiwanaku move these enormous stones remains a mystery. Some suggest the stones were pulled along logs, but others believe aliens may have aided with anti-gravity methods. Also discovered on the site were 200 elongated skulls, possibly the heads of shamans, whose heads were bound to that shape in an effort to amplify their ability to communicate with deities. I can't imagine it'd be a pleasurable experience. Also, you'd have to do that over like, your yeah. lifetime, right? Probably. I can't imagine that's like a quick process. If I were like five years old and my mom was like, we're going to start doing something now. It's going to last a long time. But when it's all over, your head will be very long. <laughs> I'd probably say, I'm good. I'll just sign up for karate or something. Conceivably, these shamans elongated their skulls to emulate the deities that visited them. Perhaps the main mystery of Tiwanaku is what instruments the people used to carve their stones to achieve such exactness without the use of power tools. For example, there are H-blocks that interlock in a detailed and sophisticated manner that require no mortar. On site, there is also a calendar that some believe dates millions of years back and made by visitors from outer space. For good measure, near Tiwanaku's Gate of the Sun is a wall decorated with heads that some believe could be aliens. If a thousand years from now, someone was like, wow, have you ever seen signs? Signs, the motion picture that they made back in the day, they found aliens, it was crazy. Okay, they see, ruined a kid's birthday party. You're talking about a civilization that is us now that is able to perceive advanced art and like expression in that way. They, we could separate reality from not reality. Yeah. What I'm positing is, I don't know if they had that capability back then, especially in the cave paintings You don't ones. think back then? In they, the cave painting ones, you think You don't think they were creative? <laughs> my, my big takeaway here is that art is not proof. <laughs> okay, sure. The third mystery is arguably the strongest indicator of ancient aliens, the Pyramids of Giza. The three Giza pyramids were constructed between 2550 and 2490 BC in Egypt. They were built as tombs for the pharaohs meant to emulate and honor the gods. The first and largest pyramid, also referred to as the Great Pyramid, was built around 2550 BC for the pharaoh Khufu and is around 481 feet tall. Each side of the pyramid was 756 feet, and the area of each side is 5.5 acres. 
the angles at the base of the pyramid are nearly perfect 90 degree angles. All of this suggests the architects had a high understanding of mathematics. That being said, here are some things that make me question who or what those architects may have been. You're telling me those architects used math? Knock me down with a feather. <laughs> I'm just suggesting, and some people are suggesting that perhaps it was a little too advanced. Based That's on so disrespectful. <laughs> The Great Pyramid was constructed of roughly 2.3 million stones, each weighing between 2.5 to 15 tons. In order to finish the Great Pyramid in 23 years, the workers would have to set a block every 2.5 minutes, every day of the week. The Egyptians did not have wheels, pulleys, or work animals. So how could they have lifted and transported these enormous stones with that kind of efficiency? Can you imagine if you spent your entire life hauling around heavy stones and someone was like, I, well, they couldn't have done it. You know what no. it must have been? Space aliens. I seen them. Every 2.5 minutes, one block, every fucking day of the week uh, for 23 had, years straight. Could have had hustle days. I'm just saying, it doesn't matter how many slaves they were if they didn't have oh, the tools to well, do facts it. facts don't matter then. No, I'm saying they didn't have the tools. That is facts. Some have suggested a ramp structure, but it would have had to be massive and no evidence of this construction has been found. If I'm building a giant, mighty, wondrous thing, I'm not gonna be like, hey, can you do some chiselings of, uh, of the ramp? <laughs> we really gotta show off this ramp. <laughs> the hell of a ramp. Are there blueprints for the pyramids? I'm sure there is. They had all the mathematics and things broken down. Are they written in alien language? Oh my God. Additionally, the Great Pyramid is perfectly aligned with Magnetic North. It is unknown how the Egyptians could possibly have known this, though some theorize it had to do with observing the cosmos. The perimeter of the Great Pyramid when divided by twice the height allegedly results in the number pi, up to its 15th digit. This may also demonstrate a suspicious knowledge of mathematics. The pyramids of Giza are also considerably well preserved in comparison to other pyramids around the world, despite the pyramids of Giza being centuries older. Some have claimed this is due to the fact that they were upkept over the past hundreds of years, though others believe it is a sign of unearthly preservation. Finally, the three pyramids align with the pattern of Orion's belt, a fact that some consider an impossible feat for the Egyptians to accomplish. Unless, of course, they were building based on instructions. I don't that's, doubt that they were mathematically adept. Well, the other two aren't math. The magnetic north and... Again, magnetic north, they could just observe the sun. I don't know. So it was aliens. <laughs> yes, yeah, so they it was... showed up. So it was aliens. Gave them iPads. <laughs> gave them a zoon. <laughs> built the pyramids. A zoon. Left. And that's it. Sure, yeah. All those things in that order. And they haven't Except been back the since. Zoon. They haven't been back since. Yeah, they were like, fuck humanity. What we covered are only some of the ancient mysteries that inspire wonder and curiosity of our place in the universe. And as with most stories that deal with the existence of extraterrestrials, the answer is never definite and always left to personal interpretation. Were we visited and aided by aliens in ancient times? Do aliens even exist? The answer for now remains unsolved. I think they lied. I have yet to see any compelling uh, evidence. I thought that was compelling unless, you, of course, they lied. You think a lot of things are compelling. I felt that very compelling. Go fuck yourself, have a nice day. All right. Yeah, a little spoiler for you. Everything in the building is gonna look like this. Oh my God. And I guess this is where we're fucking sleeping because we're idiots. Ah! How are you feeling? Are you nervous? Yeah, I'm a little nervous. I got that familiar knot that's usually in my stomach when I go to these places. I've seen this one on several shows before and always thought there's no way in hell I'm gonna go there. <laughs> so we are approaching Waverly. The look of this building is so imposing. I'm surprised you're conscious right now. I'm keeping it together for now. There's a good chance tonight is the night you see me die on camera. It kind of looks like a castle. It kind of looks like hell. It looks like Hogwarts. There's not one part of you that's like, oh man, this is, I'm really in for it now. I mean, I don't- What in the fuck is that? It's just a big metal thing. That's not a ghost, that's metal. Jesus Christ, dude. But I think we should let them know that we're entering, you know, just give them a quick, uh, Hey ghouls! The boys are here! This week on BuzzFeed and Solve, we explore Waverly Hill Sanatorium as part of our ongoing investigation into the question, are ghosts real? As with most places we investigate, it doesn't have the most pleasant history, making it one of the most haunted places in the world. And as you can see, this is the place where nightmares are made. I mean, look at that. 
It's very dark. It's a dark hallway. I, I just don't, I don't get any of this. <laughs> I don't understand. I know. Okay. Well, let's just, uh, let's break down the history for Mr. Robot over here. Please. On July 26, 1910, Waverly Hill Sanatorium opened to treat patients of tuberculosis. On October 17, 1926, a bigger version of Waverly Hills that we are now sitting in tonight opened to accommodate the overflow of patients from the tuberculosis epidemic. The hospital is five stories tall and was built on a quiet space atop a hill where it was thought that patients would be at peace and receive lots of fresh air. Most importantly, it would keep the patients quarantined far away from crowded areas. Oh, fuck me. I feel awful right now. Looks like one of the Conjuring films. I got, I got a little spoiler for you. Everything in the building is gonna look like this. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> We've really done it now, haven't we? Yeah, we've done it now. <laughs> Let's provide a little background on tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, also known as TB, or the white plague, is a bacterial infection contracted by breathing in air containing mycobacterium tuberculosis. The bacteria could eat away at the lungs and overall claimed roughly two billion lives in total, billed as, quote, the plague of all plagues, end quote. I'm glad we're done with that. Yeah, yeah, that, that, was, that, was, that was a rough time in history. Just everybody died from it. I feel like in every movie about a period before 1940 or something, there's a part in the movie where someone coughs and everybody looks at him. And there's blood on the handkerchief. And there's blood on like, the handkerchief. He tucks it in his jacket real quick. Yeah, it wasn't great. Around the turn of the 20th century, tuberculosis ran rampant in the warm, wet weather of Kentucky, and the demand for treatment necessitated a facility like Waverly Hill Sanatorium. It could accommodate up to 500 patients. Unfortunately, not all the treatment was effective. According to owner Tina Mattingly, Waverly also used electroshock therapy to treat patients whose tuberculosis spread to the brain. The electroshock therapy is on the first floor, what we call the morgue wing. And electroshock is where they performed um, on the patients that, that got tuberculosis of the brain. Probably didn't help them, I'm sure, but they didn't know what else to do. There's a little theater in here. Yeah, it's set up because sometimes they put stuff on for Halloween, but this is the room. Do you feel strange? No. Sit down on this couch. Oof. It's, it's filthy. Yeah, well, we're gonna be sleeping on the ground later, so it doesn't really matter, does it? I think the ground is cleaner than this couch. It's pretty dusty. Absolutely. Are my butt cheeks now? I'm gonna... Yeah, that's, that's my... a perfect butt print. Oh, you got your two pockets there? Oh, look at that, the two pockets and everything. Ryan Bergara's butt. At, someone will come here in a week and they'll be like, it's a good, good, good ghost butt. <laughs> a lot of you were probably very unhappy here. It seems like a room where they were doing a lot of medical things that maybe you didn't enjoy. If you're here, we're gonna be real quiet right now. Uh, maybe make some noise. Okay, here we go. Shockingly, I'm not really hearing anything. This is the biggest upset. I did not see this coming. <laughs> Interestingly enough, due to the fact that tuberculosis is highly contagious, Waverly Hills was largely self-sufficient. They grew their own food, raised animals, had a post office, etc. Basically, once you went to Waverly Hills, whether you were a patient, nurse, or doctor, you were no longer part of the outside world. Eventually, a vaccine was made readily available for tuberculosis, and Waverly Hills closed its doors in 1961 it's been debated how many died within its walls before doing so. Current co-owner Tita Mattingly has claimed the number is approximately in the tens of thousands, but nobody can know for sure. Regardless, death was so common that the hospital actually contains a horrifying area nicknamed the body chute, a tunnel used to dispose of dead bodies out of eyesight from the other patients. The tunnel is roughly 500 feet long and leads down the hill. If I were staying here, I wouldn't want to be watching them <laughs> shuttle bodies through the hall all day. No. Like, oh, where's Pete? Uh, down the chute. They shooted him. <laughs> they shooted him. That's <laughs> fucked up. Pete Dunn got shooted. <laughs> is that the body chute? I think this is the body chute. Well, let's take a look. Oh my God, this is awful. Now this is the nightmare. Oh no, 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 <laughs> no. You have gotta be fucking sh- Are you fucking kidding me, dude? 
This is like Satan's cement butthole. Oh my God, Holy dude. Shit. Oh my God. How far does this go? Are we going to hell? Let's find out. If there's anybody down here that maybe hated this tunnel. This is a witch hole. Let us know, make your presence known. Preferably now and not when we get to the bottom of this tunnel. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. It looks like there's a soccer ball at the bottom. Well, that's good. Oh my God, are you serious? What is that, the wind? I don't know. It just went woo. I don't know what the fuck that was. It was some weird whoop noise. What if I go up there and you stay down here and we turn our lights off? and see if we hear anything. What if you go fuck yourself? How about that? How long am I staying down here? A minute. A minute? Yeah. Fuck. All right. Three. Lights off in three. Two. One. one. Oh God. Oh, no, no, no. I hate this. This is sort of I didn't even get to do all the things on my bucket list. Shut up. You shut up. Did you hear that? Is it a minute yet? Please tell me it's been a minute. Hello? Okay, it's been a minute. I hate oh. that. Get me the fuck out of here. I'm leaving. Goodbye, ghost at the bottom. I'm gonna imagine that place is the closest thing to hell. <laughs> Not really, because there's no malice there. It's just dead people. It's people who died of a disease and they... You gotta imagine when their like, soul is out and they're watching it get dragged like a World War II victim down this creepy, dingy tunnel is not the thing that you would like to see. What do you want him to do, like carry him out on a, a golden velvet couch? I'm just saying it's, a, it's an uncomfortable how, place. How dare they dispose of my body? <laughs> I'm just saying, they should leave it in the hallway saying, to rot. The spirits of the countless who died here are said to now haunt this facility, making Waverly Hill Sanatorium potentially one of the most haunted places in the world. That being said, let's get into some of the reports of paranormal activity. Visitors often claim they hear the sound of children's laughter. Slamming doors are said to be a common occurrence. Some insist faces have appeared in windows to rooms that are unoccupied and in photos where nobody was standing. Waverly Hills is also famous for its reports of shadow people, which are shadowy figures that people claim to see all over the hospital. If you look down this hallway long enough, your eyes are gonna look at that darkness and eventually you start to see movement in darkness. When there's nothing there, your eyes sort of fill the void. Yeah, I got the chills even just thinking about it. So have you ever heard that old thing about when you look at your face in the mirror in low light and eventually sort of looks demonic and... Look it up, it's a thing on the internet. Who are you pointing to? Uh, all the shaniacs out there. <laughs> shaniacs? <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> Aside from general reports, there are specific areas of this former hospital that we should discuss and investigate in detail. For obvious reasons, the morgue on the first floor is reportedly an area of heightened activity. Supposedly this is one of the more active rooms in this whole joint. You feel any strange feelings right now? I'm cold. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a morgue. I, I'd feel stranger if there were actual dead bodies in here well, I mean, right these now. are accurate autopsy tables from the time these are real. Yeah, I see that. Jesus Christ. Moving to the third floor, a homeless man and his dog supposedly fell down the elevator shaft when the building was vacant. And co-owner Tina Mattingly, as well as many others, claimed to have seen the ghost of both the man and the dog. One night after, I had a tour going on, and I was walking down the hallway, and I saw a very tall man, tall, thin, long hair, you know, turned my snake light on up like this and clicked it on, he just wasn't there. Well, at that point, I'm a little nervous, and I start to walk down the hall, and I'm kind of looking around to see if I'd be backed into a room or something. And then I see 
a dog laying in the floor. It was a, a white dog. It looked like a small white German Shepherd. And I started, you know, calling to the dog, try to get it up and get it to move in, and, and it didn't. And then all of a sudden, it just, I didn't see it disappear. I didn't see it get up and walk away. It just wasn't there anymore. It's also speculated that the man did not accidentally fall down the shaft, but that he was pushed. But I mean, at least he went out with his, you know, best friend, I suppose. They pushed the dog too? Oh, Jesus Christ, I didn't even think about that. Maybe he was like holding the dog on the, uh, you know, we're not gonna think of the logistics of even this. Even if I'm holding a dog and someone pushes me, I'm gonna let go of the leash or, I'm not gonna be like, yeah, you're coming with me. Coward taking your dog to die with you. What are you doing? This is the worst thing you could possibly do. Put your hand in there first. It's pretty fur. I don't want him to grab my hand. What if he grabs He's my got hand and takes a zoom? Well, then we have proof of a ghost. No, it's just gonna be you saying you dropped it. Oh, you dropped it. Put That's your hand all hand. the way in there. There you go. I don't like that. Do it. Ryan. <laughs> what are you, what? <laughs> you, dropped the zoom. you didn't drop it. I know. Okay, to the man in the elevator, if you were pushed down this elevator, make a noise. If you fell down this elevator, make a noise. I'm just gonna ask you, maybe you'll say it, maybe I'll hear it later. What, ah! what the fuck is wrong with you? What? <laughs> it was this, okay, it felt like someone doing this. You've got a thing, man. I swear, also it's- This is why I didn't want to do it, because I knew you weren't gonna believe me, this is bullshit. It's also very breezy here, so yeah, if you felt well, a breeze, I... it's highly likely that it was- If that was you- A breeze. Please don't do that again. We'd like some confirmation that it was you, please do it again. No, don't listen to him. Oh god, I hated that. Let's get the fuck away from this elevator shaft. <laughs> There are reports of an apparition draped in a white doctor's coat being seen. One ghost hunter claims he saw the man disappear into a treatment room on the fourth floor. Also on this floor is a room that used to be the nurse's waiting room, a place where owner Tina Mattingly came across evidence of a full-bodied apparition. We were on the fourth floor, me and another girl that comes here every year. Uh, she's the one that's always taking all the pictures and stuff. She has a really nice camera. And she was snapping pictures and all of a sudden I hear her just going crazy like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, and I'm like, Turn around like, what? She goes, you wouldn't believe what I got. She said she saw her standing right here. God, that'd be scary. It's yeah. kind of grainy because I took a picture of her camera and she never could send me the uh, original. That does look like a full-bodied apparition. You, that doesn't give you the chills. Well, I mean. On the third floor, there are reports of a little boy named Timmy who likes to play with a blue rubber ball. All right, Timmy. My name's Ryan. This is my pal Shane. Hi, Tim. I hear you like balls. No, no wait, wait. Are we do a wait. retake on that one? That had to be intentional. I swear, I swear to God, I'm not doing this on purpose. I mean, this is a bit. Right? No, it's not a fucking bit, I'm sorry. Think... I'm gonna bounce my ball. See, it's a bouncy ball. You like that? I like it. Wanna play? Oh, fuck. <laughs> you wanna play? Why oh, you sound threatening like you? You wanna play? Let's fucking play. Timmy. I'm very scared, but if you could throw this ball back, I won't be as scared. Oh my god, that's the biggest lie I've ever heard. All right, Timmy, I'm throwing the ball down. You ready? All right. It bounced a few extra times, though. Did you hear that? Do you think it bounced? A, I thought it bounced a couple extra times, but I thought it was just my mind playing tricks on me. It sounded like it stopped and then it bounced a little more. Oh my god. No. Jesus. I don't know if that means ghost, but... Let's walk down and find the ball. <laughs> That's the most serious I've ever seen. Let's walk down there and find the ball. All right, Timmy, we're coming to get the ball. I don't know where it went. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Do you want the flashlight right now? Oh, there it is. No way. Oh! <laughs> oh! No! Oh no, 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 no! Ryan, the ball no. bounced. No, the ball stopped here. How the fuck Ryan, is that the possible? Ball, the ball stopped right now. How is that possible? Oh no! <laughs> they know! Oh. Ryan, they know! 
Shut up, dude. You know this is fucking weird. Shut up. Ball came right into this hallway. I don't know what the odds are, Timmy, that my ball would land right next to my name down there that I didn't know existed. I'm gonna roll the ball one more time, Timmy. We're coming over, Timmy. Uh, Where did this thing go? I think it's one of the- Oh, probably. it's right there in the middle. Oh, perfect. That, now that's a good throw, Ryan. I mean, that's exactly how I threw it last time. No, it wasn't exactly. Yes, it was. No. It's like directly in the middle of the floor. So you think because it's in the middle now, it was moved before? Yeah, that's exactly what I think. No, I don't you know. You don't think it's odd that it stopped in the middle and then before it went into the room by my name? <laughs> but it also stopped at the I Love Pot graffiti, <laughs> so maybe this ghost just lived to blaze it. <laughs> It's rumored that patients whose infection spread to the brain, rendering them insane, were sent to the fifth floor. So let's make the journey upward. All right, this is the floor I'm really not stoked to go on. One room in particular on this floor that is arguably the most active and definitely the most controversial is room 502. It's the famous 502. And I guess this is where we're fucking sleeping because we're idiots. And this is what we like to do. Room 502 has a reputation due to the two suicides that supposedly occurred there. One story has it that in 1932, a nurse jumped to her death from the fifth floor patio near room 502, though others believe she was actually pushed. Right around here is probably where she jumped off. The second nurse to die here. That's a hell of a fall. <laughs> That'll do it. I mean, if she was five feet or taller, a good gust could just knock her over. Because you know I was looking over there. The other suicide reportedly occurred four years earlier in 1928 when nurse Mary Hillenberg hung herself just outside room 502. Another theory is that Mary got pregnant by one of the doctors, and when he tried to perform an abortion, she died and the suicide was staged. So according to Tina, here's 502, they found the nurse hanging right around here. So if we were to sleep in this area. Oh, that's right. That's right where it happened. We would be sleeping right where it happened. Yeah. I could tell you some stories about the fifth floor. Oh, sure, let's hear I've them. had guys, people for security reasons, stay up on the fifth floor in tents. And they had things hit their tents all night long. You hear kids giggling and stuff. Oh, yeah. that's fun, cool. That's yeah. where we're gonna be sleeping. So you have awesome. fun with that. I've been here almost 16 years and I've never done it. Well, that's good that we're gonna, you know, really tee yeah, that Yeah, you're off. gonna do something that I've never done. Awesome. Go big or go home. <laughs> well, this place, I realized, is different for a number of reasons. One, you know, if we were at the Sally house, it's like, oh, run out the front door. Whereas here, you're like, trapped. Yeah, we're on the roof, more or less. Oh my God, did you hear that? No. What are you talking about? Are you serious, you didn't hear that? I didn't hear anything. I heard a whisper. No, you didn't hear a whisper. I swear to God, I heard a whisper. The, you know, there's a lot of wind moving around nope, right nope. now. Nope, nope. What did the whisper say? I don't know. Sure it wasn't just a car in the distance? No, it sounded like someone saying something. Oh man, am I, starting, am I just freaking myself out again? I thought I, you swear you didn't hear it? It made my hair stand up. Just go to sleep. No. I don't want to. Hello. Hello. Hi, oh, you can't even see me. It's so dark in here because I'm going to sleep. Hmm? Shane's next to me. He's asleep. Or I may have just woken him up, but I don't really care. Literally, like, six feet away from me, a lady hung herself. Ryan, why are you doing this to yourself? I asked myself that a lot too. I don't understand why I do these things. Shayna, how are you? I thought you were asleep. I don't remember. I think I was asleep when you called Helen in the first place because I woke up and I heard a voice and I was like, what the fuck is going on? You've been asleep for 45 minutes. Oh, nice. Oh, did Shane think I was a ghost? Yeah. Shane also thinks it was a coincidence that the ball landed under Ryan. What do you think? I think Timmy wants to be your friend. Well, that was a sleepless night. Let's go check in on Mr. Shane. <laughs> this location is cleared. Well. Time to go. It's been real. You still have an opportunity here. Golden moment to seize glory. You hear that, ghost? That's Ryan Bergara 1, Waverly Hills Sanatorium 0. How does that feel? 
You fucking wimps. <laughs> is Waverly Hill Sanatorium haunted? It remains. Actually, do you think this place is haunted? No. I think it is. Okay. Due to the countless deaths that occurred within its walls, it's no surprise to me that many report this once busy hospital is haunted. There's the demon hole. Goodbye, body shoot. And although nothing we experience tonight changes that reputation in my mind, whether or not Waverly Hill Sanatorium is definitively haunted will remain unsolved. I'm gonna take everything said by a ghost hunter with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. Well, technically now you're a ghost hunter, so think about that. Oh shit. So I don't even know if I could trust you. Uh, I'm a ghost hunter, but I, well. Oh my God, oh, did your brain just explode? Am I a ghost hunter? <laughs> Holy shit. I don't wanna be a ghost hunter. <laughs> this is all bullshit. <laughs> oh no. Do I have to put that on my business card now? Yeah, shame a day, ghost hunter. Son of a bitch. And Robo Squatch. <laughs> and Robo Squatch. <laughs> This week on BuzzFeed Assault, we discuss the enduring mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. What is it? Is it real? Only one way to find out. Any any thoughts going in before? I think I love airplanes. This, I bet there's a lot of airplanes in this one. Oh, there's a whole lot of airplanes. Well, if you're yeah. a fan of airplanes, I got news for you. This is gonna be a great day. Sign me up. The Bermuda Triangle is an area of the Atlantic Ocean roughly bounded by Miami, Puerto Rico, and Bermuda. Though its actual range is debated, some estimate it covers between 500,000 to a million square miles. I guess they thought it was further north. Are you about to beautiful mind this, or? Well, I don't know what you're- some graphics over there. There's a glaze that's come over your eyes. I don't know what's- <laughs> The term Bermuda Triangle actually didn't come into use until 1964, when it was coined by Vincent Gaddis for a cover story for Argosy Magazine. It was used to describe an area where there seemed to be an uncommon amount of disappearances of ships and planes. According to Time Magazine, between 1946 and 1991 alone, there were over 100 disappearances of ships and planes in the Bermuda Triangle. Quick thought. Is it, is it annoying that I hold this pen? Oh yeah, like it's this? really annoying. Well, it's here now, forever. Uh, you're always, you got your paper. I'm sitting over here just twiddling my thumbs. It's nice to have a little oh, pen. I think your douche meter is usually at half mass. Right now it's about Oof. three quarters full. Through the roof. <laughs> Through the roof. The douche roof. The, the <laughs> Shane douche roof my day. <laughs> that being said, let's discuss some of the more mysterious incidents in the Bermuda Triangle. Allegedly, the first recorded account was made by none other than Christopher Columbus during his famous journey to discover America. Oh, he discovered it all right. Just to be fair, fuck Christopher Columbus. <laughs> yeah. While in the Bermuda Triangle, Columbus, along with crew, noted a variety of odd occurrences. The ship's compass began malfunctioning. There were mysterious lights over the water. The sea was rougher than it had been the entire voyage. Oh, the sea's choppy here. Must be haunted. <laughs> no, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm You're just saying, saying this is ocean's full of I'm ghosts. I'm saying it was, no, I did not say that. I just said the, what are you taking notes over there? Yeah, this isn't a debate, or it kind of is. Yeah. Oh, okay. Ryan is an idiot, that, that. You proud of, of yourself? And at one point, he may have even seen a fireball fly through the sky and crash into the sea. Let's jump forward closer to modern times. Keep in mind, all of the events we will discuss were followed by failed rescue attempts. On March 4th, 1918, the USS Cyclops, one of the Navy's largest fuel ships at the time, disappeared somewhere north of Barbados. One of the more chilling details is the fact that the captain never sent out a distress signal, and nobody aboard answered any of the calls from the hundreds of ships that were reportedly in the vicinity, as the USS Cyclops seemingly drifted out of existence. Mm. Hmm? You don't yeah. think that's strange? It was in one of the Navy's largest fuel ships. That doesn't just disappear. Doesn't sink. I mean, it, maybe. The Titanic, she was a mighty one. <laughs> I suppose, but and there was also- She's lying at the bottom. But there was also a lot of like, oh, we're drowning, help us kind of thing. I don't know, ships sink, you know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> On December 28th, 1948, a Douglas Dakota DC-3 airplane carrying 26 people disappeared 50 miles from its destination in Florida. After the flight sent out its final radio call to indicate its nearby position, it was never heard from again. Honestly, this one, I, you know, these don't do much for me, because- They don't do much for you! Planes crash, boats sink. They, they literally radioed in, like, I, I read it was 20 minutes away from the airport. Yeah, and then a goose flew into the propeller and they just fucking nosedived. Into where? The ocean! In October 1951, a ship called the Southern Districts disappeared after being seen near the Bermuda Triangle. 
Four years later, in 1955, the only piece of evidence in regards to the ship's whereabouts was discovered on the Florida coast, a life preserver, eerily bearing the missing ship's name. On December 22, 1967, a 23-foot cabin cruiser called the Witchcraft, which was built to be virtually unsinkable, disappeared along with its two passengers, one of whom was an experienced sailor named Dan Barak. The boat sported a flotation device in the hull that should have allowed part of the Witchcraft to remain afloat, even if the boat was filled with water. About a mile out from Miami Beach, Barak called the Coast Guard after hitting something in the water and requested a tow back to shore. Barak was reportedly calm in the call, nor did he say his boat was sinking. However, when the Coast Guard arrived, Barak, his passenger, and the Witchcraft were nowhere to be found and never seen again. Many wonder how two men aboard an unsinkable ship equipped with life jackets, floatable seat cushions, and flares could go missing, let alone the ship itself. So what are, what are you positing here, that it's in an alternate dimension? Some of these, they actually sent out parts of the Navy. The whole nine yards, they sent everyone out, nothing is found. I'm gonna need some documentation on this. <laughs> some documentation? Look up the stories, I'm just saying. I'm gonna look them up. <sighs> You're just... What else disappeared? <laughs> just like... You're seething. <laughs> I can't believe you think this is not weird. I can't believe you don't think that boats sink. The last and arguably most famous encounter we'll discuss is the story of Flight 19. On December 5th, 1945, five military TBM Avenger torpedo bombers departed Fort Lauderdale, Florida at roughly 2.10 p.m. on a routine training mission. Supports say that the planes had been checked before the mission and the weather was supposed to be favorable. Also significant is the durability of the TBM Avengers they were piloting, which were nicknamed Iron Birds on account of their rugged design and their propensity for holding up in battle. Known as Flight 19, the five TBM Avenger airplanes carried 14 men, led by instructor Lieutenant Charles Taylor. Shortly after completing their training mission, Lieutenant Taylor became lost in the area now known as the Bermuda Triangle. Since this was an era before GPS, Taylor and his pilots relied heavily on compasses, both of which were malfunctioning. An emergency transmission sent by one of the pilots was picked up by a control tower. We can't find West. Everything is wrong. We, we can't be sure of any direction. Everything looks strange. Even the ocean. Everything looks strange. Okay, wait a second here. Hold, hold, hold the phone, sir. Okay, before you said there was, the only thing that was missing here was the actual transmission. I just gave you the transmission. You don't think that's strange now? Uh, certainly, it's a strange case. About 20 minutes later, the pilot sent Flight 19's last transmission, his voice allegedly distressed. Quote, We can't make out anything. We think we may be about 225 miles northeast of base. It looks like we're entering white water. We're completely lost. Several minutes after the last transmission, a PBM Mariner flying boat took off on a rescue mission. That boat would radio the control tower once before also vanishing. Choppy. Choppy out there. <laughs> Are you bracing yourself? I'm <laughs> after a widespread search attempt failed, the Navy's final report of the incident allegedly concludes, quote, we are not even able to make a good guess as to what happened, end quote. That's the Navy saying that. Not me, that's the fucking Navy saying that. I gotcha. So the Navy is inconclusive. <laughs> now that we've discussed some of the incidents, let's go over some of the theories as to what the Bermuda Triangle actually is. The first theory is that the Bermuda Triangle is not an area of the supernatural, but rather a naturally dangerous place for sailing. Most hurricanes and other tropical storms in the Atlantic pass through the Bermuda Triangle. Storms in unpredictable atmospheric conditions can cause phenomenon such as water spots, which look like water tornadoes. The Bermuda Triangle also has some of the deepest underwater trenches within it, so wreckage could have potentially fallen far beneath the ocean's surface. Finally, scientific research shows that there is no evidence that disappearances happen more frequently in the Bermuda Triangle than any other part of the ocean. Uh-oh. <laughs> Oh no. That doesn't explain how it's happening in high concentration in the one small high area. High concentration, it's a million square miles. In comparison to the ocean, that's a, that's a small area. All right, yeah, million square miles, tiny. The second theory is that the Bermuda Triangle is home to a magnetic phenomenon. It's been proven to be a place where true north and magnetic north line up. 
Some research indicates that this may affect compass readings. Some science also indicates that the lightning during storms may further affect or intensify the magnetic fields, which could account for compass and electrical machinery failures and radio interference. In fact, the rare phenomenon of ball lightning may also form such electrical storms, accounting for the strange lights seen by Columbus and in other Bermuda Triangle accounts. So is, is, this is another one of those cases where, is this all one theory or two? These are two theories now. First one seems pretty reasonable. Yep, second yeah. one seems even more reasonable. So judging by my patterns of how I present theories, <laughs> We're about to enter some choppy territory here. Where do you think it's going to happen next? The third theory is that those lost in the Bermuda Triangle are actually now residents of the legendary lost civilization of Atlantis. No, they're, no, no, they're not. Nope. Now all the frustration I had in the first half of this is now equally composited on top of you. Are they breathing underwater? <laughs> Atlantis was written about by Plato and was supposedly an ancient naval power, but according to legend, the entire kingdom disappeared into the sea in just one day. In the 1970s, a writer named Charles Berlitz hypothesized that the entire city of Atlantis was actually a victim of the Bermuda Triangle and now resides and thrives under the sea within the Triangle's bounds. Berlitz theorized that the technology and weaponry of Atlantis was so advanced that it continues to contribute to the mysterious sinking of ships and planes. Some believe that which is lost in the Bermuda Triangle continues to exist in Atlantis beneath the sea. I could see your face and it's just fuming and getting- Because this is absurd. The fourth theory is that the Bermuda Triangle is actually a gateway to another universe, or in scientific terms, a black hole of sorts. I think if there were a black hole anywhere near our solar system, everything would cease to exist. Well, we don't know anything about black holes. Yes, we know a fair amount about black holes. I mean, we haven't been able to actually experiment on them or have any quantifiable data. Black holes aren't <laughs> unicorns, right? <laughs> I mean, they could be, who knows? I think there's a lot that you don't know. <laughs> Some say this would account for the fact that travel times through the region are unpredictable, with some flights getting to their destination faster than usual. In the 1970s, pilot Bruce Gernon testified that he had escaped an incident in the Bermuda Triangle, which he described as an electronic fog. His plane was submerged in a gray haze and his compasses failed. He flew blindly for three minutes before his radio informed him he was flying over Miami. When he looked down at his watch, 40 minutes had passed but he had traveled a distance comparable to 90 minutes of flight. Have you thought about a black hole that could possibly only be opened up when it's uh, when someone wants it to? Like a cosmic... Uh, uh, um, a trickster? Co yeah, a cosmic trickster, a cosmic <laughs> Chester cat. Yeah, okay. I buy that more than I buy Atlantis. I mean <laughs> okay. Cosmic Cheshire cat. <laughs> sure. Also in the 1970s, an unconventional Canadian scientist, John Hutchison, found in his work that electromagnetic fields could interfere with each other, and when such a phenomenon occurred, astonishing things could happen, including making metals glow, change form, or become disfigured. Some theorized that this effect, appropriately named the Hutchison effect, could conceivably create a wormhole. The fifth and final theory is a classic. The disappearances within the Bermuda Triangle are the result of extraterrestrials. Abduction by aliens would certainly explain sudden and absolute disappearances. Some claim there is a secret U.S. Navy base in the Bahamas linked to aquatic alien activity, referred to as Underwater Area 51. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Tell me about Underwater Area 51. Oh, that's it. That's it about your That's it? No, there's nothing else. But How? You, why? In 2014, at least two passengers on a carnival cruise within the Bermuda Triangle said they saw a UFO fly over them in the middle of the day. To be fair, not trusting anybody on a carnival cruise. What happened to you on a carnival cruise? I've never been on one and I will never go on one. I assume they were drunk or high, probably just out of their minds. I was going to say there's even reported footage, but unfortunately, because of rights, we can't look at the footage. You know what? I could show it to you right now. On my phone. I'd love to see. How about that? I'll show it to you right now. This is shopped to high heaven. <laughs> what makes you say that? Just look. I mean, look at it. This is okay. <laughs> that is the shittiest footage I've ever. That is so fake. <laughs> I forgot. Just turn that opacity down <laughs> as it gets into the cloud. Somebody. Somebody really busted out Windows Movie Maker for that one. <laughs> Regardless, whatever may be causing these mysterious events, the Bermuda Triangle is actually a highly traveled region, mostly without incident. But for the curious, the numerous and bizarre disappearances continue to vex them. What could be causing these incidents? Is the Bermuda Triangle a thing of the supernatural? Or is it simply an area with a high concentration of unnerving coincidences? 
the answer will remain unsolved. I'm saying you don't know how black holes work. I, I think you I think, think I've got a better understanding than you do, sir. I, I actually do understand how they work, how we perceive them and our scientists perceive them. I'm saying there's other science that we don't know about. There's other science that we don't know about. Yes, that's aliens are the perfect example of that. 2017, Ryan Bergara, there's other science that we don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me sound like Donald Trump. Well, <laughs> you're presenting alternative facts. And that's so. a, well, it's an alternative reality. Let's not get political. I don't yeah. want it's too sad. Let's <laughs> just talk about <laughs> ghosts. Okay. This is it. The infamous Lizzie Borden house. You have any idea what happened in there? No, I'm uh, in the dark on this one. Well, let's just say that some brutal murders happened in there that would lend itself to being haunted. Okay. I'm also freezing, so as scary as it is in there, let's get inside. Let's go in. You can't go into the front anymore. You have to go in through the back. You ready for this? Oh, shit. So apparently this room is haunted by children. Go get a toy. How about like a baby? Yeah, a baby's good. Or a, a little baby in a ball. Baby Give in a that baby a basketball. Make the baby hold the basketball. Are you PDing this? <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we investigate the Lizzie Borden house as part of our ongoing investigation into the question, are ghosts real? A house that had such a tragic murder inside of it, or should I say murders, should be haunted. Yeah, but why is it only them? Why is someone who choked on a peanut doesn't get a ghost? <laughs> I don't know. That's not how things work. Let's yuck it up then. <laughs> okay, great. All right, let's get into it. On August 4th, 1892 in Fall River, Massachusetts, the bodies of Andrew and Abby Borden were found hacked to death in their home. Both of the Bordens were believed to be killed with a hatchet or an ax. Abby Borden had been axed 18 times and Andrew Borden had been axed 11 times. Their bodies were found in different spots in the house. As far as evidence, only one thing concrete was found, a handleless hatchet in the basement that was clean of blood. Let's establish who lived in the house at the time. There was 32-year-old Lizzie Borden, her 41-year-old sister, Emma Borden, her father, Andrew Borden, her stepmother, Abby Borden, her uncle John Morse, who was visiting from out of town, and the family maid, Bridget Sullivan, who the family called Maggie. It's worth mentioning that Emma Borden was out of town at the time of the murders. So the woman who was murdered, she was the stepmother of the two yeah. daughters that lived with him. You know, people don't like their stepmothers. They don't. I guess that's not fair to a, a large well, amount of stepmothers. I mean, that's sure like a lot of widely ones. perpetuated by the media. Yeah. Or like any movie you see, the evil stepmother. There's yeah. never like, oh, my stepmother, she's a real doll. So you think like 90% of people who have stepmothers are like, oh, my stepmother, I'd love to bury an ax in her face. Now let's examine the timeline of the day of the murder, according to eyewitness testimony. At around 10.40 a.m., Andrew Borden takes a nap on the living room couch. At this time, Mrs. Borden was believed to be at the doctor's office. At about 10.50 to 10.55 a.m., Lizzie claims she is in the backyard barn. Maggie, the family maid, claimed to be taking a nap in her room upstairs. At around 11.15 a.m., Lizzie, in the backyard, reportedly heard a, quote, heavy fall and a subdued groaning, end quote. According to Lizzie, on her approach to the house, she noticed the screen door was now open and goes inside. Maggie, the maid, had not yet fallen asleep when she heard Lizzie Borden crying out. Quote, come down quick, father's dead. Somebody's come in and killed him, end quote. Maggie ran down the stairs to see the brutal murder scene of Andrew Borden laying across the couch. Maggie also noted that the distraught Lizzie Borden was wearing a blue, unstained dress. There was no sign of a struggle, as Mr. Borden was believed to be asleep when he was murdered. This is where it happened. So you walk down, I don't know if it was this staircase or the other staircase, but this is where she found Mr. Borden laying down. Was it on this exact couch? I don't know if it was this exact couch, but it sure as hell looks like the exact couch. I mean, look at the picture, it's over here. Is that his head? That was his head. Oh, good Lord. Right after Shane speaks, our audio recorder catches a female voice possibly saying, help me. Oh, good Lord. 
Is this the voice of Mrs. Borden? Andrew, this look familiar? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, is this? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so fucked up. Yeah. Just get away from me. What's wrong with you? Can you imagine though, is that's the last thing you see? No, I can't imagine that. I would never want to imagine that. Are you imagining that? Yes, I am. Well, there's something wrong with you. Mr. Borden, if you're here right now, show me a sign. Should we turn the light off? Yeah, we can turn the light off. Okay. All right. We're gonna turn the light off. Three, two, one. Was that you? No. Where did you hear it from? Where's it coming oh, from? Somewhere in this room. Is it this room or that room? I think it wasn't here. Hmm. Interesting. Shortly after, Lizzie asked Maggie to go find the doctor across the street. At this time, the whereabouts of Mrs. Borden were unknown. Maggie returned to the house with a neighbor and claimed that Lizzie said this about Abby Borden. Quote, Oh, Maggie, I am almost sure I heard her come in. Go upstairs and see if she is there. End quote. Maggie and the neighbor walked upstairs to discover to their horror, the body of Abby Borden laying face down on the floor of the guest bedroom. It was thought that Mrs. Borden may have been present for the murder of Mr. Borden and fled to the guest bedroom where she was also murdered. That's strange because why, why, if, why? if your pa is laying there, his head turned to blood oatmeal and you hear ma come in, you're probably not just like, oh, I wonder what she's up to today. You're probably like, hey, Ma, you should probably come here. <laughs> not just, oh, I wonder if she's going to go take a little nap. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah I, I got a life-changing thing to tell you here. Yeah, got some heavy news. Not, uh, oh, yeah, I think she ducked in. <laughs> we should probably give her a little howler. <laughs> yeah. Let her know. Also, the fact that she goes, look upstairs. I think I may have heard her go up that way, and that's yeah. where they find the body. Yeah. So you can start to see where things start to pile up against her. So this is where Abby Borden was actually found. They walked up the stairs, much like we just did. And from that little landing, they saw her feet right there. And they actually thought she may have just fainted or something like that, because she saw her husband dead downstairs. But when they looked at her, I mean, obviously you can see the pictures right there. That's how they found her. Oh my goodness. And look at her head, <laughs> Jesus Christ. The, the, uh, that is fucking awful. Abby, if you're here right now. If you're here right now, or if anybody's here right now, make a noise. What the fuck was that? It's just probably furniture creaking. We're gonna leave. I'm gonna ask one final question. Oh, I was just gonna yell, showtime. Okay, I'll ask the question, then you could yell, Showtime. How about that? Okay. Who killed you? Showtime! Both of the Bordens were struck in the head multiple times, suggesting a crime of passion. And with that, let's get into the suspects, starting with the top suspect, Lizzie Borden. To this day, many believe that Lizzie is guilty. Let's examine why, starting with her potential motive. At the time of his death, Andrew Borden was very wealthy. His net worth at the time would be around 10 million in today's standards. However, despite this wealth, Andrew was reportedly a bit of a penny pincher. In trial, Maggie testified that the Borden family lived frugally and ate a mud and based diet. Lizzie reportedly smiled as this was being described. Maybe she's thinking back on the good old mutton days. Or maybe she's like, huh. No mutton for me anymore. No more mutton for me, father. Did they describe the smile though? Or was it sort of like... No, they didn't describe the smile. Or was it like... Was it smug, you mean? Or was it like... Yeah, like, because there's the nostalgia like... <laughs> that was the good days. the good old days. But then there's like the like, slight yeah. smirk them. There's the... It's like the smug, like, took yeah, care of that. Yeah, yeah. Not for me anymore. Mm -hmm. So this is the master bedroom. This is where Mr. and Mrs. Borden slept. It reminds me of Downton Abbey a little bit. It's very proper. I feel like a little fancy, fancy little lord in this room. Well, one of the things that's supposed to piss Mr. Borden off is he was very frugal. So that's why you see money right here by his picture. Uh -huh. People leave it there and uh, people also report being scratched if you take his money. Oh. Of course, yeah. 
<laughs> it's gonna take it all. You're not gonna leave, leave him a little bit? Leave him a penny at least. I'll leave him a penny. He was a penny pincher, leave him a penny. I just, I'm not doing this because I want to steal. I'm doing this because I want to give the ghosts significant reason to haunt me. Okay. You know? I want them to be upset with me. I think they're already inherently upset with you. When they, I stole from you! I think you they, hear me? I think they could sense energy. Mr. Borden, who killed you? Was it you? <laughs> the cat. Five years before the murders, Lizzie had a falling out with her stepmother, Abby, that resulted in Lizzie going from calling Abby mother to Mrs. Borden. The dispute was over Mr. Borden buying a house for Abby's half-sister, rather than Lizzie and her sister, Emma. And sure enough, after Mr. and Mrs. Borden's murders, 32-year-old Lizzie and her 41-year-old sister, Emma, inherited the estate and later bought a house on a hill in a wealthy neighborhood in Fall River. Cool. So That's pretty cool. They didn't waste time going to work with that money. <laughs> well, would you? I think I'd give it a little bit of a grace period. If people were already like, we think you murdered them, I'd be like, so you're Fine, telling me I right guess now, I'll spend their money. if your parents got killed. Yeah, and I and, hope not, because Mark <laughs> and Sherry Madej are saints. Okay, great. But you're saying your first move is, let's head on over to Chase Bank and make a deposit, or make a withdrawal. I mean, if they're not going to spend it. <laughs> Holy shit. When asked if her father had previously mentioned a will to her, Lizzie said, quote, he did not, end quote. Moving on from motive, during her inquest testimony, Lizzie's answers were sometimes wildly inconsistent. Lizzie also reportedly burned a dress of hers after the murders, claiming there was paint on it. However, this was not the dress she was seen wearing the day of the murders. That dress was actually handed over to the police. The day of the murders, the housemaid Maggie saw Lizzie wearing an unstained blue dress. Lizzie could perhaps have committed the murder and then changed while Maggie was reportedly sleeping, but the time frame for that would have been extremely slim, and dresses in that time period were a bit of a process to take on and off so this seems unlikely. She could have gotten a dress on, that's not that hard. Apparently it was pretty hard. I'd like to see you put on a dress from that time period. I, that came out weird, I could have worded that better. I would not like to see you in a dress, I would like you to try, you know what? You get what I'm saying. Move along, move along. <laughs> okay. Another damning detail came from a pharmacist who testified at Lizzie's trial that she had tried to buy a poison called prussic acid the day before her father and stepmother were killed. However, this testimony was dismissed. Other than a possible motive and circumstantial pieces of evidence, there was no physical evidence that implicated Lizzie in the murders. The hatchet that was found in the basement was clean. At the end of the trial, Lizzie was found not guilty. However, many people still believed Lizzie was guilty. In fact, there was even a creepy schoolyard rhyme that goes, quote, Lizzie Borden took an ax and gave her mother 40 wax. And when she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41, end quote. All right, so we're about to go into Lizzie's room. Big bad Lizzie Borden. I didn't feel so weird in the other rooms, but I do feel very uncomfortable in here. Oh yeah? There's her right there. Why Lizzie? Maybe let's both say the thing, and maybe that'll get her out. Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Strangely, as soon as we finish reciting the Lizzie Borden rhyme, our audio recorder starts to pick up bizarre interference. It does this again when we whisper it. What if we whisper it? Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, gave her father 41. Lizzie? <laughs> I'm getting out of here. We've disrespected this room too much. She's gonna kill us She's gonna fucking, yeah, we're sleeping here. We can't even run away. <laughs> The second suspect is John Vinicum Morse, a theory recently made popular by a Massachusetts math teacher named Richard Little, who wrote a book on the case that listed John Morse as the possible killer. John Morse was the brother of Mr. Borden's first wife and Lizzie's uncle. Interestingly, according to Lizzie in the case timeline, 
Morse was not seen from 9 a.m. until noon, after the murders had occurred. According to Little, John Morse's alibi to the police was that he was visiting a sick relative down the road during the time of the murders, along with the town doctor. However, the same town doctor was also looking over the bodies of Mr. and Mrs. Borden, a bizarre contradiction in his story. Furthermore, Mrs. Borden was found dead in the guest bedroom that Morse had reportedly slept in the night before. That's Morse right there. Look at his, his stare. So let's talk to him now. Oh, what's his name, Morris? <laughs> John Morris. John Morris, come on, buddy. Time's a ticking. Uh, show up, murder us. Be the first ghost to murder someone in history. We'll get it on film, you'll be famous. All right, you got one minute, John. Say something, you don't have to get violent. Ten, nine, eight. I'm counting in my head. Oh, okay. I was giving him the chance to talk. Now I gotta start it over. Also, according to Lizzie's inquest testimony, Morris may have known about her father's will. Here's a transcript of that interaction. Question, did you know of your father making a will? Answer, no sir, except I heard somebody say once that there was one several years ago. That is all I ever heard. Question, who did you hear say so? Answer, I think it was Mr. Morse. Question, what Morse? Answer, Uncle John V. Morse. Little also cites a failing livestock business between Morse and Mr. Borden as a possible motive. Little additionally believes that Morse may have used a meat cleaver to kill the Bordens, as John Morse was also a butcher for his profession. So, there are some things. He had a failing business with Mr. Borden. Mm -hmm. He knew about a will. They don't really know where he was at a certain amount of time and he was a butcher. Those are four pieces of circumstantial evidence that make him just as much of a suspect in my mind. Yeah, he seems uh, the toe and toe there with a... Uh, Maybe not toe and toe. Neck and neck? Probably a better pinky way to say to that, pinky, given the context of the story. Oh. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Neck and neck. Yeah. Both of them seem dubious as hell. That's all I'm saying. Okay. I could, I could go with that. The third suspect is the family maid, Maggie. Maggie had gone upstairs to sleep in her bedroom, a floor above the guest room where Mrs. Borden was murdered. Maggie, in her own testimony, claims she may not have been fully asleep at the time of the murders, yet somehow she did not hear the brutal murder only one floor below. In fact, the room that we're talking in is the room that actually belonged to Maggie. What are you doing? I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to put myself in her shoes. I feel yeah. like I would hear it downstairs. Do you want me to go down there and make a thud noise? Yeah, why not? It's, it's pretty light, but I could hear it. And if I'm trying to fall asleep, I feel like I hear everything. Piggybacking on the previous theory, some feel that it is too coincidental that a person could sneak into the house in broad daylight with two people inside or around the house at the time. Which brings us to our fourth and final suspect, or rather, suspects, with the unsubstantiated theory that Lizzie and Maggie the maid conspired to kill the Bordens together. This theory has been the subject of many fan fiction, where Lizzie and Maggie were romantically involved. Some versions have Lizzie's stepmother discovering the romance, to which they kill her and then kill her father to cover it up. Fans of this theory point to the fact that Lizzie later in her life reportedly had a crush on an actress, a point that some feel caused her sister Emma to move out of the home they shared. Other than that, this theory has no evidence backing it. I could see that. It would answer a lot of questions too. About the dress, trying to get that dress on. Well, oh yeah, because really her only way out of that is saying, I saw her with the dress, it was clean. Yeah. And then Lizzie's saying nothing about her. So like they're both helping each other with their alibis. Yeah. It makes sense to me. Yeah. But you know me, I'm, I'm a fan of conspiracy theories. But this one this doesn't, doesn't- I was gonna say, this doesn't seem that crazy to me. No, right? Okay, good, I felt like I'm on edge here. Um, because there are certain elements of each of their stories that don't seem to add up, but then when you put them together, wait, are we agreeing right sing. now? Uh, Am I on base here? Yeah, you're on base. So I win. I mean, I'm I'm not saying ghosts are real. I'm saying no. This, you just said that. 
<laughs> no, no, I did not say that. <laughs> now that we've gone over the history and explored the house, let's move on to the final phase of the investigation, sleeping in the house. Can you imagine if you got sleep paralysis in this room? Oh my God, why would you fucking say that right before we're about to sleep Unlike in Unlike you lifted your head up and you saw a face in the window. Dude, why would you say that? You know one of face, my great fears a is a face. A face just shows up in the mirror. That sounds like literally a nightmare. And you know one of my big fears is a face staring at me through a window. Yeah. This is uh, Ryan's Captain Log update. What time is it here? Holy moly, it's 2.43. Not much progress has been made here. Well, as you can see, no morning. We made it. <laughs> I don't think this place is haunted. More than a century later, we are still trying to crack the Borden cold case. Uh, last look at the Borden house. Perhaps one day we will know who committed the murders, but many believe that this case will forever be a victim to time and will always remain unsolved. Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. And when she saw... <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> it's when she had saw. Well, we gotta start over now. Yeah, okay. Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave up. <laughs> you're getting, you're now, well, you're, you're creepier than I am. Well, you're smiling. Okay. <laughs> this week on BuzzFeed and Saw, we discussed the incendiary and baffling death of Mary Reeser, who media later labeled as the Cinder Woman. Incendiary? Yeah. Incendiary. You can go around with a five dollar word like that. <laughs> That's not a five dollar oh, word. Oh yeah. Stick around for the last theory because it's something we've never discussed before on this show. So, let's get into it. Spoiler alert, it's probably aliens. On July 2nd, 1951 in St. Petersburg, Florida, Mary Hardy Reeser was visited by her son in the evening at her apartment. Mary told her son that she had taken two seconal tablets, a drug commonly used to calm patients before surgery, and was possibly planning on taking two more before bed bad idea. Did she have a prescription for them? Uh, no she did not. However, her son was actually a doctor. I'm considering him a suspect. Her, Why her would son's she kill? feeding her sedatives. He didn't feed her sedatives. Yeah, like, go on, mother. <laughs> Jesus Eat Christ. These pills. You just made this go so much more dark than it needed. Well, I just don't trust this boy. <laughs> yeah, this have boy. some pills, smoke this cigarette. Good night. <laughs> he visited her. She told him these things. If it was truly alarming, he probably would have said, "Hey, maybe don't do that." Okay or he's just a terrible doctor. Later that night, Mary would fall asleep sitting in her upholstered chair for the last time, as Mary would become the victim of an apparent house fire. The next morning, Mary's landlady would report smelling smoke at 5 a.m., but it wasn't until 8 a.m. when the landlady was on her way to deliver a telegram to Mary that she noticed the smell of smoke again. She discovered soot in the hallway that led to Mary Reeser's apartment. When she went to touch the door handle, it was too hot for her to grab, so the landlady enlisted the help of nearby house painters who made their way into the apartment. This is a very irresponsible landlady. If, if your tenant's apartment smell like smoke, I mean, okay, this maybe is, check in on them. This is gonna get a little morbid, but who's to say that a burning body doesn't smell? like barbecue. Yeah, it probably does. So, hey, meets meat. Maybe they thought, oh man, someone's making bacon, maybe I'll do the same. I'm just saying, I don't, I don't think it's weird that she didn't immediately jump into action at 5 a.m. Well, okay. What they discovered would simultaneously horrify and confound the Tampa Bay area. Inside the apartment, they found the cremated remains of Mary Reeser. Mary's skull had reportedly shrunk to the size of a cup. That doesn't make any sense. How does that, no, of course it doesn't make sense, it's weird. Has any skull shrunk at any other point in history. Oh man, see now you're asking the right questions. Now you're acting like a detective and not like a jackass. Well, at least one of us is doing it. <laughs> Parts of Reeser's spine also remained, but perhaps the most gruesome was Reeser's left foot, still in its black satin slipper, the skin unburned. The rest of Mary's remains had been completely cremated. Her legs were the size of little tiny teaspoons. <laughs> You don't think it's weird that all of her was gone except for a skull, parts of the spine, and a fucking foot that is still completely intact like nothing happened. Maybe she was like, you know, I always sit up with one of my feet up on the, uh... Oh, so you're saying that she was, like, sleeping back in like a, like a comfy state, like a talk show kind of like state. Like a talk right? show, like George Clooney on The Tonight Show. I bet if you, if George Clooney was on The Tonight Show and you set him on fire, 
one of his feet would burn, and the other one would probably still be planted there on the floor in a very nice shoe. Clooney's flammable. Clooney is probably flammable, you're probably right. However, what makes this case bizarre is the condition of Mary's surroundings. According to cremation experts, for Mary's body to be cremated, the body would have to burn at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit for three to four hours. Yet somehow, other than the chair that Mary sat in, the surrounding area, as well as the apartment in general, seemed relatively unaffected by a fire that was at least 3,000 degrees. In the corner where the fire occurred, the nearby walls were not damaged, showing no signs of scorching or cracked paint. The upper walls and ceiling were blackened from soot and smoke, but the lower half of the apartment was not. Light switches were melted, but outlets below were intact and functioning. Candles on a nearby windowsill had melted, but their wicks stood upright. A stack of newspapers in close proximity were undamaged. Neighbors to Mary's apartment were also somehow unaware of this fire. Firemen who came on the scene found the heat so intense that they, quote, couldn't stand it. End quote, but also found no signs of smoldering. So a fire that was too hot for firemen did not damage her apartment somehow. Too much fire here. <laughs> what do I look like, a fireman? Detective Chief Cass Burgess described the case as perplexing. Dr. Wilton M. Krogman, professor of physical anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania, was, quote, amazed and baffled as he could not, quote, conceive of such a complete cremation without more burning of the apartment itself. Dr. Krogman also stated that in his 30 plus fire investigations, he had never seen a skull shrink like Mary's head. The skulls normally become swollen or explode. Investigators sent samples of the chair, rug, debris, and smoke to an FBI laboratory for chemical analysis. However, the investigation did not find traces of combustibles. What they did find was melted fat in the rug. Soot in a foot. That's all they got, huh? Soot, in a, soot foot in a cup skull. That's a bizarre version of a Dr. Seuss book right there. All this leads us to perhaps the most mysterious detail of the case, the cause of the fire. A local mattress company pointed out the regular chair stuffing would not cause such a fire. The material would merely smolder for a prolonged period. Lightning or electrical failure was also ruled out on the scene. However, the night before, Mary was reportedly seen smoking a cigarette in that chair. With that in mind, the FBI and police believe that the fire most likely started because Mary fell asleep while smoking a cigarette, which possibly led to her lighting her nightgown on fire. This would enact something known as the wick effect, where clothes act as a wick, setting fire to the body. The FBI felt that, quote, once the body became ignited, almost complete destruction occurred from its own fatty tissues, end quote. At the time, Mary weighed about 170 pounds. Well, if there's no cigarette found, that's fine, because it would be incinerated. Her, yeah, it would be soot. But, I mean, you would think they would fall on the floor, maybe. The foot didn't catch on fire. The foot did not catch on fire. One of them, anyway. That other one? Whew. Yeah, it does so. <laughs> Up like Christmas. At a glance, that scenario seems plausible, but it's certainly not definitive. Here are some alternate theories as to how the fire started. The first theory is ridiculous. <laughs> I'm just gonna say that right now. It's ridiculous. I never heard you just I know, flat for, out. for me to say it's ridiculous. This is a first. Detective Burgess received a letter addressed to the chief of detectives that said, quote, a ball of fire came through the open window and hit her. I seen it happen, end quote. I don't trust anyone who says, I seen it happen. <laughs> that sounds like a country bumpkin if I've ever heard one. I seen it. I seen it happen. I seen it with my own two eyes. <laughs> There's something we can agree on. I don't think this is a credible source. The second theory is that the fire was started purposefully. Some suggest that the fire could have been caused by thermite bombs, kerosene, magnesium and phosphorus, and napalm. But according to the coroner of the case, all of those would leave a distinct odor, none of which were detected at the scene. The third and final theory is that Mary was a victim of spontaneous human combustion. Let's dive into the history of spontaneous human combustion. Allegedly, there have been roughly 200 recorded cases of spontaneous combustion. 200? Roughly 200. Okay, all right. So it's just maybe Quite a, a thing then, okay. I mean, these are alleged cases or reported cases. Yeah. So, but I mean, that's a lot of cases. Well, okay, keep going. <laughs> okay. The earliest case of spontaneous human combustion dates back to 1470 in Milan, Italy, when Polonus Forstius died by bursting into flames after a night of drinking. 
His gruesome death was recorded in 1641 by Thomas Bartholin, a Danish mathematician and doctor. Can you imagine just being out, having a good night with your pals drinking? <laughs> and you know, toward the end of the night when you're like, yeah, what a fun night this has been. Can you imagine just exploding? <laughs> just catching on fire? All your pals would be like, huh? Immediate buzzkill. Yeah. I could say that. Not a good night. <laughs> no, I think we could have both agree on For that. For him or his friends. In 1745, the Countess Cornelia Bandi of Cessna, Italy, was found burnt to a pile of ashes with only her legs intact. Skipping forward to modern times, in 1982, the family of Jean Safin claimed they saw her burst into flames in her London home. In 2010, a coroner claimed spontaneous human combustion to be the cause of death of 76-year-old Irishman Michael Faherty, who was found in his home with none of his surroundings badly tarnished. And of course, Mary Reeser, who many believe is a victim of spontaneous human combustion. Is it very European to, to burst into flames? Mm. <laughs> I don't think incendiary behavior is exclusive to Europe because she happened in Florida. I know, I'm just saying Europe. Uh, Put that pen of, down, you just look like a jackass. A lot of people explode in Europe. <laughs> Stop it. Put it down. <laughs> something, something, something you want to look into. This so. runs deep. Now let's get into the science of spontaneous human combustion. The human combustion process involves internal fluids turning into gas and the melted fat of the body further burning organs and bones. If you'll recall, fat was found in the rug at the scene of Mary Reeser's death. Some consider the possibility of spontaneous human combustion to be questionable since the body is made up of up to 70% of water. Though, there are components of the body that are flammable, such as body fat and methane gas. Unproven theories as to why the body would ignite so easily include static electricity, bacteria, stress, obesity, and alcohol consumption. Some also believe that human cells may reach a heightened state of vulnerability to ignite. In 2012, in an issue of New Scientist magazine, biologist Brian J. Ford theorizes that a large concentration of acetate in the body may contribute to spontaneous combustion. Acetone buildup could result from alcohol intake, variations in diet, and diabetes. Cases of spontaneous combustion typically contain these three characteristics. Surroundings of the site of the fire are not drastically damaged. There is no visible source of the fire. And finally, parts of the body are left intact and adjacent to the ashes. All of these were present in Mary Reeser's case. When I think spontaneous combustion, I think like, Bam, like a pop balloon, just little shards of, of person just exploding. No, I, I think what you should be thinking is someone just immediately lighting on fire like that asshole in Fantastic Four. Now, what do you have against him? Oh, I hate that movie, that movie sucks. <laughs> it's not a good movie. Spontaneous doesn't mean instantaneous. When does something spontaneously happen slowly? A spontaneous tornado came up, came up twirling over the mountain. This thought you're having right now is not very spontaneous. No, it's certainly not. Another perplexing detail is why Mary, along with other suspected victims of spontaneous human combustion, do not try and escape their death or in any way indicate that they are on freaking fire. The lack of evidence of fighting for one's life is potentially damning in regards to the cigarette theory. Yeah, I was going to say, if my clothes are on fire, I'll do a little dance to try and get them out, stop, drop, and roll, what have you. I think the only thing I can think of is by the time they're on fire, they're dead already because they combusted. That would perhaps explain why no one's running around the room. Yeah, maybe she just passed out or died or something. If this was the only isolated case, that may be. Uh -huh. But there's every one of these, the surroundings aren't damaged, and they're just contained to the little small area. I don't think she could have sat still while she was cremated. I think fire, being on fire, would wake anybody up. Dr. Krogman is quoted as saying about the case, quote, They say truth is stranger than fiction, and this case apparently proves it. I've never heard of anything like it, end quote. Who is this, Dr. Rod Serling? <laughs> Sounds like it's hosting an episode of The Twilight Zone. I mean, it was quite profound, and I, I, found, I found it poetic. I've never had a doctor speak to me like that. I well, would wouldn't love you it want to? If I showed up and a doctor just started unraveling <laughs> strange little tales. They say truth is stranger than fiction. <laughs> so cool, you just gonna, give me a physical You're going to give me some ibuprofen or. <laughs> There is no definitive answer to what happened to Mary Reeser. Did she simply set herself on fire in an unfortunate accident involving a cigarette? Was she a victim of the controversial spontaneous human combustion? Or perhaps the answer lies within something we haven't discovered yet. For now, the unfortunate case of Mary Reeser remains unsolved. Some believe there's so many cases of this happening in such contained you know, confines of the blast radius, 
the answer could lie with extraterrestrial origin. What if aliens just get drunk and fly around the universe and, and are just shrink assholes. people's skulls and turn them into little piles I mean, of yeah, you could see how aliens would be involved in kind of like shenanigans and like being hooligans like that. Bodies are weird. I made a little flip book of, uh, that's her exploding. Ah, that's a fireball. All right. Well, I'll leave you here. Okay. You're ridiculous. So terrified right now. You're not even a little bit scared right now? No. What was that noise? Hello? What was that? Ooh, it's me, Tichipa, the ghost. All right, so this is the Jonathan Corwin house, one of the most notorious witchcraft judges, but it's more known in a touristy aspect as the witch house now, as you can see the signs right there. Yeah, they're really uh, going for that. It definitely has a creepy vibe to it. It looks pretty cozy, right? You have a different standard of cozy, I think, than normal That's people. Muted, right? Look, on a wintry day like this, th that looks very welcoming. It's a black house, snow hitting it. To me, it's more eerie, but, you know, I see things a little different than you. So you know what, let's just go in. Yeah. You're going in first? Yeah, why not? Wow, great. <gasps> This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we explore the city of Salem, home of the Salem Witch Trials, as part of our ongoing investigation into the question, are ghosts real? Right now, we're about to head out to some of the key locations that played a big part in one of the darkest blemishes in American history. And later, I may even present some theories as to why the witch trials may have happened. That sounds about right. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. This is gonna be a blast. Death, hangings, this has it all. Yeah. All right, let's get into it. In 1641, the Puritan legal code was created and established a hierarchy of crimes. Starting with the worst, the list goes idolatry, witchcraft, blasphemy, murder, poisoning, and bestiality. These people are, no, <laughs> they're too. <laughs> blasphemy. blasphemy. You can kill a man, but if you're like, God stinks. Ah, Jesus Christ, blow his head off. Yeah. How many people were poisoning each other? I don't know, how many people were fucking donkeys back then? Everyone's always like, how could they have done all this? How could they have gone so crazy and killed so many innocent people? Well, here's why. Because they're all insane. Let's jump forward to January 1692, when nine-year-old Elizabeth Paris and 11-year-old Abigail Williams began exhibiting strange behavior. Elizabeth and Abigail were the daughter and niece of Reverend Samuel Paris, respectively. Reverend Paris was Salem Village's first ordained minister. The two girls' behavior included making odd sounds and screaming, contorting their bodies, and throwing objects. Elizabeth and Abigail reported that an invisible being was biting and pinching them. 11-year-old Ann Putnam and other girls in Salem began acting similarly shortly after. This may come up in the theories, but is it possible that these girls were very bored? They were lost in the sauce. That could be the footnote of the whole Salem witch trial. Lost, lost in, in the sauce. Lost in the sauce. Their behavior was attributed to supernatural causes, according to a doctor's diagnosis. Though, it's worth noting that there was only one doctor in Salem Village, and he could most likely read, but not write. Oh, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> no, it's not. Doctors need to write. Yeah, I mean, how's he writing prescriptions? He's not. He's just pointing at things and saying, yup, that's a witch. <laughs> On February 9th, 1692, the girls accused three women for causing their bizarre outbursts after Jonathan Corwin and John Hathorne, both magistrates, pressured the girls into naming the people afflicting them. And as mentioned before, Judge Jonathan Corwin's house is one of the places we're visiting today. So, this is the actual interior of the house back in the day. This is the parlor. This is apparently where he would discuss accusations. In front of a big, cozy fireplace. How are you feeling right now, Shane? Is this not cool to you to be in a place? I, I love history, so. Yeah, this is just history brought to life. Yeah. Shall we explore more of this house? Yeah. Rickety stairs. So right now we are in the master bedroom. This is where Jonathan and his wife Elizabeth would have slept. If he could sleep at night. He slept like a baby, to be honest. In his mind, he was doing the right thing. Doing the Lord's work. He was doing the Lord's work, exactly. I know you're not big on energy, but I mean, like, you kind of feel that there's- You're some... nervous right now? I don't feel amazing, let's just say that. Right. I mean, just, just considering all the things that happened, 
but you don't feel like a little strange that like one of the most notorious figures in the Salem witch trials slept right there. It's neat. It's like being in Lincoln's bedroom. <laughs> you just compared Jonathan Corwin to Abraham Lincoln? I mean, they both lived a long time ago. That's literally the only two things they have in common. Returning to the three accused women, two of them, named Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne, both professed their innocence and would eventually die as a result of the trials. However, the other accused was a woman named Tituba, the slave of Reverend Paris. Strangely, unlike the other two accused women, Tituba actually admitted to afflicting the girls, saying, quote, the devil came to me and bid me serve him, end quote. So right now we're looking for the foundations of the former house of Reverend Paris, his family, and his slave Tituba. So this is sort of where, this was a hotbed. This is where it all began. According to a plaque that we found on site, it was in this house in 1692 that Tichiba, Reverend Paris's slave, allegedly told the girls household stories of witchcraft. This is crazy. This is it. And we could actually go inside the house. Let's go inside the house. After you, sir. Holy shit, dude. Ryan, I'm going in. Yeah, if there was someone practicing witchcraft in this house, you would know. Yeah, I wonder if that was another part of it. I mean, this may have been only a part of the house they salvaged. They had to dig it up. And this may just be even just a rough outline of the foundation. Actually, let me just take a rough EMF reading. Right after I mentioned taking an EMF reading, our audio recorder picks up a voice possibly saying, take it. Actually, let me just take a rough. <laughs> Is this the voice of Reverend Paris? Do you believe in this stuff? This is, uh, stuff apparently or? some people think that ghosts can manipulate electromagnetic fields. Uh, I don't know how much I buy into it, but I'm not gonna say this is definitively a thing. Right now, it's doing normal readings apparently. If it goes over two milligoss, then we're in some paranormal area, but right now it looks like it's zero. So you can see right there. 0 0.1. Zero. It's worth mentioning that there are some who believe Tichaba was forced to confess and thereby fabricated her testimony. Regardless, Tichaba's testimony is the longest in the entire Salem witch trials. She also detailed visions of eerie animals, including red cats, yellow birds, and black dogs. Perhaps most importantly, Tichaba added that other witches were also working to harm the Puritans in Salem. With this startling confession, the trials and accusations vaulted forward, giving them a purpose and mission. Tichaba was also very accommodating to the judges and claimed to go blind at one moment, a sign that the devil was punishing her for speaking so candidly about him. This showed she was at least trying to fight him. After spending a year and three months in jail, Tichaba was not indicted and was the very last of the accused to be released. Right now we're referring to the woman named Tichaba. We know you were admitted to some things that you may not have actually done. There's good evidence to show that you didn't actually do those things you were forced to. Do you have anything to say about that? Do you think you're gonna get physically harmed out here? Is that part of it? I don't know, her owners were evil pieces of shit. Ooh, but. They lived here too, Ryan. I know. <laughs> They're probably here and they heard you. I don't like you that, well, okay, I'm making it worse. Uh, Let's find some ghosts. Tichaba, or the Reverend Paris, or any of his family, uh, we are here to communicate with you. If ghosts are real, then call our bluff. Well, they wouldn't know they're a ghost. Oh. Why, none of them know? Right after I suggest the dead are unaware they are ghosts, our audio recorder picks up this voice. Oh. Why, none of them know? Why, none of them know? I don't think they do. So that's a ghost saying what, and just this particular ghost happens to have a cartoon voice. So if someone's like- He does like, sound a little bit like Lil John. What? What? He's upset. He's what? upset at the notion that he's a ghost. If I were to tell you right now you're dead, you I would probably would say, say what? Rrr. Skipping forward, the infamous special court of Oyer and Terminer was established by Governor William Phipps on May 27th, 1692. Eight girls from Salem were afflicted with witchcraft and making accusations. In the court, someone would warn that a witch was about to manipulate a victim, and then the victim would begin to act strangely. In the first trial of this court, 
Bridget Bishop, an older woman of the community that many considered to be an immoral gossip, was determined guilty of witchcraft and later became the first person executed in the Salem witch trials. Between the months of July and September 1692, 18 more people were found guilty and executed, including four men a rare occurrence in witch trials of the past. One of the accused men was a man named George Burroughs, a Harvard-educated minister who was accused by other alleged witches from Andover of being their mastermind. The claims made in court against Burroughs ranged from bizarre to batshit. The accusers claimed that he was biting them during their testimony. Their bite marks allegedly matched up with Burroughs' teeth. I guess they would have to pre-bite themselves? Yeah. It's not that hard. They probably just bit themselves and then showed it and they were like, yep, it looks like teeth. Hang them. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Don't hang them, but it is peculiar. They didn't have like a dentist on hand. The doctors in town can't even write. <laughs> Many people in the court, not just the accusers, claimed to see spirits in the room. One girl claimed the spirits were faces of Burroughs' deceased wives, colored as red as blood, and thirsting for justice to be served to their husband. Finally, the possibility that Burroughs had used an invisibility cloak given to him by the devil, was suggested by the Chief Justice. Oh my Jesus Christ. <laughs> this is so upsetting. It's, it's upsetting, but it's kind of funny when you think about it. Like, oh my God. <laughs> if you're an educated man from Harvard who was like, well, surely the Chief Justice will have something reasonable to say about this. Chief Justice, what have you to say? I seen him use an invisibility cloak. I know he gave it to him, the devil. Before being executed, Burroughs made an emotional speech where he recited the Lord's Prayer without any mistakes. Witches were not supposed to be able to do that, which sowed the seeds of doubt in the crowd gathered. Apparently this whole site was also the home of George Burroughs. If you're here, make yourselves known I'm gonna turn out the light. Or just like wiggle some snow around. I guess it's my turn. Yeah. Good luck. I'm gonna scan around. If there's anybody in here right now with me, show me a sign. Maybe move something. Say something to me. I'm gonna turn off my light now. And I'm just gonna let you guys speak. Don't push me though. All right, here we go. All right, I'm gonna get out of here really quick. But since I'm leaving, I'm gonna let you know how I kind of feel about you. As I announce that I'm leaving, we pick up another voice possibly saying I'm not. But since I'm leaving. No. No. I think it's just people, like it's breathing or it's wind. I, I honestly think if you want a voice, find a voice. That's Don't clear, give us garbage. That's clearly a voice. It's not a voice. Okay, I, I found it to be compelling that I'm, it's responding intelligently to things that I'm saying. Also, I mean, I, oh, did you hear that? That was my shoes rubbing together. Yeah, I know what that you didn't sounds think that like. Was a ghost? I'm able to discern what shoes and voices sound like. Right. I, I think I am. I don't, I don't think know, they I are. I think I am. On October 3rd, 1692, Increase Mather implored the court not to consider spectral evidence in the trials. Around the same time, Governor Phipps' wife was brought in for interrogation. If you'll recall, Governor Phipps was the man who created the infamous court of Oyer and Terminer. After Mather's statement and Phipps' wife being interrogated, Phipps released some of the people jailed for witchcraft, halted all further arrests, and replaced the court of Oyer and Terminer with the Superior Court of Judicature, which was not permitted to consider testimonies of spectral evidence. Overall, 20 people were executed in the Salem witch trials. 14 of the 20 were women, and only six were men. Though official numbers vary, it's possible that a further 13 people perished while in jail on charges of witchcraft. Oddly, all of the accusers were women between nine and 20 years old. An unusual fact due to the fact that most witch trials saw men doing the majority of the accusations. I just wanna say, when an entire community is basing their decisions around the decisions of eight little girls. Yeah, don't listen to children. When the hell in history would that ever happen again where a bunch of high school kids go, 
Yeah, yeah, I think we should burn that building down. I don't like it. It's an evil building. And everyone goes, yeah. Most importantly, none of the executed ever admitted to witchcraft. One interesting thing to note is that almost all of the people that were executed were not given a proper burial and instead were buried in unmarked graves somewhere in the area. Where those graves lie, nobody knows. Some believe they may be buried somewhere on Gallows Hill, but regardless, according to Spellbound Tours, a Salem tour company, Gallows Hill has the reputation of being extremely haunted. So this is Gallows Hill. I've actually always thought it w it's, it's spookier to imagine seeing a ghost in the middle of the day. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's spooky to see a ghost regardless. All right, this seems like a good spot. We're near the top of the hill. Is there anybody uh, up here besides birds that wants to talk to me and my stupid friend? I don't think this is gonna work. I think we're gonna have to go to an alternative method. Okay. It occurred to me, the reason why ghosts may not talk to me and you is because you're donning a stupid jean jacket and I'm in uh, this pea coat. But if I was in period specific clothing, maybe they'll actually be friendlier to us. All right. Well, I feel good. There's no look... pockets on this. I don't know what to do with my hands. You don't look too happy. Come on, ghosts. Act more natural. Be, <laughs> be a Puritan. This is so dumb. If there's anybody that wants to come talk to us, now is the time. I heard what happened here. I'm sorry to hear that. You're ghosts. What? We were engaging in a nice, soft conversation. You yeah, broke we're, we're your friends. You gotta break the news to them a little bit better. They don't even know they're dead. That's why we're dressed up like this. So we're tricking them. We're alive, just like you. Let's go down to the pub. God, you're the worst. Well, so not a not a smashing success. No, this wasn't. This didn't work out as well as I thought it would. I really thought it was gonna work. We could have. <laughs> we could have researched a little better. Nobody knows why the witch trials occurred, but there are theories. So let's quickly go over a few. The first theory comes from Harvard PhD student Emily Oster, who points to an economic explanation. In the Journal of Economic Perspectives, Emily Oster suggests that the Little Ice Age that lasted between 1550 and 1800 and intensified between 1680 and 1730 caused economic problems that encouraged the population to blame one another for their hardship. And basically this theory is they just got bored or they needed an outlet. Yeah, this is what happens when people are passive aggressive. This is what happens time. when people don't have hobbies, Yeah, I think. I think that everyone needs a hobby and if you don't have one, Oh, so you're probably gonna start well, they didn't people. have anything else to do. That's what I'm saying. They could have played fingers. They could have played ice soccer or something. The second theory comes from Linda Caparale that the afflicted girls could have been exposed to a kind of fungus called ergot, which can be found in grains like rye, which cause convulsive ergotism. Convulsive ergotism effects include hallucinations, which are apparently similar to that of LSD, muscle contractions that resemble seizures, vertigo, and crawling and tingling sensations, in addition to rye being commonly grown in the colony. The moisture in the air and the grain's lengthy storage time could have increased the likelihood of ergot infestation. However, the girls showed no other visible signs of this illness, which include disintegrating fingertips. I, I don't buy that one. I mean, like, it's, I think it's nice that someone maybe did their homework and maybe could provide a medical solution to this other than, oh, people are crazy sometimes. Yeah, I think it's a little bit more fun <laughs> to believe that humans are capable of some truly horrific things. The third theory is that mass hysteria played a part in the witch trials. It's accepted in most literature written about the Salem witch trials that some level of hysteria was at work in Salem during this time. The word hysteria is used throughout most descriptions of the Salem witch trials. This is like those people in France. Oh God, you and the fucking people in France. It's a real thing that happened. All those people danced till they died. Loosely, it's kind of loosely true. Not loose. Do you, I, do you need to look up the body count on that I'll, thing? I'll look it up Those again. people fucking danced until they died. That's true. Well, if you're gonna go out, that's a good way to go out. Yeah, that's true. The fourth theory comes from one of the people in the community at the time of the trials. A Salem merchant named Robert Califf accused Reverend Paris of exploiting the trials for sociopolitical gain in the community. He proposed that Reverend Paris forced his slave Tichaba to admit to witchcraft so he could use the resulting paranoia to seize back his diminishing power in Salem Village. I love this theory. It's a pretty strong one. It's a strong one and it came from someone in the community at that time. Yeah. I wonder if he got shot after he said that. I don't know. I haven't heard about him since, so he probably died. To wrap up the theories, and I hesitate to even list it as a theory, 
but I imagine, considering the fact that people at the time believed it, and because there's been so many movies about it, there are some out there that actually entertain the idea that Salem witches were a real thing. And I would like to express my own opinion on this notion. No fucking way. Great, thank you. Thank you for once. Wait, did you actually entertain the idea that I may believe in witchcraft? It's really not that outlandish I to think, think that you would believe that. In the end, nobody knows for sure what caused the Salem witch trials, but what is known for certain are the unjust fates of the victims. In 1957, the state of Massachusetts apologized for the Salem witch trials. In 1992, 300 years after the trials, the witch trials memorial in Salem was dedicated by Nobel laureate author and Holocaust survivor, Ellie Wiesel. All right, so right now we're at the witch trial memorials. Every one of these benches has a name on it of someone who was either executed or died in jail during the trials. As you can see, it's quite a bit. Obviously these are here because they don't know where the bodies are for most of them. So oh, yeah. that's why the benches are here. Let's see if we can clear a couple. Yeah, just Mary Parker hanged September 22nd. It's a lot of people. This is pretty crazy. You know, when you're standing in here and like in this little empty courtyard and you just see all the benches, it really is spooky, but also like beautiful in a way. This is eerie. Yeah. And I don't know if I feel uncomfortable just because of the avalanche of history that's happening and converging in this spot, or if it's because there's something here, but either way, I'd like to leave. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Okay. After all these years, the questions remain. Are there spirits left behind from Salem's troubled history? Why did these trials even happen? Both questions may forever remain unsolved. All I'm saying, if there's a town full of people who are all like you, mm -hmm. this is what happens. I feel like they were, if there was people a, start dying. If there was a town of people who all thought like I did back in the day, I don't think anything would get done because they'd hear a lot of the howling in the woods and they'd just be like, oh fuck, and they'd just run. No, and they'd all eventually other. die by themselves. They'd start the killing woods. each other. If there were a town full of me in the Puritan times, we'd have landed on the moon in 1790. I don't think so. Absolutely. I think you'd all just sit around and talk bullshit all day. You know? <laughs> just sit in the town circle and, you yeah, know, we'd, we'd talk about stroke each other about mathematical equations and science. I was gonna science. say math, but yeah. <laughs> there you go. Did you hear footsteps above? And the door's open. Was it open before? Stay in there. Wait, wait a second, what are you hang doing? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh no, 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 Holy no. shit. Ah! All right, this is it. The infamous Dauphine Orleans Hotel. This looks like a luxury hotel. I wouldn't jump quickly to conclusions. It uh, I mean... Though we are entering through the valet parking lot. Yeah, there's valet parking. All right, whatever. Don't judge a book by its cover. This is a hell of a cover. This place is beautiful. All right, so this is us. Room 101. Going into the carriage house. Oh, we could just never stay anywhere nice. I don't want to kill the vibe, but we could just turn lights on. This is a hotel. Yeah. You just want me to... No, no, no. You're going to scare the ghosts away. That's not how that works. It may. I don't know. Look at the size of this bed. You could definitely smell the age of this room. Holy shit! It's a jacuzzi tub! Ryan, this is the best place we've ever cleared. Stayed? Ghost busted? <laughs> we've never ghost busted anywhere. This week on BuzzFeed and Solve, we investigate the Dauphine Orleans Hotel in New Orleans, Louisiana, as part of our ongoing investigation into the question, are ghosts real? Right now we're sitting in a hotel rich with interesting history and a cast of characters unlike anything we've seen thus far. Like a ghost sitcom? You could say that. Sign me up, let's do it. Located a block away from the bustling Bourbon Street, the site of the Dauphine Orleans may date back as far as 1775, with parts of the hotel that exist today that were built in the early 1800s. Many of the buildings that today comprise the Dauphine Orleans Hotel used to be private residences, as well as a bordello. In fact, before 1898, brothels and gambling houses were said to spread across most of the city. 
a man by the name of Sidney Story created legislation that confined the city's sinful hobbies to a 16-block region, making prostitution and gambling legal within the confines of that area. Ironically, this 16-block precinct would be named after Sidney Story and was dubbed Storyville, a fact I'm sure he was far from pleased with. What, he didn't like drinking or He didn't like debauchery. sinful activities. He didn't like debauchery. Well, he can go to hell. He wouldn't have liked us on Bourbon Street the other day. Oof. I don't even want to talk about that evening. I stole them off a woman who died on the Titanic! Get your head! That's we well can, covered we ground. Never, we can yeah, never go right. back there. Yeah, we can never go back. It's said that Storyville was riddled with crime, sometimes at the hands of the prostitutes themselves. The hotel as a whole seems to be active. Visitors and employees claim that doors lock themselves shut. Footsteps can be heard. Shadows follow you. Shadows do tend to follow you, though. That's sort of how they work. During the Civil War, soldiers were said to stay on the premises often while recovering. There are multiple accounts of spirits of Civil War soldiers seen in different places in the hotel. However, the most haunted area of the hotel is undoubtedly the hotel bar, May Bailey's Place, which was actually a well-known bordello at the edge of the aforementioned Storyville. Just think of all the activity that went down here back in the day. This place was booming with music. Booming with some other stuff too. It was also booming with lots of other stuff. The madam of the bordello was May Bailey, and the original city license was issued in 1857 and still remains on display today. You have lovely penmanship, May. And there is, of course, the mayor. Is his name Chad? <laughs> no, I don't, oh shit, it may be Chad, actually. Huh. Were there Chads back then? I don't know. Confederate soldiers are often seen near May Bailey's place, perhaps due to the fact that it was a brothel they frequented in the past. Most of the ghosts in the bar are said to be May's employees, or ladies of the night. Gentlemen have claimed that they feel somebody trying to touch their leg underneath the bar. I was expecting something else considering the history. Just leg, just Yikes. leg. <laughs> Ryan is afraid of you. Um, I think you should show him that you demand to be respected. I do respect them. Shh. I didn't, never knew this was that easy. Fucking dick. The previous bartender told me about the activity around the bathroom area, and they said that people would get locked in or out of the bathrooms, which sounds weird. Is it like something's holding the door shut? I'm not sure, I don't know how to explain it. Okay, I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna put it right here. Okay. If there's anybody in here, now is the time to let us know. Ah! What? What? <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> you said <laughs> you you set the thing on the sink and it moved. Oh, was that what that was? Yeah. Ah! Oh, okay. <laughs> that's all that's happening. <laughs> Let's put that there. Holy oh, shit! You gotta fucking calm down, Shut man. Up, Another active area of May Bailey's is a little library section where a ghost is said to knock books off shelves. Ghost 101. One, knock book off shelf. Week two, uh, hold a candlestick in the middle of a hallway. Three, sheets. You're just ghost you're number just going four. through what the haunted mansion at Disneyland. No, I'm not. All right, we're gonna leave now. Please don't follow me. Follow Great. Them. Okay. If you can't catch him here, just follow him home all the way to John, California. Stop telling the ghost to follow me home. He's got a... Did you hear footsteps up I, above? Yeah, but there's no one up above. Well, the bordello's up there. Did you hear? I I fucking heard a footstep of something. Well, let's just go up there and we'll find out, I guess. Arguably the most horrifying part of the hotel is the bordello suite, which is upstairs in May Bailey's, a place where the girls would take patrons to perform services. And the door's open. Was it open before? Nope. I do not like this room at all. Many report feelings of unrest in here, 
and an employee that has worked at the hotel for over 30 years refuses to go in there to this day. Is this another bathroom? Whoa. I got... Does it stink? No, I just got lightheaded. Oh. Okay, I'm getting out. Wait, no, stay in there. Wait, what? Stay in there. Wait, wait a second, what are you hang doing? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh no, 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 no. Turn out your light. Oh my God. Is there anybody in here with me? And now Ryan is out there, and he's probably freaking out. All right, Shane's doing his lockup in the room. Oh boy, oh God, my fucking light just died. God damn it. Turn back on, please, 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 please. Shane, is your lockout, is your lock-in done? No, I've just got another two ah! minutes. Fuck, 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 come back out. Ah, come back out, come back out. <laughs> I've got two more minutes. No, no. This one of the best days of my life. We're good, we're good. Okay. Dude, I thought I saw something fly in front of me, but... Huh? It doesn't matter. I, I Why well, I freaked out is because I thought something flew in front of me, but it may have just been the reflection of my light turning off. If you don't want us to be here, send us a sign. Why do you gotta phrase it like that? That's just how I'm phrasing it. I'm sorry I'm in here. Oh. Did your fucking light just turn out? Oh my god, I just got the fucking chills. God. <laughs> oh no, no. This isn't even a mag light. Oh god, I feel like I'm gonna cry. <laughs> um, was that you telling us to leave? Hey, there it goes. It's fine. It's like full power. Ghost, I'm beginning to suspect that you're not real. Call it a hunch, but I've sat in a lot of dark rooms with this guy talking to the air. Right after Shane speaks, our audio recorder picks up a voice possibly saying, I'm right there. But I've sat in a lot of dark rooms with this guy talking to the air. Guy talking to the air. Could this be one of the patrons of this former bordello? Yeah, I don't know. There's definitely a noise. I, I don't. I don't think it's compelling in the sense it doesn't sound like a voice. Cool. It also kind of goes right into your voice, though, which makes me think you're just like... When we both talk, it sounds so much different than our voices. So I'm Take it if you want. You can have it. I think it's saying, I'm right there. You think it's me breathing. Yeah. Another famous ghost at the hotel is said to be the younger sister of Mae Bailey, Millie. The story goes that Millie's fiance was shot in a gambling dispute on the morning of their wedding. The morning before their wedding and he's like, you know what I'll do, I'll get real drunk and go play some cards with some shady fellas. <laughs> I'm itching for the tables. <laughs> <laughs> That's him getting killed. Tell my wife I love her. Well, she's not my wife. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. It's said that Millie's grief consumed her as she continued to wear the wedding dress after the incident. Millie is reportedly seen in her dress by hotel guests to this day, earning her the name the Lost Bride of the Dauphine Orleans Hotel. Now it's time to move to the final phase of the investigation, spending the night in the hotel. As I mentioned before, some of the site's original structures still stand today, and the carriage rooms are the oldest part of the existing building. But more importantly, according to the hotel, the carriage rooms used to be an extended rear wing of Mae Bailey's, and chillingly was the part where Mae and her sister Millie actually lived. Mae and Millie, we're gonna turn off the light now. Really, it's your time to run amok. Oh, shit. <sighs> Did you just take a shit? No, I didn't take a shit. I just realized what I've gotten myself into again. I hate this, okay. You know, the, a ghost has probably whispered point blank in your ear, but you probably never heard it because you were busy going, uh, uh, okay, uh, what did I do? Oh, Ryan, what did I do? What do you do? Oh, you always get yourself into these things. Oh. oh, come out, rip my skull out of my head. Oh, pull my bones out and melt them in front of my face. Are we doing more of this, or can I uh, use the jacuzzi hot tub that we've been blessed with? Are you serious? Oh, oh are we gonna spend the night here and not use that? The... The jets don't work. 
We're just two guys sitting in a tub. <sighs> so how do you feel about sleeping here? I'm delighted because this is the first place we've ever slept that has a, just a modicum of luxury. This is luxury? Yeah. Did you see the size of that bed? Yeah, I saw the size of the bed. You stand we slept your... on a dirt floor on the Queen Mary. It doesn't matter. It was matter. covered in rat hair. It's, <laughs> it's true. This is incredible. This is fine. I'm still going to have a hard time sleeping in that room. It's so dark in here. Did you see that? All right. Well, should we do this? Yeah. Holy sh... There's footsteps. That's the balcony outside, right? Yeah, sure. I'm gonna go out there. I wanna see if someone's actually out there. Oh, fuck. There's nobody out here. Maybe there's somebody in those rooms? But I don't see any movement. While listening for footsteps, we pick up a strange voice speaking something unknown. Maybe this is a lost cause. Is this the voice of May or Millie? Or perhaps one of the Civil War soldiers who frequented the bordello? It sounds like someone swallowing. Or like it sounds not even close to my voice. It's a different octave. It sounds like a machine almost. It's very electronic. There's so many different things and properties about that voice that would prove it's not me. It almost sounds like there's a TV on. You make it sound like you're listening to a recording of Pavarotti. <laughs> it's a tiny little click noise. Look, listen to it again. It's a voice and it's electronic. I don't know what it's saying. Is it Daft Punk? It's not, yes, Daft Punk. The Is DJ's a... Daft Punk came into our suite at night and gave me a little ditty. That's what happened. Holy shit. This is insane. It's fucking 5.15 in the morning. Chills. Is this not alarming to you, Shane? What the fuck? Oh, no. Jesus. Between Shane snoring and this goddamn ghost, I'm gonna kill somebody. Nice morning sky. Let's leave. What if we find out that there's actually nobody even staying above us? I, I don't know, Ren. This place is strange. After, Shane returned to our normal hotel down the street. But I was still bewildered by the footsteps, so I stayed back to investigate the only two rooms above our hotel room, only one of which was occupied. Hi, I just had a quick question. Um, I'm staying downstairs uh, under you. And I, just out of curiosity, were you? Did you happen to be walking around? No. Oh, okay, I'm just like, I'm a little spooked. I thought it was. Well, there you have it. He wasn't walking, and not only was he not walking, he's been spooked too because he's wondering where the creaking and walking is coming from. Well, 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 well. Was he not pacing? Not only was he not pacing, but he said, yeah, we've been staying here the past couple days. I've been pretty freaking spooked. I bet he was just embarrassed. No. Yeah. No. He was probably pacing around. It's okay. a ghost, right? You're right. There's a ghost marching around for seven hours. Non yes. Stop. Yes, because that's what ghosts do. That's it? That's all you have to say for yourself? I think that man was just walking around, right? Okay, I'm gonna take the camera away from your stupid face. It's worth mentioning that after this investigation, I spoke to a New Orleans ghost tour guide about hauntings at the Dauphine, and she mentioned an angry Confederate soldier who walks around all night long and even stumps. Was this possibly the source of the footsteps that I heard in our room that night? Given the rich history of this hotel, it's no wonder that many feel the numerous presences that once frequented these halls. And after spending a sleepless night there, I won't argue that something is off at the Dauphine Orleans Hotel, but whether or not it's definitively haunted will remain unsolved.
haunted. How do you know that? I know it's not haunted. You don't know that for sure. It's not haunted. You say that everywhere we go. And guess what? You're like a stupid string puppet that I could just bring along with me, and I'd just pull it when I want to hear some right. dumb. It's not haunted. Ryan's an idiot. Okay, that's, that's all. The, I'm that. We gotta merchandise those things now. I think you might intellectualize too much. That that's a hundred percent. That's a hundred percent true. I don't want to murder you. I never said I wanted to murder you. You want to kill me? That seems like a good idea. Let's lock ourselves in the murder room. I'm leaving. Too late. You lost your chance. What the? This week on BuzzFeed and Solve, we cover the practice of voodoo. Can it actually be used to contact spirits? Right now, we're sitting on top of Lake Pontchartrain in New Orleans, a city rich with voodoo history. And later, we'll actually attempt to use voodoo to try and contact spirits. We're gonna have a, a good teacher with us too, so I'm okay, very excited. Okay, all right. We'll see. We've got a lot to cover, and I really don't know what to expect, so uh, let's get into it. The origins of voodoo are unknown, but most agree it came from West Africa, particularly the region of Benin, where the word voodoo means spirit. So right now we're at Voodoo Authentica. It's an authentic voodoo shop, as the name would suggest. It's and we're happening. gonna learn a little bit about voodoo. It's a push. Push it. I didn't see the sign. I know. Let's go over the basics. It is believed voodoo derives from the tradition of ancestor worship and animism, the belief that nature and inanimate objects contain consciousness. Voodoo practitioners believe in one God and that there are many spirits who have power over humans and nature. They are referred to as Loa. We have more than 25 different working altars. Okay, what do you mean by altars? These are places that people come and pray and leave gifts at for specific spirits. Each Orisha and Loa have their own spheres of influence. This one over here looks very uh, feminine and... Very feminine indeed. Yeah, she is dolls. love and attraction. She's more the pulling towards you of love. And it seems like some people put little tiny relics or gifts, other people just straight up like the, the uncle on your yep. birthday who just gives you money. <laughs> yep. Just throwing down a... And? <laughs> what else we got? Oh, oh booze. Oh, the bubbly. Even That's, in the afterlife, it's, it is appreciated. Probably a good one. While voodoo has gotten a bad reputation over years of misinformation, it is actually a very positive practice and is often used to call on spirits to help the sick and needy and guide one through life's struggles. So the negative connotation, that's all. You know, people think voodoo's used as this evil thing where I'm gonna make a little Shane doll and then throw it into the ocean and watch it drown and what? then really smile while he's sinking. Wait, what? Stuff like that. You just said that this is not what they're used for. Yeah, I know, but if they were used for that, this- You would kill me. You would murder me. It not hypothetical. I wasn't thinking of doing that. Ryan, Smile. sometimes we argue on this show. I don't want to murder you. I never said I wanted to murder you. You want to kill me. It's, this is a hypothetical situation. Right, you don't know continue what to tell me about voodoo now that I know you want me dead. <laughs> I didn't ever say, you know what? Oh, okay. this feels great. Voodoo would eventually make its way to America via the slave trade, and New Orleans would eventually play home to perhaps the biggest figure in American voodoo history, Marie Laveau also known as the Voodoo Queen of New Orleans. It's said that her spirit walks this entire cemetery. Obviously we can't get in because a lot of people vandalized the tomb. But we can't see her actual... No, but we could be at the gates, so to speak, spiritually and physically. Marie! I, oh, really? Okay. Marie! Hold on. Marie! No, that's not gonna do anything. Marie! No. Can you see over this normally without jumping? Actually, yeah. It was here at Lake Pontchartrain in New Orleans that Marie Laveau would hold voodoo gatherings on the shores. Journalists would spread stories of infamous orgies and sacrificial rituals that would occur at this lake on St. John's Eve. Sacrificial rituals. And enormous orgies. I don't know why that one slipped by me. <laughs> I was like, yeah, sure, orgies. Tell me about ritual. The negative connotations of voodoo proliferated by the media likened voodoo to savagery. And towards the end of the 19th century, voodoo had to go underground in New Orleans. Now that we've established the history of voodoo in New Orleans, let's get into the actual practice of it. One of New Orleans' more famous practitioners is a woman named Bloody Mary. Lucky for us, she has agreed to teach us the ways of the spiritual world. Holy moly. And as you can see, the house is quite a sight. That is a hue. It's actually supposed to be haunted itself. 
I uh, imagine because of all the communication that happens here. Oh yeah, it's probably like a hotspot or something, huh? Andre. Uh, Ryan, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Ryan. Shane. Shane, nice, Shane, to, nice to meet you. Spirits, Ryan, Shane, Andre. Okay, I'm all right. so excited. <laughs> I am initiated as Mambo Asagwe, which is the highest level in Haitian voodoo, as well as voodoo queen in New Orleans tradition. This is an amazing room. Thank you. It's got good energy. I'm, I'm glad you're not afraid of it. No, I'm not afraid yet. Good, good. Uh, this good. house feels very nice to me. You will be, but. You will be. I mean, yeah, it's true. Well, some people just are afraid of things that feel different than what they're used to. You yeah. know, and automatically jump to conclusions that it's gonna be dark or evil and jumping just because it's, you know, vibratory, it's different. Yeah. And you have to get that out of your head and just let it flow. I'm very fascinated and interested and I'm not afraid of these things. I think you might intellectualize too much. <laughs> that That's a hundred percent true. That's hundred percent true. We, we both, both just have to go blank. We're both we're both yep. on the opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah, and we, we need to yes. just find the middle. middle. Okay. Find your balance. Let's, let's never do that again. That's what the world nope. needs to the, do, by the way. Again. Find the balance. Do it one more you know? Time. There we go. Oh, in fact, I'm gonna give some right now. I'm gonna feed the spirits. I'll give them libations. We might drum, we might dance. To the spirits that are here, this is to Alice. Oh, oh. So now that we've established the basic history of voodoo, sure. uh, what are we getting into tonight? What I do is created, I call Voodoo Paranormal. So I mix old school with new school. Basically, I just open gates and when we're done, I close gates. So I want them to come out while they're there and then I want them to go back and do what they gotta do when they're done and not follow. So it's, this is sort of a, a night out with spirits. Yeah. <sighs> New Orleans is unique due to their above ground cemeteries. The cemeteries are sometimes referred to as the cities of the dead. It's fascinating how people that don't even consider themselves psychic or in tune pick right up on what's going on or what went on there. I'm definitely not psychic. I'm just a guy who's interested in this stuff and gets a little dizzy sometimes. <laughs> I still think that everyone is psychic, just to different abilities. It's a natural part of us as humans. It's only appropriate that we would walk by these cities, making ourselves familiar with the spirits of the melting pot of New Orleans, before ultimately reaching out to them in a location that was one of the spiritual beacons of the city, the former site of the Voodoo Spiritual Temple. Why are you knocking? I always knock, that's a ritual gesture. Letting them know we're coming, warning them. Is this a thing you recommend for Anyone? Anywhere? Yes, it's kind of a thing of respect, and it's a very simple ritual gesture. Knock you three times, lets them know you know they're there, they're there, yes. Knocking the way in, knocking the way out, come on in. Built in 1829, this two-story cottage has gone through many incarnations, with the Voodoo Temple being the most recent. However, on February 1st, 2016, the temple suffered a tragic electrical fire and now lies vacant. So this is the mirror image of the other side. Yeah. Still a lot more construction going on here. This would have been Priestess Miriam's spiritual temple. So we're looking at bare bones right now. Bare bones, just put the sheetrock up and left some of the original old 200 year old brick walls exposed for you. I'm gonna go through this threshold and I'm going to open the way before we do. So I'm gonna do that ritually. Okay. I'm gonna have you walk through it and then I'm gonna have you wander on your own, okay? You, why, you look so scared already. <laughs> I've been more comfortable. Papa leg, ba plante poto, plante poto. So, Guardian of the Crossroads has a symbol to signature a geometric design known as a VV. <whistles> to all the spirits of all directions, we call upon you, the spirits of fire, we want you to come through. The spirits of water, we call upon you. And the spirits of air, we request you, the spirits of earth, we give offerings as well to feed your way. Do y'all have some coins? I need some coins of the realm. Here's some coins right here. Throw them on in. 
I, Bloody Mary, I, Voodoo Queen, I, Mary Milan, I, La Cocro, I, with many names in the past, in the present, and in the future. Call upon the spirits of place through Papa Legba. We ask that we may communicate with you, may we see you, may we hear you, may we feel you, may we photograph you with great respect. Open the way. I present my friends. Please state your full name. Ryan Stephen Brigara. And Shane Alexander Madej. We call upon them. We let you open the way for them to come through today. <whistles> open the way. Come on in. Ooh. It is best that you walk through backwards. Why is that? Well, everything is supposed to be seen from the mirror image in Voodoo, so it's kind of like you're coming through. So I guess born again. Case. You don't have to. Really, you should come through dancing. Oh. And I will. And this is a joyous. I'm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm in, Ryan. I see that. Oh, look at that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So let's see if we could find anything. Wait. That's a gator head. Yeah, turn around. Oh, <laughs> that's good. That's good. Okay. What are we doing in this room? Reaching out. Okay. Apparently, this was a gift shop in the former Voodoo Spiritual Temple. Look, it's all like magnets and stuff. After I mention we're standing in the former Voodoo Temple gift shop, we pick up a voice, possibly saying, yeah. Voodoo Spiritual Temple. Do we sell like magnets and stuff? I mean, to be fair, full disclosure, this place was on a street, and there were people walking past here and there. So, sure. Just want to put that out there. We also pick up a strange whimper. You want to say anything to me or the little guy? What about to the giant? What about to the giant? I do find that more compelling than any of the other dumb ones you've you've dug up. Um, but again, we are on a street here. What on the street could possibly make that noise? It, first off, that does uh, not sound distant. This one sounds like it's literally in the room with us. What about to the giant? I don't know. Anytime I can get you to do that shrug, it means I'm making That's a victory great points. for you? It's, it's a great point. It makes my heart warm. Bizarrely, while the first floor of the building served as a voodoo temple, the second floor was rented out as an apartment and is also reportedly haunted. There's accounts of footsteps, shadows, and rocks being thrown. Oh my god. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. That's Jody. The, the doll? Mm -hmm. What's her deal? She will be the overseer of the haunted nursery of dolls that I'm going to have. I'm gonna buy you one of those for Christmas. Shut up, Shane. Is there a reason why there's a circle of rocks in this little door? Maybe. <laughs> That's really weird. What's that? I, I just didn't know any of the electric was on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that is weird. That's good. I didn't, you know, huh. Can you reach up and pull a string and see what happens? This switches didn't do anything, and I don't have it turned on. We have some visitors tonight. Or maybe well, we there hasn't been electric visitors. in here in over a year. Strange. Because of the fire. Any physical sensations that you're feeling in there? Oh! <laughs> Ryan, put away your fear and just focus on what you feel. I'm gonna sit in this chair. Put your feet on the ground and ground. Ground into the moment. It's that place in between. Okay. It's when you can stop and zone, like you did. If you can do that at will, wherever you are, kind of go in that in between place. That's where you're gonna connect with the spirit world. I'm gonna just close my eyes and just. I'm bad at feeling. I want to be swept up in this. We want to believe in something outside the norms of, you know, physics. What are you sensing? I don't sense anything dark in this room. I don't I'm feel... I'm not asking about anything dark. It doesn't have to do with dark. I feel... happier. Ryan's having a rough time tonight. Poor guy. Any reason why you think you feel happier? Because I'm not scared right now. You don't tune my head. Maybe it's because if there's something here, it feels like it's scared too, maybe. Like a, like a kid. And have you ever been a scared kid? 
Yep, all the time. I took an improv comedy class once, because I'm a white guy, and uh, they said, just get out of your head. I can't, though, it's a prison. Do you know what the source of that fear, when it began? No, I always felt like something was watching me in the dark when I was little. <sighs> I've always got to think about stuff, you know? Like this mannequin in this dub. What's he doing here? Yeah, I'm not picking up a... Let's go see what Ryan's doing. Well, there's probably a source that triggered it when you were a child. You find that source, you might dissolve some of your fears. I'm returning. Oh, cool. I didn't mean to interrupt. He's channeling. And you are correct. There's a little boy here. Little boy, I call him Abe. He had requested stones, 10 stones. Actually, he requested jacks. Now, I'm gonna leave y'all alone for a while. I'm gonna go grab something to eat. I'm only gonna close the front door. <laughs> the vagrant well, world doesn't get in. The spirit world, the world. Is, in, is in your hands till I All get right. back. While Shane and I go change batteries, our audio recorder continued rolling inside the little boy's cupboard and picked up some peculiar noises. What if he talked when we were gone? Oh my God, I just got the chills thinking of that. That's fucking crazy. You kind of hear their whispering there? No. Okay. There, right there. Did you hear that? The wood the, or whatever? The cupboard, yeah. So the takeaway here is every little sound is a ghost. No, the takeaway here is that sounds that don't belong in that environment may or may not be ghosts. Okay. I'm gonna side with may not. <laughs> Anybody else in here at all, I'm gonna turn the, um, I'm gonna turn the light out. My jacket just moved in a way that it felt like somebody touched me on the shoulder. And if I think, if I think you had felt it, you would scream. Everybody else. Turning the light out now. Wait, are you, did you actually just comment on something that may have been paranormal? No, I said it was the way my jacket moved it. Like, uh, you wear a jean jacket? These things are. There it is. Yeah. I was just waiting for the logical explanation. There you go. Although this second floor apartment is the apparent home of a little boy, it was actually the real home of two other individuals. And in 2006, this apartment would play home to perhaps the most grisly murder in New Orleans history earning it the name, the Rampart Street Murder House. This is the room where there was just writing all over the wall by Zach. He painted on the wall. Oh, he did? Can you see any of it still? I don't think so. On October 5th, 2006, Zachary Bowen brutally murdered and dismembered his girlfriend and roommate, Addie Hall. He jumped to his death off the Omni Royal Orleans Hotel roughly 11 days later. Police found a suicide note on his body that read, quote, this is not accidental. I had to take my own life to pay for the one I took. If you send a patrol car to 826 North Rampart, you will find the dismembered corpse of my girlfriend Addie in the oven, on the stove, and in the fridge, in a full signed confession from myself, end quote. There is like a thickness to this room. All right, I'm gonna put the, uh, Jesus Christ, I'm gonna put the EVP on the stove, which unfortunately is the same stove and oven as, you know, and it's also the same fridge. One thing worth noting is that despite speculation, these deaths had nothing to do with the voodoo temple downstairs, as Zack and Addie did not practice voodoo. Regardless, as a result of this horrible crime, the kitchen that still stands today is perhaps the darkest part of this house. Oh shit, you closing that door? Oh, how about that? Let's do that. That seems like a good idea. Let's lock ourselves in the murder room. We'll turn our lights off, I'll step out. Wait, what? That was never part of the bargain. Ryan, you have to face your fears. I think you just want to see me freak out. That's oh, what I think. That's Don't try true. and frame it like you're trying to help me, you dick. I know exactly what you're after. How about I go first? Fine, okay, let's do two minutes. Okay. Here we go. If there's anyone here, feel free to reach out to me. I'm gonna die in there. Maybe there is a restless spirit of the um, victim. Oh boy. Can you tell me your name? This room isn't as bad as that room, despite the fact that there was, you know, painted manifestos of a madman over the walls of this. 
lot of times I just do these because I know how much Ryan will hate. I think the creepiest detail in that case. The fuck was that? Oh shit! The fuck was that? Ryan's, Ryan's outside right now. He's having a harder time out there. Uh, so far, nothing. And now I'm about ten seconds away from Ryan entering the room, and um, his mind will eat itself, and it's going to be wonderful. All right, that's two minutes. Oh fuck. I uh, I don't really want to talk about what happened in there, so why don't you head in? Shut up, shit. I want to talk about what happened in there. Make sure you turn your light out. Fuck. I'll close it for you. Okay. Oh my god. Okay, I'm 34. Two minutes, Ryan. Come on, you can do this. I'm really sorry what happened to you in here. Or both of you. I think maybe you weren't in your right mind. Oh, I'm not talking to anybody. You know what? That's, I don't know what am I doing here. Interesting that he's talking to them. Always forgets that. Is there anybody in here right now? If there's anybody in here right now, show me a sign. I'm gonna leave forever in a second here. I'll gladly do so. Almost halfway there. <sighs> okay, 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 it's fine, Ryan, it's fine. One minute and you're gonna be out of here. You're gonna be uh, fine by yourself. I feel I'm gonna fucking cry. This is your last chance. Is that one of you? No. Did you just... Just tug on my shirt? No, we're not in the room We're not you. talking to you! Oh shit. Ah, ah, ah. That was a good trick. Okay. Did you touch the door? No. There's something creaking up in the attic. I'm leaving. Too late. You lost your chance. Fuck you, Shane. You open the door. You, oh. <laughs> Typical. We have fun. Hilarious. Okay, You're great. Is there anything spooky? Uh, something, I think, tugged on my shirt. I don't want to talk about it. I want to leave. I think Bloody Mary's going to come meet back up with us, maybe close the door. Okay. But uh, I really don't know. You don't want, you just don't want to be up here anymore. I don't want to be up in this room anymore. Okay. Please. Let's leave. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> 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 That was a good scream. Should we be on this side? Doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. We thank all the spirits from all the directions and the spirits of house. The ones we know, the ones we don't know. We thank them for letting us have a glimpse into their life and like buzz over the gates. We now ask to close the way our gate. Aye, bo bo. All right, so uh, what'd you think? Uh, that was pretty fascinating. I, I, I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm really transfixed with this world. I know, it sounds like we do have to meet in the middle, which we did not tonight. But maybe in the future. No. I don't know, Ryan. I don't think so. I think we'll get there. I doubt it. You gotta learn to not be so scared, though. I think you need to learn how to uh, start seeing things for what they are. I think you need to learn how to shut the hell up. I think you need to learn how to shut the fuck up. I stepped it up with a bigger curse word there. Yeah, that was... We're losing track here. Yeah. In the end, voodoo remains a respected practice in New Orleans. I can say that after experiencing it firsthand, I now understand that it's not the negative force that it's made out to be, but rather can be used negatively when in the hands of the wrong person. Understanding that it requires faith, whether or not voodoo can be definitively utilized to contact the spirit world, will remain unsolved. trying to be like a jerk about this. I'm just getting tired of you asking me if I get scared about things that I don't believe in. Well, one day I think you'll just finally wisen up. And you know. It's like asking me if like, <laughs> never mind. No, wait, finish the thought, finish it. I was gonna say, it's like asking me if I'm concerned that when I fall asleep, the moon turns around and winks at me with a big evil face and has a boner or something. And I'm like, oh, of course not, because that's not real. Does the moon wear pants then to cover up its boner at all times? I don't know, I have never Why thought have about Why have I never seen that. the moon's boner? Because you just have to believe in it, Ryan. This is the dumbest example you've ever given. It's dumber than the Die Hard one. I think the moon having a boner is about as realistic as ghosts. <laughs> no, I know yeah. it is not. The, the dark side of the moon okay, having Paul, a giant- Everyone in the comments tell me what is more probable, no. the moon having yeah. a boner the or ghosts the moon, being real. The dark side no, of the moon no. just has a giant dusty boner. <laughs> dusty boner. That's about as real as, what, as ghosts. <laughs>